Okay. Well, good morning and welcome to our 11 a.m. public portion of the closed litigation session of the November 26, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the council members will move to the courtyard conference room for our closed session. I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Rich Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Meyer. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to us on our closed session agenda? Okay. Why don't you please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Are, are you not here? The person who raised their hand. Are you here to speak about closed session? Yeah, please. Yeah, you'll have up to two minutes. Right. Okay, please come forward. <clears throat> good, good morning, Mayor Watkins, members of the Santa Cruz City Council and staff. Uh, my name is Kirk DeChico, and together with my wife, we own the 7-Eleven store on the corner of Ocean and Broadway. Um, I submitted a claim about 45 days ago because of the fire hydrant that burst uh, on the corner, it's the fourth time in five years that we've owned that store that this has happened. Uh, last year it caused a bodily injury to someone when it projected and hit one of my guests. This time it's caused financial burden uh, in that the city closed two of the parking entrances down for two days. Uh, Broadway was open, but since the ADA that we had to conform, we've lost two parking space. That entrance is not used very often. Um, I worked with Angela and filled out and submitted uh, lost sales uh, for the two days. Uh, the third day went on when they started to concrete. Uh, if you've driven by it recently, you'll see the undulation and the sinkholes and they just keep getting deeper and deeper. The fire hydrant broke down two feet below the surface and water ran for two hours. And uh, I, I'm sure there's other claimants down uh, uh, ocean. But anyway, uh, so I submitted and then I received a letter yesterday, short notice saying I needed to come and present my case. So I'm sure you're all armed with the financials that I presented <coughs> last year's sales, customer counts, sales that were um, off this year and happy to answer any questions you might have of me. I did not hire an attorney. I, you know, just didn't think that I wanted to add that to the claim. It's just what, that what information I could come up with, but happy to. Thank you, thank you. Are there any other members of the community who would like to address the council on closed session? Please come forward. Yes, I will just take another two minutes to explain furthermore. If you ever travel on Broadway and Ocean at that 7-Eleven store, we start out with seven parking space. People who shop at 7-Eleven is an um, Im, impulse shopper. As they travel that Ocean, they cannot take the right turn into the store. They will just skip it and keep going. We will lose that chance, the only chance that we have with that little parking lot. After bleeding with the city, they opened the little side on the Broadway. But even with that, get in and get out of the parking lot of that corner is really a hassle. So um, we thought many, <coughs> we thought over and over, do we want to address this for a few thousand bucks? But this is the fourth time that thing has burst. It's become a hazard. And I'm not sure if the city will ever look into it. I know we need to have it in case of fire, but maybe another safer spot for the spot to be. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Morning. I'm speaking on closed session item, real property negotiations, Gilda's restaurant down on the Santa Cruz Municipal Wharf. My name is Dino Stagnero and I am the president of the corporation. First off, I'd like to express my appreciation for the long-term working relationship the city has had with the Stagnero family for over a hundred years now. As you discuss and provide direction to the Economic Development Department regarding the future of Gilda's Restaurant, 
It is my hope that the city and council recognize the values that Gilda's contributes to the heart and soul of the wharf and the community of Santa Cruz. Over the years, we have had a successful partnership with the city in building and maintaining the various structures which have housed our businesses. In fact, the current buildings which house Riva Fish House, Firefish, Woody's Cafe, and Gilda's were all funded by the Seastag Narrow Family Corporation. Gilda's has been an iconic and historical family-run business for nearly 50 years. Personally, I've worked there for the last 47 years. Unfortunately, with no fifth generation to carry on our business, me and my brother have decided not to renew our lease. We plan to retire. I've been working with Cabrillo College Small Business Development Center, the Community Foundation, and the Economic Development Department to try and see if there was a way we can form a co-op or something with the employees that are remaining there, but none of them seem to be interested. I am asking council to provide direction to the Economic Development Department to assist with the sale of Gilda's by approving a long-term lease that would be a beneficial to a buyer. And your, ti your time is up, but you're welcome to leave the documents with um, our city clerk here, and we'll go ahead and have those in closed session. Thank you very much. Were you here to speak to closed session, sir? Please come forward. I'm just gonna read uh, a statement. I have a claim against the police department here. Uh, I've asked Angela to provide this statement to the council and I have further testimony on Facebook. Uh, my name is Dr. Kenyon T. Blomquist. I'm the director of neuroscience at Semmel Institute for Neuroscience at UCLA Medicine. I'm a businessman and a statesman. I was the target of an attempted murder by police officers, the district attorney of San Diego and a family of Fallbrook, California. I am here today to indict the following people, indict at least meaning to put thoughts into speech. Officer Garrett Baldy, SCPD badge 441, for harassment, intimidation, invasion of privacy, and conspiracy to perpetuate a hate crime, and filing a false police report. Summer Sanders, the San Diego District Attorney, <laughs> six officers of the San Diego Sheriff's Department, unnamed officers of the San Diego County Correctional Staff, Sarah Beecroft, Robert Beecroft, Linda Beecroft, for intimidation, assault, filing a false police report, false imprisonment, conspiracy to commit murder, attempted murder, aggravated during the commission of a hate crime, illegal possession of firearms, aggravated during the commission of a conspiracy to commit murder, coercion, grand larceny, gross bodily injury, obstruction of justice, torture, and I'd also like to indict Donald John Trump for inciting a hate crime perpetrated by the above parties against me in the 49th Congressional District and genocide as a general application of my case to the population of the United States. I was targeted because of my race and identity. My entire personal and familiar history was stolen for personal gain or destroyed. I was expected to die as one of my assailants testified in court. The eradication of personal and familiar histories in a prejudicial manner with the expectation that parties will die or be unable to recover constitutes a crime of genocide. Officer Garibaldi made vulgar reference to this crime, which I remain silent about, out of fear of murder you're, you're, by defacing my homeless services ID in direct reference to the injuries sustained during the murder attempt perpetrated by <coughs> police time officers is up. against me. And you it sounds issued, like you, but your time right, is up. Yes, you have you, my side. You do. You thank, have, all right, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, seeing no other members of the community who want to address us at closed session, we'll go ahead and adjourn to closed session. City Attorney Condotti might have an announcement. Oh, did you have an announcement? Yes, <coughs> we've uh, received a request from uh, risk manager Patty Heyman, or rather from Water Department Director uh, Rosemary Menard through risk manager Patty Heyman to um, remove the David Bruce Press claim from the agenda, which would really uh, apply to the open session, um, but, but we will not be discussing that claim. 
in closed session today. And we don't need to take any action at this time, other than no. that was just an announcement. Okay. No. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll go ahead and adjourn to closed session. Okay. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our 12, now a little after 12 p.m. Uh, session for the November 26, 2019 Santa Cruz City Council. I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone? Here. Glover? Here. Meyer? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. And if our clerk could please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll move right along to the introduction of new city employees. <laughs> and let's go ahead and start with our planning director, Lee Butler, to introduce his new employee. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I've got two new employees to introduce today. I will start on my left with Brianna Sherman. She recently joined our team as an associate planner one, she moved here from Bozeman, Montana, and says she is happy to have left the snowy winters behind. <laughs> <laughs> she graduated from Appalachian State University in North Carolina and has over three years of planning experience in the public and private sectors. She has two Bachelor of Science degrees in Community and Planning and Geography and a Geographic Information Systems Certificate and a minor in Sociology. Upon graduation, she worked as a GIS specialist for a local nonprofit, enhancing Appalachian com communities. And um, she moved to Bozeman in search of a GIS field program where she ended up working with the US Forest Service's Wilderness Trails Program. Working to protect and preserve public land sparked her desire to make a difference in shaping the built landscape. So she joined the Community Development Department in <coughs> Montana's fastest growing county, Gallatin County where she was a planner for the past two years doing development review. She enjoys creatively working to solve problems and is happy to be back here. She is a Northern California native and she plans to spend her free time backpacking, biking and hiking. So please join me in welcoming Brianna. Welcome. My right, Allison Webster recently joined the city as an administrative assistant too. She says that she loves all things art, colors, layout, architecture, crafting, you name it. She tries to bring art into every area of her life, thinking, thinking it can be found in almost anything. She's a Santa Cruz native, born and raised, and graduated from Harbor High School, and then moved to San Diego and Pasadena to further her education, specifically focusing on print design. She realized being away from Santa Cruz was not all that it was cracked up to be. It's not, is it? Yeah. And uh, she moved back here in 2012 and uh, joined the place where she had her first job as a teenager with San Lorenzo Lumber and was working there since 2012, most recently as a administrative assistant in the River Street store. She is, uh, she says she's got a very inquisitive mind, loves learning all types of new things, and she's obsessed with her cat. And um, she uh, says that uh, Maya Angelou quote sums up her point of view on life, which is people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So please join me in welcoming Allison Webster. Welcome, welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the city, or welcome back. All right, so we'll go ahead and invite up now Tony Elliott to introduce his new employees in our Parks and Rec Department. I realized I was walking really fast. I'm glad you're, glad you're here. I'm glad. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Uh, for the record, Tony Elliott, Parks and Recreation. It's my pleasure to introduce Brian McNulty. Uh, Brian is a park maintenance worker a wor who works in the East Zone uh, with Mike Godsey, who's back in the audience here. Uh, Brian has been with uh, Parks and Recreation as a temp employee for about two years and recently uh, moved into a full-time position. Uh, Brian grew up 
um, going to city parks. He really grew up in this in Santa Cruz County uh, and grew up experiencing parks and going to city parks. So it's really kind of his uh, background and passion uh, from a young age. Uh, Brian got his uh, degree in computer science from Chico State uh, and worked in uh, high tech for a number of years. <clears throat> um, but he realized after high tech that his true calling, his passion, beliefs, and love are in parks and recreation. So uh, we're for very fortunate to have Brian uh, within Santa Cruz Parks and Rec. A um, couple other things. So Brian, uh, yeah, before this job, worked in tech, worked uh, various jobs in property management and grounds maintenance. Uh, he enjoys hiking, running, weights, gardening, reading, uh, and the outdoors in general. He and his wife recently visited Zion and Bryce National Parks in Utah. So uh, we're again, we're very happy to have uh, Brian as part of the team. So please help me in welcoming uh, Brian. Welcome, Brian. Welcome, Brian. Um, and then last, but certainly certainly not least, we'll go ahead and invite up Chris Schneider from Public Works to introduce his new employees. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council, Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works. We have two uh, new city employees, Public Works employees. Uh, first is Micah McManus, um, is a solid waste worker and uh, uh, Micah was born and raised in Santa Cruz, uh, third generation Santa Cruzan. He's married with uh, two children and a bulldog. And um, previous experience, he's worked for Costco uh, f in facilities, as well as a number of uh, other jobs, delivery primarily. Um, he lives in the Santa Cruz mountains, loves being there, loves hiking, riding West Cliff, and riding his quads on his property. So please welcome Micah. Micah. And then Joanna Edmonds, uh, Joanna, we stole her from the Regional Transportation Commission. <laughs> She's the transportation coordinator uh, filling an existing position. She's been a Santa Cruz resident for about 20 years. Uh, she's married with a three-year-old daughter. Um, like I said, she worked for the RTC and before that she worked for the university, um, all in transportation. <coughs> so we're uh, happy to have her with all her experience in transportation. She graduated from UCSC uh, she loves to garden, cycle, uh, the outdoors. Um, she's excited about working um, on the new uh, Go Santa Cruz program with the uh, downtown merchants and employees on uh, improving, um, you know, ride sharing and TDM in the downtown area. Fantastic. So, thank thank you. please welcome Joanna. Well, welcome to all the new city employees. We're glad to have you as part of our team. So before we move on to um, our regular agenda, we have a few presentations and a proclamation. So I'd start with inviting up some of our friends from our sister cities committee to um, share our experience in Chico. Please come forward. We have Andrea. Thank you, Mayor. Greetings, Council. I'm Andrea Rosenfeld, and I am on the Sister Cities Committee, as well as the co-chair of the Shingu Subcommittee. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the mayoral delegation to our sister city, Shingu, Japan. Uh, 2019 marked the 45th anniversary of the sister city relationship between Santa Cruz and Shingu. To honor this relationship, an invited delegation of city government officials, sister city members, and community members, led by Mayor Martin Watkins and myself, um, visited Shingu in October of this year. Here's the delegation at Nachi Falls, Japan's highest waterfall in a very sacred area. The Wakayama region where Shingu is located has many sacred temples and shrines and includes a pilgrimage trail called the Kumano Kodo. The area was designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site 15 years ago. Our hosts showed us around the beautiful and interesting region. We visited many of the shrines and temples in the area. Here are delegates purifying before entering the Hayatama Grand Shrine, which is located in Shingu. We experienced blessings and rituals at the shrines. Here we are with the priests in front of a 1,000-year-old tree planted by the then emperor. 
The tree is considered to be sacred with its tough leaves representing bonds that are difficult to break. We visited Mayor Taoka at City Hall. In addition to asking us how we were enjoying Shingu, he and members of the Shingu Sister Cities Committee presented Mayor Watkins with a gift honoring Tia Salika Adamek, a student delegate that visited Shingu in 2017, who tragically died in the boat fire, along with her family, best friend, and others, many of whom who had ties to Santa Cruz. The gift was a hanging sculpture made of over 5,800 paper cranes, which were lovingly made by members of the Sister City Committee and community in Shingu to honor Tia's family and the others who perished. This outpouring of sympathy and love by our friends in Shingu for the Santa Cruzans who perished in this tragic accident is really the best example of the beauty and depth of connection that exists between the two cities. We truly appreciated the sincere gift from our friends. The sculpture is currently being displayed at PCS where Tia and Berenice went to school and we hope to add an additional permanent display case at City Hall to house the sculpture and other artifacts that were given to us. We were invited to dress in traditional attire and participate in an annual autumn festival parade that is celebrated by the entire community. On the left is part of the delegation with Mayor Taoka and our Mayor Watkins. And on the right were the rest of the delegates, including in white, Linda Schnook, the current chair of the Sisters Cities Committee, whom I'd like to thank for her year of service this year that she's about to finish but continue on our committee. We had fun learning a dance that symbolized a fruitful fall harvest from land and sea where we were thrilled to learn that the entire town hall participated doing the same dance. Here's the group of us who participated with friends from the Sister City Committee with Mayor Taoka on the left and the woman next to him being someone who helped get us dressed and teach us the dance. Here we are at the farewell party. Our delegation was shown overwhelming hospitality and sincere kindness and friendship. We were so appreciative that Mayor Watkins was able to take time from her busy schedule to participate this year. We hope more members of the city government as well as community members get involved in the Sister Cities program to experience the genuine friendships and connections we have created in Shingu. And you will all have an opportunity to celebrate the 45th anniversary of our Sister Sh City friendship with Shingu as the mayor of Shingu is heading to Santa Cruz, um, heading a delegation sometime in October 2020. I encourage everyone to learn more about upcoming events for Shingu, as well as our other sister cities by going to the website listed here. And there are also four days left for any city of Santa Cruz, eighth through 10th graders who are interested in applying to visit Shingu this spring. Uh, applications are online. And I thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Linda, and the committee for being here and for your um, commitment to our relationship with Shingu. Thank you also for not showing the video of the dancing. <laughs> I appreciate that. That was an incredible summary of our experience and our long-standing relationship with that community, and so I look forward to reciprocating our relationship when the mayor and the delegation comes to Santa Cruz in 2020. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Well, we'll move right along and um, welcome up Claire for our presentation on Go Santa Cruz TDM program.
Good morning. Still morning. Yes. Good morning, <laughs> uh, Mayor and Councils. I am Claire Fleisler, Transportation Planner for the City, and I'm here just to give a brief update on our Go Santa Cruz program. As you know, we launched on October 1st, and so this is just an early update on how it's going and to give you more information on the program. So our Go Santa Cruz program uh, offers transportation options for our downtown workforce. The Okay, this is a little different. <laughs> there we go. The point of the program is to reduce the drive alone rate to below 50% in our downtown, in line with our climate action plan goals, to offer transportation options for our employees in the downtown, really by meeting people where they are and offering solutions that can work for all people, whether it be bus, transit, walking, carpooling, you know, working remotely from time to time. And then finally, to maximize our available parking resources, as you all know, part of this action was in response to our parking crunch in downtown. So offering a way for positive behavior change by our downtown workforce. Uh, so what does the program include? Um, it's really changing how employees travel. It includes, can I yell from here? This is easier. <laughs> yes. So it includes transit passes, an annual transit pass available to all downtown employees that is available on all local transit service, not the Highway 17, but all other local buses for unlimited rides over this, this period. It includes bike locker cards preloaded with $20 that you can use at all of the bike lockers that we have within our downtown, offering a secure bike parking option should you choose to use your own bike to get downtown. It also offers JUMP benefits, and this is the first of its kind in a nation, a program that we've partnered with JUMP on, $2 off per trip for 60 trips in a 90-day period. We also offer rewards. So if you log 10 carpool trips, we'll give you $10 in downtown dollars. And if you log 25 alternative trips of any kind, we'll also give you $10 in downtown dollars. We'll also have challenges going on throughout the year. Uh, the important thing I want to call out here is that this is money generated from the downtown parking district via parking user fees that then we're using um, these downtown dollars as an incentive to keep that money in downtown. It's been a great partnership with the downtown association. We have special downtown dollars that have uh, transportation images on them. And so how to get started, it's, we like to say it's as easy as one, two, three. You sign up at the link on your screen, you can find all this information at cityofsantacruz.com slash go Santa Cruz. You sign up at the link on your screen, you scroll down to the My Rewards section and select your options, and then someone from the Go Santa Cruz team, Joanna, who was just introduced or I, will physically come and deliver your transportation benefits to you. The high touch nature of that means that we can answer anyone's questions as we do show up. We can do continued outreach at the businesses that we go to visit and can offer more information to other employees who might be interested. Adoption to date, this is exciting. Uh, as of yesterday, we cracked 800 downtown employees signed up. That is 20% of our downtown workforce in under two months. This is huge, uh, far, far quicker adoption rate than we're anticipating and we're really excited about it. Of that, we have delivered 456 transit passes, 156 jump benefits, 93 bike link cards, and we've had 53 rewards claimed. For the program outlook, we have already reached over 125 unique businesses. Some of those have had uh, almost all of their employees sign up, some have had just a couple, but they are spread throughout our downtown workforce and we're tracking it over time. So where have we delivered <coughs> benefits? Where have we done outreach? Where have we done lunch and learns? Where have we distributed information? Where have we cold called? Where have we done all of these things to visit? Um, and so we're getting some great metrics from that. So we're really excited about the reach that we've seen. And it includes all sectors of business that we've seen. It, in, it includes ground floor retail and restaurant, um, upper floor offices, medical facilities, uh, the whole spectrum. And it's been really interesting to physically go and visit, especially some of these upper floor businesses that you might not have known existed. And it's been really nice to make those continued connections there. So finally, just in closing, you can find more information at cityofsantacruz.com slash go Santa Cruz. And if you have any questions, um, we also have an email address, go Santa Cruz at cityofsantacruz.com that goes to both Joanna and I. And um, we're happy to do any continued outreach, show up. We've been offering to go to staff meetings, lunch and learns, other presentations to continue to get the word out. And if you have any questions, I'm available, but just wanted to give you guys a short update on how excited we are about the program. Beautiful. Well, congratulations and fantastic work. Thank you for sharing all of the successes as well as the opportunities to continue to engage. And um, thank you for the update this thank afternoon. You. All right. 
Okay, so um, I'd like to now invite up, I think Kayla Kumar is here from Food What, and I have a proclamation um, that I'd like to present to the Food What team. So I'll just read a few of the whereas is and, and thank you for your work. And if you, you're welcome to say a few words if you'd like to as well. So um, in, 27, in 2007, Food Wet was founded to support the well-being, liberation, and empowerment of struggling yet resilient Santa Cruz County youth by creating meaningful opportunities for them to engage in relationships with land, food, and each other. Fresh organic food is not available to low-income families within our community due to its high cost, limited access, and other barriers. Food wet use, youth use their power to access opportunities that lead to major diet change, critical job training, personal growth, and more. Many youth share that through food wet, they find healing, inspiration, and family. It is important for our city to celebrate inspiring and effective nonprofit organizations in our community and recognize such leadership as a contributor to our community. So it's my pleasure uh, as Mayor Martine Watkins of the City of Santa Cruz to hereby proclaim, proclaim November 26, 2019 as Food Wet Day in the City of Santa Cruz. And I encourage all of our citizens to join me in congratulating Food Wet on its state and national recognition this year and expressing our heartfelt appreciation for its numerous contributions to our Santa Cruz community and our youth. So I have this proclamation, I'll go ahead and hand it down. And I'll just say, just having worked um, in other capacities with Food Wet, how much I appreciate the commitment, the, um, the mission, the purpose. I had an opportunity to um, have the mayor's breakfast uh, be the uh, nonprofit of the of the choosing for the financial contributions of that, and um, just really want to thank you from the heartfelt thank you for all your work and for the youth that you serve. So I'll go ahead. And I know uh, Councilmember Myers maybe has. Yeah, I just um, working in the nonprofit sector for a long time myself, and and having many many colleagues in it, I just have been so impressed with your work. Um, and for those watching, Food What received uh, an award this year as Nonprofit of the Year uh, in Senator Bill Monning's district, which I think is quite an honor, honor especially considering uh, Senator Monning's history um, in supporting uh, so many uh, different communities throughout the Central Coast. And also they were recognized at the Eco Farm Conference this year at Asilomar uh, for their work as well. And I believe they, they uh, received the Justice Award, uh, which is a national uh, honor. And so I'm just pleased that we have such an amazing uh, organization here. I, I took a tour of the farm and I would encourage everyone to get up there and check that out because it will, it will ground you in all ways. So congratulations. Um, thank you all so much. Um, I'm honored to accept this on behalf of Food What. Um, and just want to thank Mayor Watkins and Councilmember Myers and all the rest of the council who has found a way to plug into the work one way or another. Um, it's, uh, I also, I really want to honor uh, alongside y'all the youth, right? And so we've been honored with uh, recognition for our work and um, our work is centered around youth, the youth power, uh, food what, and um, when we come together like we have, we, we see that when youth are provided with the resources and opportunities and training that um, you know, resonates with their dreams, that they always choose to be well. You know, youth want to be well, youth want to thrive, youth want to contribute to the community. So I, I just really appreciate the way that we've come together um, around that point. And then as Mayor Watkins so graciously invited me to do, we have pies available at New Leaf. Um, <laughs> the youth, it's one of the youth's projects so they step into a leadership role at the very end of their year to um, create these really good pies. I don't, they still won't even tell me what's in them, but it's magic. So thank you thank again. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Got to say food what? <laughs> All right, wonderful. 
Okay, so um, we'll go ahead and now move right along into our general business portion of the meeting. Before we do, I have just a few announcements. Um, so today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25, as well as streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left, and it's my job to keep our meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens while you are inside and outside of our council chambers. I'd like to go ahead and ask if there are any council members who have a statement of disqualification today. Okay, seeing none, I'll go ahead and see if our city clerk has any additions or deletions to our agenda. We do, item number nine, the agenda was updated, so, um, but it was removed by staff. Okay. All right, and then I have a brief announcement around oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of our community to speak to us on any item that is not on today's agenda, and it will occur at or around or as close as possible to 7 p.m. this evening. We'll go ahead and turn it over to our city attorney to report out on closed session. Thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the city council. This afternoon's uh, closed session convened in the courtyard conference room at a little after 11 a.m. Uh, discussed in the closed session were uh, item A, conference with legal counsel, liability claims, the claims of Kurt Allen DeChicho California Beer Festival, Kenyon Thomas Blomquist, and Deborah Brown. Uh, item two under uh, liability claims, the claim of David Bruce Press was removed from the agenda and there's also a request to remove it from your consent calendar um, when you vote on that this afternoon. Category B, real property negotiations. The council uh, received a report from and gave instructions to its negotiator on the following uh, properties, 125 Coral Street, uh, the property known as Gilda's on the Wharf, 808 River Street, 744 River Street, and um, a property without a situs address designated as APN 0081-17216 in the records of the Santa Cruz County Assessor, uh, owners of property Richard L. and Tawny Santee trustees of the Santee Family Trust. Um, lastly, item C was a performance evaluation involving the city attorney. Um, there was no reportable action. Okay, thank you. And I don't believe we have a city manager report today. Okay. So next on our agenda is the city um, council's uh, calendar. And that is um, to be right, revised as needed. Is there any revisions to the calendar at this time? No, there's not. Great. Moving right along, we'll go ahead and move on to our consent agenda. And so first up on consent are items uh, five through 11 in our agenda packet, except for item number nine, which was removed by staff ahead of, ahead of today's meetings. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. I'd like to see if any of my colleagues would like to pull an item. Number Vice 10. Mayor Cummings, item number 10. Any others? Okay. Any comments on any of the items other than item 10? Seeing none, is there any member of the community who would like to address uh, the council on our consent agenda that is going to now exclude <coughs> items 9 and 10? So essentially um, 6 through 11 without 10 being included. Please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. My name is Teresa. I did send my uh, comments by email. Um, and the request is to pull the item eight regarding the culvert project from the consent agenda so that it can be open to public comment. Um, item uh, number eight is for a permanent drain pipe on the San Lorenzo, San Lorenzo Lagoon. And um, as, far, as far as I can tell, there is a permit for a project a temporary pipeline, but not a permit for this project, a permanent pipeline. That is my question. Um, I would also like to 
tell the council a little bit about the seals at the lagoon. There's a poster behind you about the seals of the city of Santa Cruz. And there are also marine mammal seals of Santa Cruz that are at this lagoon that uh, should be protected during this project. Thank you. <coughs> are there any other members of the community who would like to address us on our consent agenda? Given the questions that were raised in regards to item number eight, I don't know if there's any staff who would like to speak to that at this time. In public work, is it? No, not here. he's not here. Okay. All right. Any questions um, on behalf of the council in regards to Councilwoman Matthews? Um, I'll go ahead and make a motion to move the consent agenda, which consists of items five through 11, with the exception of item number nine and item number 10, and on item number six, item B. I'm correct on that. Could, I would like to remove item eight and probably maybe get a staff person to talk about that. Okay, you'd like to make the request I'm, of I'm concerned about that as well. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we'll go ahead and pull eight and then have the remainder moved at this point. Okay, I'll go ahead and sec second the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. All right, do we want to start with item eight? Do you have a staff person who can speak? Uh, Chris is here, he can answer. Oh, okay, great. I think basically the, no, the question was about whether this is uh, temporary or permanent and has there been anything to um, take, keep in consideration uh, the marine mammals that evidently live where this goes into is what the question from the public was. <coughs> sure, Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works. Um, we are working with all the regulatory agencies, fish and wildlife, both California and federal, uh, NOAA, um, Army Corps of Engineers, anyway, a number of public agencies on this project. It is currently considered a permanent project and we're in the process of, you know, getting all the permits finalized, completing the design on the project. The intent is to be under construction next summer. And uh, it's got a lot of moving pieces that are, you know, taking a lot of time. Staff has met with um, the woman that came up to speak to you and uh, answered her questions uh, to the best of our ability. Uh, we believe that all the agencies are gonna be considering, you know, all the wildlife that's associated with the project. Thank you, I hope that answers, is the, is the person still here? Or is yeah. Left? Oh yeah, okay, I hope that gets to it. Okay, thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Any other members of the community wanting to address us on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back for action. Councilor Matthews. Um, I'll go ahead and move that item, approval of number eight. Um, and I'll just note for the public, um, this has been uh, many years in the making and just in terms of environmental review, the staff report uh, does explain that the agencies involved in reviewing it include uh, the Department of California, Department of Fish and Wildlife, California Coastal Commission, State Regional Water Control Board, Army Corps of Engineers, NOAA National Marine Fisheries and the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife. And uh, it's spectacular when you get that many different agencies headed in the same direction. So okay. I'll, I'll move the motion. Okay, I'll go ahead and se second that. Um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, we'll go ahead and hand it over to Vice Mayor Cummings who pulled item number 10 in our consent agenda. <clears throat> so I just wanted to make sure in the recommendations that we're approving, um, Yesterday, it came to my attention that there was a discrepancy bef between the recommendation and then what was in the staff report around uh, apprentice hiring. In the recommendation, it states that um, that there would be an exemption for apprentice employment requirements. However, in the report, it stated that the contract will maintain the requirements for apprentice hiring. And then earlier today, um, we received um, information from the water director, Rosemary Menard, that the uh, apprentice employment would still be required and would not be exempt. And so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear in the motion that we are making today. Okay. And I see staff here. I don't know if you're interested in speaking to that or if. Well, no, nope. that could made an error in the sure. not changing the title. Okay. Thanks. Councilor Burkhardt? Yeah, I had more of a question. Maybe it's for the uh, city manager. I'm not sure. Um, why? Um, mm -hmm. I see nothing here that takes into consideration the fact that we have um, a, a camp at 1220 River Street 
Are we making amends? Are we gonna move that camp? Will they be able to move back once this work is completed? Um, what, what does it look like? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to answer that. So we clearly recognize that uh, the River Street camp will need to be relocated as, as a result of this, this but that's not till March. Um, and in the, in the meantime, and you'll get a more of an update on this in your uh, item this evening, uh, but we do have uh, identified potential options for relocating the camp that are um, achievable. Um, it would just be a matter of coming back to council with the various options for you to consider uh, and, and the board of supervisors. Because uh, one of the things that, that we'd like to look at is uh, not just simply relocating, but is, is there also an option to relocate and expand capacity at a relocated option uh, or facility? Uh, but yes, we feel pretty confident that uh, uh, we have the ability to move it uh, by the time frame that uh, is needed to do that. Last question for um, uh, Rosemary Menard. Um, how critical uh, if, if, is a March date? Is that fixed or is there any flexibility, say that we found something but it wasn't going to be ready until um, a couple months, a month or two later? Um, thanks for the question. Um, I, the, the reason that the schedule is what it is, is that we need to do this project in the dry season. And in fact, when we started talking about um, doing this project, we got the design organized and actually made the conclusion that we couldn't get it underway in July or August this last, you know, uh, 2019, because it's a eight or nine month construction window and it requires us to um, go through the wet season if we, um, God willing, we have a wet season, but um, it requires us to go through the wet season during the construction. The construction involves uh, digging two very large pits, one on the west side that's going to be 70 feet deep and one on the east side that's going to be 50 feet deep and then um, drilling a micro tunneling under the river with the connection. And doing that during the wet season is just really asking for lots more complications. So the schedule of starting in March is kind of, has the same effect basically of needing to get the construction underway so that we can finish it kind of by the November timeframe next year. And that's really what's driving the schedule as well as the critical nature of this particular uh, facility. As I mentioned when our correspondence earlier that we, um, we've had a history of leaks. If it fails under the river, it's not repairable. And it's very possible that it could fail under the river um, and really on many, many days during the year, 100% of our water supply that is ultimately produced and delivered to our customers goes through this pipeline. So um, the timing is really being driven by trying to make sure we get it done in the drier part of the year rather than the wet part of the year. Thank you, Mayor, I appreciate it. And I'm encouraged by what the city manager said that he is on it as far as our staff is uh, finding a alternative location to that, that River Street camp. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Brown. Did you have a question? Oh, no. Okay. Councilmember Brown. Just a quick follow-up question. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, do you anticipate that this site might be available then after the work is done? Is there any need for the water department to continue to use it? Or would it the, be possible to? The plan is to restore it to its current uh, condition. Uh, not in mean, just the the site itself. Now, the one thing that we've been talking about that could potentially impact the availability of the site is, as you'll know from the public safety power shutdowns that we've had, that facility has um, has a generator on site and uh, we probably need to move that generator out of the location it is because it was one of the sites where we had flooding in 2017, but we also need to install a larger um, tank for diesel fuel to run the generator during the power shutdowns if we're going to continue to experience those. So there's been some conversation about partly using part of that site, but there's nothing definite at this point. So <coughs> that's that's the only other, I mean, we've used that site for years as a storage site for pipes and parts and things, but we don't have a long-term uh, defined need. There've been some talk, but not anything permanent. So I guess just if, if I could make a comment in light of that uh, response, I would hope that that site then would be, would continue to be in a, 
maintained as part of the discussion around emergency shelter, given that we have, have ongoing, kind of consistently have had ongoing issues uh, with identification of, of sites. So um, it's my hope that that'll be part of the mix once it's made available again. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Is there any member of the community who would like to address us on this item? Seeing come forward, you'll have up to two minutes. Hey, uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, through the City Government Academy, I was given the opportunity to ask questions and learn about the pipeline replacement project. I understand and support our water de department and its continued efforts to maintain and update our water infrastructure. At the same time, our community struggles as our citizens experiencing homelessness struggle to find solutions. And I do ask that this project is scheduled in a way that does not worsen the situation for most vulnerable our most vulnerable and our community. So I offer for one of you to make a motion to require city staff with input from the catch before starting the pipeline replacement project to find a suitable alternate location for the 1220 River Street Salvation Army program and renew its contract, which ends March 31st as well. Um, and to have this be separate from the efforts of um, renewing the VFW site program, which is an effort unless it's gonna have enough beds for both, which I would accept. So um, just saying that yes, it's absolutely important and making that as a directive to possibly make more sites available if it actually was a directive to find that before it happened. Thanks. Any other members of the community wanting to address us on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return back for council. Councilmember Myers and then Council Vice Mayor Cummings. I was gonna go ahead and move the, move the item. Uh, so I'll make a motion to approve the plan specs and contract documents for the Coast Pump Station Raw Water Pipeline Replacement Project, authorizing an exemption from local and apprentice, yeah, from, from who? From local, <laughs> yes. Uh, and authorize staff to advertise for bids and award the contract in a form to be approved by the city attorney. The city manager here's, is hereby authorized and directed to execute the contract as authorized by resolution number NS-27563. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Any further discussion, Councilmember Cummings? Uh, sure, we'll go ahead and have you make a comment, then we'll have it over to Council. I'll just say, with regards to um, the relocation of the, the homeless encampment there, that I know that there's an item on tonight's agenda that we're gonna do a lot of discussion around homelessness, and so I think that would be the appropriate time where we can discuss um, that coming back. and I, do want to make note that the city manager's office has made a, you know, a strong statement towards trying to find alternative locations for that, and um, the city's uh, commitment to, you know, trying to to be aware of the concerns around moving homeless people and making sure that this camp has an alternative place to go. So, just want to put that out there. Just probably to be consistent with our um, Robert's Rules of Order, it makes sense probably to reserve our conversation until the evening if it's not agendized on that topic. Okay, Councilor McCarty. Can we put that in the? Um in the uh, motion to cities committed to finding alternative space um, when we displace 1220 River? And as we've mentioned, that's that's going to come I'm tonight. Not, I'm not going to take gonna come that tonight, so. But this is a different project right now. I mean, it, it is within the scope of this. Uh, this evening, uh, I'm, we're going to discuss the, the shelter. Uh, up, I'm going to provide a shelter update. And in the context of that discussion, is gonna, are, I'm going to discuss the uh, three items uh, about uh, increasing shelter capacity as you've directed, as well as an update on uh, the River Street Camp and next steps there as well. So uh, I think there's, there's gonna be plenty of opportunity to discuss all these things and for you to provide direction. It'd be easier just to do it all together than separately, quite honestly. My question is, are we committed to finding alternative space for 1220 or or not? That's, that's, I just would like that to hear that commitment and it, it, it'd be great if it could fit within the, um, the motion. I'll go ahead. I mean, that is the topic that is on your evening agenda. Well. So we'll reserve um, action and deliberation on that topic at that time, correct? <coughs> as it's not agendized at, under this item as well, correct? Mr. Condos? Okay. Okay, Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Matthews. Thanks, without getting too much into detail with it, I think what I'm picking up from Councilmember Crone is that if we were to pass this now and give authorization for the project and then say later tonight not 
ensure there was a safe relocation for the people that are the space, then it would put those people at jeopardy and those spaces at jeopardy. I don't think if we're talking about it in detail, it's more just saying an approval of this, that since there is something already at that site that we are committed to making sure that that is sustainable moving through the project without getting into much detail about it, I don't know why there's so much resistance in us making a clear statement that we, we approve it, but we want to make sure that the people there have a place to go without specifics, but just that we are committed to doing that. But it, you know, just putting that out there. Councilmember Matthews, um, this question obviously occurred to everybody, and I did have a good talk with both the city manager and water director about um, the the commitment. They are aggressively working on alternatives, and um, um, I'm confident we will find them. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. All right, thank you. All right. So that concludes our consent agenda. And we'll go ahead now and move over to our general bus business item, item number 12. And we'll invite up Tiffany Wise West and Okay, good afternoon City Council members and Mayor, uh, Tiffany Wisewas, Sustainability and Climate Action Manager, and I am so pleased to be here today uh, to uh, speak with you about uh, the outcome of this six month endeavor on uh, health and all policies. I know the Mayor, I think, want to make some introductory remarks. Yes, please. Well, I just want to first all just, I'm, I'm so pleased as well. I want, I'm so impressed with the work product and I'm truly grateful for the subcommittee's time as well as the staff's time and the community's time and all of our consultants. It's really, it's an exceptional um, result. And it's been a, a really extraordinary journey to be a part of this. Um, so just sort of in context, I want to just sort of remind the uh, council and the community that this was a uh, effort that was um, decided upon several months ago. And it's this is what we have before us today is the final work, work product of the planning team as well as the um, department head subcommittee input. And if anybody who was here or engaged in it, and I see a few folks um, want to be acknowledged, I'll just sort of list a few. We have Shebra Kalantari Johnson, who is our consultant, just did an extraordinary job. Um, I had Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings as part of the subcommittee. We have Lee but Butler, who's here as well. Uh, to Tony Elliott, who was here earlier, and Bonnie Lipscomb, who's still here, and Rosemary Menard and Cheryl as well from finance. It was a wonderful team and um, just really incredible work product. So um, I'll uh, kick it over to Tiffany and just before I do, I'll briefly just remind folks about kind of just overall purpose and context of what health and all policies is. Um, and here comes Ian as, as, as I speak. <laughs> so this is Ian who um, uh, works with Tiffany in, in the city manager's office and did a really incredible job um, on, on, on the whole process as somebody who attended a lot of the listening sessions with me, but also a lot of the research and work product that we have before us today. Um, so one of the things that health and all policies really hinges on is the fact that no government body can really do this alone. And it's really looking at how we as an institution as well as our partners, uh, both public and private, uh, also all orient around uh, health equity and uh, sustainability in our decision making. And um, we'll, as we go through the presentation, as Tiffany goes through the presentation, we'll sort of reorient around the three pillars of what health and all policies is, really looking at the health um, equity lens, the public health lens, and ultimately the sustainability lens. So with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Tiffany for the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to remind uh, you, City Council, that uh, the purpose of the Health and All Policy Subcommittee and the work plan that you adopted uh, back in April was to develop a collaborative uh, and a collaborative and coordinated policy and process for internal and external reflection on equity, public health, sustainability, and their use as factors in decision making that ultimately will result in improved community well-being. 
And we've used this slide many times before in coming uh, before you with the work plan as well as at the study session and our most recent quarterly update. And it really just, uh, this kind of circle emphasizes, you know, collaboration, uh, intersectoral collaboration, the uh, co-benefits that can be had, I, it most obvious to me between uh, public health and climate adaptation and the importance of engaging stakeholders and creating processes uh, and policies that really uh, incite structural change. Before we get into uh, what our work product includes and what the recommendations from the subcommittee are, I just wanted to uh, have two other slides. One that really documents the uh, broader support of health and all policies. As we mentioned to you in our quarterly update, Governor Newsom has allocated three cabinet level positions uh, in the state um, a government in order to prioritize health and all policies. Um, also, the Santa Cruz County Health Services Agency uh, has indicated their support and commitment to facilitating and convening around health and all policies issues. And through uh, the work we are doing, Watsonville has taken notice and they also are considering adopting health and all policies. Tiffany, I don't want, I just, yes. if I could briefly just interject. And we have uh, my friend and our wonderful Watsonville mayor here, Paco Estrada as well. So welcome and thank you for being here. Sorry. Yeah, definitely. And on that note, um, just this, this work we've been doing over the past six months has really allowed us to collaborate and identify partners in this work and we're really seeing some momentum in this space. Also, there is a new study that just came out and this speaks to a question that Councilmember Crone had asked me uh, some time ago on the efficacy of the use of health and all policies in having um, more positive uh, community well-being outcomes. This study just came out last month, as a matter of fact, and it examines three communities um, who've been pursuing health and all policies long enough to achieve meaningful policy systems and environmental change. Um, what this study uh, indicated is that communities can't achieve health and all policy and community well-being outcomes that, that they desire overnight. This convening, collaboration, uh, engaging and envisioning uh, makes time, uh, requires an investment of time. But the communities in this article do illustrate that each step taken towards health and all policies makes each subsequent step easier. And uh, the study also found that, this, uh, that these communities um, that have integrated health and equity across a range in plans and policies, that it does indeed shape decisions, lead to actual community transformation and improve community health outcomes. So this is the first study that we've seen longitudinally I thought you might be interested in. Okay, to jump into the timeline, this is really a repeat of what you've seen before. Uh, a little over a year ago, uh, you directed a subcommittee of both uh, city council members and department heads to prepare a work plan. Uh, we came back in April with that work plan, which you approved. We dove deep uh, through a study session in June. Uh, in September, we were back giving you a quarterly uh, report. And here we are uh, in November where we have completed the evaluation, the evaluation report, and are bringing forward some policy and implementation recommendations for you um, for consideration. In January of 2020 then, we anticipate with your approval today to hit the ground running. And uh, that will be dependent on your, your decision today, uh, but we already have an eye towards what the work ahead uh, will be. So getting into the process that we have uh, taken or this, this uh, pathway we've taken over the past six months, um, in order to conduct an assessment and evaluation, uh, we really drew from five, uh, five different sources of information. And I'm gonna be going through each of these uh, in detail. So first of all, uh, in terms of our employee survey, the subcommittee developed and administered the health and all policy survey uh, over the month of July of this past year, uh, where employees were surveyed on their awareness of the cities and their own utilization and prioritization of health and all policies pillars in their work. The survey's response rate was 19%. 
And uh, we utilize these data in our gap analysis, which I'll talk about later, and our recommendations, which I'll touch upon right now. So some of the findings from the employee survey and all of the detailed data and analysis is contained in volume two of the report. So if you ever wanna dive in and, and take a look for yourself, there are also cross tabulations um, by uh, demographic that you can also take a look at. But these are really uh, generalizations from the entire population or sample rather of um, employees that took this survey. So we did notice that there was a general lack of understanding of what those three pillars mean and equity in particular. This is despite the fact that a vast array of outreach efforts are being conducted across the city that aim to address equity. <coughs> There is also an expressed interest in better understanding and integrating and, and understanding how to integrate the three pillars into employees' work. <clears throat> there were also many different examples provided by employees when asked how they use the pillars in their work. For example, I didn't know that some employees are using trauma-informed care and in providing services. We did know that the uh, Arts Commission is centering, centering equity in its mission statement. And also there was some perceived progress made in improving access to services for marginalized populations and groups, as well as providing interpretation and translation services. These findings were important, particularly in the development of the recommendation around training. They really informed the training. In terms of the community survey, so this, uh, the subcommittee developed and, and administered a community survey during August and September of 2019. It was distributed through various community lists, um, social media, flyers, and announcements at community meetings. Uh, the community was asked to provide feedback on their perceived levels of well being for themselves and the community and the impact they believe the city has on individual and community well being. And this is a pretty extensive survey. Unfortunately, due to some technical difficulties with our website, we really had a low response rate. So the generalizations that I'm, or, or the findings that I'm presenting to you today are really generalizations that are limited to that sample. Um, and I think it's really important to keep that in mind, um, although I am going to highlight them for you nonetheless. Uh, by the way, this survey was both in English and available in both English and Spanish. So first of all, we did find that respondents indicated a positive um, responses with respect to the use of alternative transportation. We also found uh, that respondents uh, said that there were excellent to good opportunities to participate in community ma matters, but at the same time expressed concerns over fairness, accountability, um, and openness. Respondents also said uh, that there was a fair to poor access to affordable housing, affordable access to childcare, and quality physical and mental health care. However, that is contrasted with respondents expressing excellent to good opportunities for health and wellness opportunities, which to some degree we interpreted as self-care, fitness and recreation, and volunteering, all of which are in. Uh, oftentimes used as indicators for community well-being. We also found that people unevenly experience unfair treatment because of their demographic factors, things like race, gender identification, religious affiliation, shelter status, and et cetera. So, however, 71% of respondents also indicated that local government has an impact on health and well being. This is an important finding. And this ties directly to our recommendations for an ordinance and a gender report language so that we can foreground these three pillars in all our decision making. Next, uh, the mayor embarked upon a listening tour of 13 different uh, community groups between the months of August and September, and actually the last one was just in November. Green Schools Committee was the first opportunity we could get on their agenda. Um, meeting with everyone from business organizations to the Health Improvement uh, Partnership Council to environmental groups, the Beach Flats community, education folks, uh, seniors, teens, uh, and the United Way. 
And we had some structured questions that we asked in these meetings after the mayor uh, presented <coughs> what is health and all policy. So the first question, when you envision successful community well-being, in one word, what does that community look like? Really, this revolved around being happy, healthy, safe, vibrant, and a collective community. So I'm trying to use less text and use images here. <laughs> um, the second, so these were the common responses ag across the majority of the sessions that I'm sharing with you. The second is what is working? What is contributing to community well-being of our city? <coughs> and we heard that jump bikes and an innovative vision was a, those were common themes that we heard across the majority of the sessions. And then in terms of uh, what's possible, what, it, what is one action the city can take to realize our vision? Building more affordable housing and increasing opportunities for community outreach and participation were those that were expressed uh, commonly across the majority of sessions. <coughs> I wanna remind you that in our community survey, we did hear that there are excellent to good opportunities to participate in community members, but clearly there's an eagerness for more. So with those data, uh, as they informed our recommendations, we also utilized some of this data in what we're calling a gap analysis. So through our gap analysis, we looked through all six of these various uh, policies and programs put them in a matrix and decided which addressed the three pillars, included those, and then we had a variety of city functional work areas across which we indicated where each policy or program fell into. So we looked at uh, the general plan, the six month city work plan, the free responses from the Health and All Policies Employees Survey, some policy documents, including the City Council Policy Manual, the APOs, and then we also did um, a survey of programs across the city departments. And what we found is that equity, public health, and sustainability were not so much addressed across these different functional areas um, of the city's uh, operations. We looked at 13 of these areas. So here we really are daylighting where we are not intentionally and consistently using these pillars and it shows us where opportunities lie within the organization. And the recommendations of agenda report language and training will help us to address these various areas that you see uh, here before you in this slide. So with that, um, we have compiled all of those data sources, that analysis and evaluation into a two volume uh, report that uh, was included as an attachment to this item. It contains uh, three recommendations uh, with the third having a few parts to it. Number one, the adoption of a health and all policy ordinance and a city council policy. So today would be the first reading of that ordinance. Uh, the inclusion of language in the analysis section of city council and commission agenda reports. So uh, we would prepare uh, guidance for staff so that they understand what the expectation is here. We're not necessarily asking for a new section. This could be a uh, language that could be in the analysis section of the existing agenda report format. And number three, approval of a city council policy that includes uh, monitoring of well, uh, well-being indicator metrics. And again, as a reminder from our, uh, our quarterly update in September, we're really tying those to the core and the community assessment project, which incidentally their uh, latest results have just come out this week. Um, we're really tying them to those metrics so that we aren't reinventing the wheel here and that we're aligned uh, regionally on this effort. We are also recommending training for staff, commissioners, and leadership on these three pillars, and in fact, have already been in conversation with human resources on how that might take shape. Again, to be defined and brought to you uh, in a work plan, uh, implementation work plan in January. 
and then uh, to commit to facilitating and participating in one to two stakeholder partner convenings. Uh, and finally, in order to accomplish this over the next year, I cannot express how valuable it was to have um, Shebra's uh, assistance with this, uh, as well as Ian, I didn't get to give a shout out. Ian and Shebra, we could not have done this effort without both of them. And so it is critically important to have this annual budget allocation in order to carry out these these modest but impactful, potentially impactful recommendations uh, that the subcommittee has brought to you uh, today. Um, and in terms of what would that budget cover, um, we are expecting that would cover um, the monitoring, reporting to council um, on that monitoring, uh, ongoing outreach and coordination on those convenings that we mentioned, and grant writing. Importantly, we really have an eye towards pursuing a couple different uh, grant opportunities that are out there to uh, go further into this work and um, try to accelerate and mag amplify our impact. Um, so with that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Tiffany and team Welcome. for the presentation. And um, I'll just say how wonderful it was to engage with the community on this topic and to really come together to talk about our common vision and desire for a thriving Santa Cruz for all, as well as really a, a recognition of some of the strengths of our city, but also some of our challenges to address. And I appreciate you also integrating uh, the recent report that was shared with us in terms of how this is the first sort of leap, if you will, um, that hopefully subsequent steps will contribute to to making this longer term sort of shift and impact um, really uh, influence in a positive way. And just actually yesterday I was at the uh, community assessment project and if those of you who were here for the study session or who observed it at home, um, remember the city of Gonzales presented to us and they received and were recognized yesterday Yesterday for receiving the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Culture of Health Prize Award. And if you can recall, they had really um, robustly integrated the health and all policies framework in their city. So I think it really speaks to um, kind of the national movement around how we're, uh, as local institutions, able to work with our partners around these three pillars. Um, so with that, um, um, Thank you again for the presentation. I know some of our staff is here. I'm happy to see if any of uh, the other council members who are on the subcommittee want to uh, say a few words and or if there's any questions from the council at this time. Council Member Glover. Thanks. Um, so first, I wanna congratulate you on this. It's a, an attempt, so it's super important for us to be able to approach serious issues in the community, especially surrounding health equity and sustainability. It's also commendable for us to start the process in general, so I wanna applaud you on getting this moving forward. Um, also show some similarities in some of the things we're uh, interested in, uh, at least on the forefront. Uh, that being said, I have lots of questions with regards to the process uh, up until the point, you know, reviewing some of the stuff and in the agenda report. Um, specifically, I'm glad that it that touched on the outreach aspect of things uh, because there was that um, instruction or approval from the council to participate in the work plan and then open up the the dialogue with the community. Now, as mentioned, there were community list surveys, social media flyers, and announcements at community meetings, um, but there were only 82 uh, responses to the survey. So were, it was everything online and just reliant on the, on the website that malfunctioned, uh, or what, did it go out through social media? It was a combination of all of them. <clears throat> the survey itself uh, in both Spanish and English lived on our website. We did provide it through a variety of outlets. I provided paper copies to the Beach Flats area, uh, but did not receive any completed copies back. Um, so unfortunately, yes, due to this technical glitch that essentially caused um, surveys to take about three minutes to submit. We did hear from folks that they abandoned um, even trying to submit the surveys and we worked really hard with IT to try to figure that out. We had actually tested the survey and gotten 32 surveys ahead of, completed ahead of time and it was unclear why this happened and we ultimately were not able to resolve it, unfortunately. And did they ever figure out what the situation was or? No, they didn't. Hmm. Um, okay, um, that's unfortunate. And what was the what was the software that we were using? 
It's our website. Our website. Yes. Okay. Questionable, I guess. It's it's a website that I've utilized in the past for surveys mm -hmm. and had no problems with it. Um, IT, I have to give them a lot of credit. They really tried to work with our vendor to try to figure this out. And we put language on our webpage saying, you know, we are experiencing this issue. Please, you know, do wait for the submission. But we do understand that that <coughs> most likely discouraged folks from submitting. Mm. Um, and how long did that unexpected delay or thing happen? Was it like a one-off day that it tried to get fixed or was it over like weeks or? No, it was over weeks. Over weeks. Yeah. And when it couldn't get figured out the first time or the first day or two days or three days, how come we didn't explore any alternative surveying options? Because we had put a lot of time into promoting this survey through this and we didn't realize that we wouldn't be able to solve it. Okay. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Um, uh, yeah, with that 82 number, the, the, the stat or the generality, I guess, that was up there with regards to how unevenly people experience discrimination was a little problematic for me, um, especially knowing the demographics of the community. And uh, was there a demographics question on the, to identify what they identify with? There were demographic questions, yes. And do you have those percentages? I don't have that right now, no. I can certainly get that if you're interested. It is contained in um, the volume two of the report. Great. Yeah, it's a 130 some odd pages I figured I'd just ask. Uh, so uh, that's okay, uh, unfortunate technical difficulties. Uh, okay, so I just wanna move on then to the uh, Spanish language surveys. So it, they, it was all contained on the website, but and there were physical uh, ones handed out, but we got zero back. Correct. Right. That's unfortunate. Um, and then with the listening sessions. Okay, so really acknowledge the outreach and the attempt to reach out to various sectors of the community and really capture their perspectives. It's it's really good with uh, with everything. The full transparency though, I'm a little confused with the results of the evaluation report. Um, for example, according to the agenda report, it says that the listening tour sessions range from 20 minutes to an hour, which included time for the mayor to provide information on health and all policies and an opportunity for participants to respond to a set of questions. So 20 minutes to be able to express everything that has to do with health and all policies and then to get feedback seems like a really short amount of time. So can you tell us which of the sessions lasted 20 minutes and why? Sure, let me get to that slide. So we really tried to work with existing structures that were in place. So in some cases, for example, um, Chamber of Commerce or Santa Cruz County Business Council, it was a 20 minute agenda item. Whereas the teen center, uh, the senior center, we had a full hour. In fact, I think most of the um, sessions were an hour. So what we did was develop agendas for the range of time that we had uh, with groups. And in some cases, particularly when we had shorter time frame with groups, um, we had a worksheet so that if everyone could not share out loud, we could collect that worksheet and get input from everyone on those four questions uh, that I mentioned. So that's why the variation oh. in um, in the time frame and it, with whom we met with was it was opportunistic on existing meetings, and in some cases we did have you know fresh scratch meetings uh, that weren't necessarily uh, uh, aligned with a, some kind of regular meeting. Okay, thank you. You're um, welcome. Uh, just, uh, I asked that just because of the idea of equity, which is one of the pillars of the, the process. And just reviewing the evaluation reports, I uh, came up with some questions, especially with regards to uh, the beach flats, because it looks like uh, there was a listening session, two that took place on the same day, August the 15th, one with the beach flats community and the other with the Santa Cruz Business Council. Um, but there's a stark difference in the format of the responses, and maybe you could speak to that or someone can speak to that. Just with regards to the Beach Flats community, it seems that the only thing that appeared in their report back was the comments, which was there's vague one-liners essentially, mm -hmm. but the business council, and almost, I believe every other one, we don't need to go through each one, but every other listening session was made up of specific questions, like when you envision a successful community well-being in one word, what does that look like, and so on, and then ending with comments and questions. So can someone explain to me why the Beach Flats report back is only comments, and were they given the same format and questions as the rest of the 
the groups. Sure, so that was actually a session I was not in attendance for, uh, but the mayor was at, and from what I understand, there were not a lot of people in attendance and that it seemed to be a better fit to just talk with the community versus posing uh, these four questions and asking for feedback. But I do have to defer to the mayor to um, provide more details as I was not there, but that's my understanding. Sure. So um, what that evening consisted of was a video screening. It was a movie that they were going to be showing at, the, at their community outdoor area. And so um, prior to the movie screening was the opportunity to have the listening session occur. But given that there was sort of just uh, kind of a, a mix of individuals at the park there, we, we did was have more of these individual type conversations and notes taken from our conversations. Peter was there, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, um, I'm failing to remember his last name. Bichier. Bichier. And he was there as well to help kind of document some of the conversations as well as ask those specific areas and sort of insights. Um, so absent a more structured kind of meeting format, um, we were able to draw out some of their input that way. Mm -hmm. um, and so you say it was, a, it was a film in the park kind of evening. Was there specific outreach associated with the health and all policies presentation associated with that park event or was it just a go to the park and then talk to whoever's there. And then also how long did each one of those meetings go for? Was the Beach Flats, how long was the Beach Flats interaction? And then how long was the business council which would happen the same day? I think the business council might've been about 20 minutes if I remember correctly, that was in the morning there was a fuller agenda on that one. And I was down at the Beach Flats for probably about an hour, just kind of hanging out and it wasn't necessarily um, you know, as I said, it wasn't, uh, we coordinated with the Beach Flats um, Community Center down there and it, um, and so it wasn't that we just sort of showed up, it was expected and... and yes, if, if I might add to that, we, um, sat, through my uh, Resilient Coast Santa Cruz work, I have been working really closely with leaders in the Beach Flats area, and we really wanted to make sure that we came to them with, first on how, what is the best way to reach people in the beach flats. We didn't wanna just come in hot with a meeting and say, hey, come on, do this. And they made the suggestion to align it with this, um, this movie that was gonna be happening. They felt that that was the best way for us to reach a lot of people mm -hmm. uh, in that area. Um, there was one other thing I was gonna say with respect to that, I might've lost it. Um, Oh, the other thing that I was going to say is that, and we did actually go down and flyer the Beach Flats area to promote this, that folks come down and it went out through uh, Edgar Landeras uh, newsletter and so forth. So we did um, try, we actually tried to promote that more so than I would say almost any other um, of the sessions that we did have. Right. Um, but you know, just uneven success and um, I really learned from my outreach that this is an iterative process and we have to try many things and learn from those kinds of things. So clearly there's some, some gaps in, in how we, are, or the type of data that we collected, um, but we do feel like this was um, you know, a, a good effort, the best effort that we really could have made under the time constraints that we had. Thank you. You're welcome. Vice Mayor Cummings. I just wanna start by um, thanking Tiffany in particular for all the hard work you did working with the mayor on bringing this forward. Um, there was a lot of effort that went into this. I mean, obviously you can see through all the outreach efforts that were done, um, the surveys that were done, and the ability to really incorporate um, the voices from the community. And you know, when things happen, when we try to launch big initiatives like this with regards to technical difficulties, but I know that, you know, that's, you know, one piece that we'll learn from, and as we continue this over time, I think that not only will we be able to refine our efforts and techniques around incorporating information from our community, but we'll be able to use this information to make sure that we're addressing a lot of these issues around affordability, inclusivity, uh, justice, and health in our community. And I think that, you know, if, as, as we move forward, um, if we can continue to incorporate this into the things that we do in our everyday lives, um, it will be able to, I think that it, it will be a good tool to help us have a better community. So I wanna thank the mayor for um, having me on this subcommittee as well. And, and I'm looking forward to um, seeing how this can be incorporated in our community. Yeah, thank you for your time. Councilman Matthews. I'll make just a couple questions and then we wanna hear from the public. And when the time comes, I'd be happy to make the motion. Um, this was an ambitious project. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I do want to thank the mayor for um, championing this and uh, Tiffany 
you just did a heroic amount of work. And Ian, where are you out there? What a champ, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Shebra, for your help. Um, really, it was definitely a team effort. And uh, the research and the documentation that went into it and the outreach, sure, you know, there can always be improvements, but people were really making a, a sincere effort um, to reach a, a variety of um, community members. Um, so as I say, it's ambitious. Um, um, I thought from the very beginning that uh, we wanted to acknowledge the um, values and traditions in the city of Santa Cruz that already demonstrate our, our commitment in these areas. Um, those are reflected uh, in much of our general plan and many, many pick a specific plan, uh, climate action, housing, whatever. I mean, I think these are just our active transportation. These things are embedded already in so much of the um, planning work that we've done, but this pulls it together in one spot. Um, and it's also clear, I think, that going forward, we do rely on partnerships and uh, reliance on other entities, um, both for the implementation and for the evaluation. You mentioned the CAB report, uh, and there are many, many others. I also talked with the county, and I know that particularly in their health department, they're trying to um, be uh, more structured in their investments, and they're uh, looking for impact. And we can certainly share in that without having to recreate that wheel. Um, I do have a couple of, I would say, basically minor edits um, in the final recommendations. I've, I've shared them with the other committee members and with Tiffany. So when the time comes, I'd like to go ahead with those. Great. Hey, Councilor McCarthy. I just have two questions. Um, I was wondering, how did the bike, the jump bikes, what, what was that about? You know, when we asked people what's working, it <laughs> came out, oh. almost every uh, group said they love the jump bikes. Now, Meeting. granted, with my resilient coast hat on, there are conflicts between the jump bikes, pedestrians, and other bikers on West Cliff, so that's another issue. But all in all, the jump bikes are perceived to be very positive. And back to the number of surveys, what, what, what do you think, you know, you've done a lot of research, Okay, advanced degrees. What would be an adequate number to really inform us? Is 82, is that is that good enough? No, or it's not. Should we be getting how many, would you say? I didn't do that calculation. There certainly is a calculation that can be done, but it's more on the order of hundreds. Yeah, okay. Uh, closer, I mean, I fully acknowledge, and I tried to preface that slide with the fact that generalizing around 82 uh, person sample is not robust, uh, it's not, probably reflective of the community, yet nonetheless, I wanted to share what those findings said. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. I'll just maybe, if I could add that, you know, this is hopefully this, the first step to something that is gonna be larger in the time, and so um, more opportunity to come for community engagement, ideally. Yes, we can certainly build upon this, learn from the lessons from this, and so forth. Um, yeah, I totally see this as a starting point. Any other questions, Councilmember? Just questions. Uh, yeah. I have just some comments. Maybe. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and uh, you have a question? I, I mean, if we're going to get into the ordinance uh, and stuff like that, yeah. Question. Uh, yeah, I was. We didn't give more people some time. Uh, okay, so we can jump back into it. So um, there's some language questions <laughs> I have with the ordinance, specifically around some of the definitions. Uh, so I notice in the equity definition. Ours is equity is just and fair inclusion into society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. But when looking at the state task force's uh, sheet, essentially, and looking at their definition of equity, it goes on to say equity is synonymous with fairness and justice, so that's in line, but uh, is both an sure. outcome and a means to an end. So the means in which to get somewhere requires there to be equity, and to be achieved and sustained, equity needs to be thought of as a structural and systemic concept. So I was just curious, because uh, there are other ones that like, in. Um, inequities, I believe, which is a direct copy from the other one. So is there a reason for that changed language in the definition of equity? Any thought going on? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what the question is. A change from? From the state task forces uh, document? Did you, where, where did we generate not, these definitions of equity? Not necessarily, no. This was a working definition that the subcommittee considered throughout the duration of this six months. If the uh, city Council feels it's appropriate to change it, that's completely feasible. Great, I was just curious how it got there. Subcommittee, do you know how it got there? 
I think do, if my understanding is that this was also generated from the change lab solution that's uh, model ordinance template. And that's so we correct. essentially were working off that and they're the experts in health and all policies work. Okay, great. Um, thank you. The other one also is racial equity. So I noticed that there's no definition of ra racial equity in the ordinance. It does appear as a term in the top of the second page, I believe, but there's no included definition. So um, is there a reason why the reason I ask though is because the inclusion of the term racial equity is something that stuck out to me. I couldn't help but notice that if you look uh, at all of our documents, it only appears twice in the 171 pages of reports uh, pertaining to the Santa Cruz research or the intention of implementing the policy. Um, and it uh, appears once in the employee responses to racial equity where it says, quote, in response to the statement that the city partners with other institutions and community organizations to advance racial <laughs> equity, a weak minority of supervisors agreed, but non-supervisor respondents were equally split among agreeing and, and neither agreeing nor disagreeing. So just curious, because it's, if it's in a survey question, why there's no emphasis or discussion around racial justice. And again, I will point out that on the state task force version of it, it appears 17 times in a 15 page document. So there's some severe disparities between our acknowledgement and the emphasis on racial equity as opposed to say the state. And I don't know if you're operating off of the framework of the other uh, organization that you just referenced, but that's rather problematic for me and concerning uh, so can we speak to that? Why is there such a disparity in the term of the language being proposed in Santa Cruz and why is there no definition included in the documents? There's no, in my opinion, no intentional omission of that for any reason. It could easily be added. Mm -hmm. um, this health and all policies is looking at the three pillars. It had a really specific um, outcome that, or, or specific, yeah, outcome in terms of policy and process. I certainly think that we need to dive deeper into racial equity. Mm -hmm. I myself am interested in power analysis, equity screening tools, racial equity screening tools that I'm starting to implement in my work. So I don't think there was any deliberate omission of well, that. I don't think so either. Yeah, um, okay. I just want to, maybe just I should preface that question. or clear it up. I don't think that that was intentional, um, but maybe it was an, it's okay to say it was an oversight. We didn't think about it. Um, I don't know why we didn't have it in there, but I think it's indicative of a larger problem that we have here in Santa Cruz of our failure to look at and emphasize the importance of racial justice in our policies. So that's one of the things I think was highlighted by the, the structure of this as it's brought forward. Uh, so good to know it wasn't intentional though. I didn't think it was in the first place, but thank you for clearing that up. Uh, okay, so now we can move on to the ordinance, which for the most part I totally thought was good. Uh, there's one glaring issue that stuck out though, and it is the framework surrounding the social determinants of health. Uh, there's not much in reference to housing in there. Um, there is one piece uh, later on, but this is just a small addition, but I wanna bring it, uh, bring it up because I think this is a fantastic item as we move into the evening. Uh, they'll be talking about some of the items later on with regards to housing and being sheltered or unsheltered because according to a wide array of studies and reports conducted by entities ranging from Kaiser to the Center for Disease Control, housing is a primary social determinant of health. And uh, there are lots of links here. I was trying to get in early enough to print out copies for all of you, but I'm happy to send you links or Bonnie the links and she can send them out or whatever that might be. Um, and so we could change the second paragraph in the, uh, of the whereas uh, to add or to make it say, quote, whereas there is a growing awareness that health and well-being are influenced by the interaction of many factors such as housing and not simply by genetics, individual behavior, or access to Medicare. So um, when we get into the, after we hear public comment, that might be something I'd be interested in exploring. Do we want to go to public comment or, okay, we'll go ahead, why don't we go ahead and open it up to public comment. Um, if those of the community who are interested in speaking to the council on this item, please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes to address the council. Sure, Chair Phillip, uh, this policy, policy should not have cost a dime and been implemented with only one sentence. Policies should be considerate of the effects on citizen health and be equitable and sustainable and mean exactly what the dictionary definition of those words mean. To pay for it to be loaded up with a globalist leftist manure pile of unaccepted ideology and redefine those words in the way they are is an affront to the people and a waste of tax dollars at best. At worst, it demands reprioritization of every policy in almost any way you choose 
by defining health, equity, and sustainability differently as you choose. The definition of health is, and always should be, quote, the state of being free from illness or injury to a person's mental or physical condition, unquote. The definition of equity is, and always should be, quote, the quality of being fair and impartial, unquote. You seek to explicitly redefine and install into the politic costly, voluminous pages of other justifications for government overreach, largely taken from anti-American directives from foreign globalist authorities like the UN or the World Health Organization, which instead should be pristine American-made of principles. The logic is corrosively defective. The potential of a human is not measurable and is really just an ephemeral, abstract, unverifiable opinion, not a concern of equity. The social determinants you mention uh, as inequitable include income in inequality and immigration status. To whatever extent I demand these be removed. Some people are worth more than others and justly get paid more. Illegal aliens are criminals, are unvetted, take jobs from Americans, lower our wages, import poverty, cost a ton, and have not sworn an oath to accept our nation's principles or respect our culture and laws. My point, there are always other considerations than prioritized, monofocused equity definitions of leftist stale grievances and slogans. You should only be in the business. I not even make it that close. <laughs> I almost made it. Next speaker, please. You'll have up to two minutes. I'm really, really happy that I accidentally came early today. Um, this is one of the best things that I've seen in city council and in city government for a long time. And I just wanna thank you for your leadership on this, Martine. And I think it's incredibly encouraging about the work that we can do in city government um, in general. I just want to uh, make a few comments. First of all, uh, I did hear Ms. Tiffany Wise West say that um, we can build on this and what she's interested in and the work that went into it, your listening se sessions. And that is also really, really encouraging. I, d I have just scanned it. I'm just gonna add a few, of course, I have to be critical, you know me, have to be critical, don't feel alive unless I'm critiquing something. So I am gonna just make some suggestions. Um, I did notice that in the equity section, there's references to um, income, and there's another word that goes along with that. I would like, if I had my druthers, for status and class to be much, much more overt, because I feel that um, certain statuses are so self-perpetuating. For example, once a person falls into homelessness, if they don't have good family support, they're likely to stay in homelessness for a very, very long time. And it's just because of factors in the society in general. I'd also like to see um, low income housing, that kind of language added whenever we talk about affordable housing, because affordable is more based on the um, market rates. I would love to see low income housing get special notice and for that to start to be included everywhere. Um, about the jump bikes, I think they're fantastic. I live downtown, people use them all the time. People are thrilled and happy to be on them. There are safety issues. I know Vision Zero is addressing some of that. I, I agree, we do need more data and the number of persons in the sample is a little low, but I look forward to the future where it's higher. Just in closing, I want to say thank you again for really bringing in the, this into our city discussions. Thank you. Good afternoon, honorable city council members. On behalf of the Health Improvement Partnership of Santa Cruz County, I'm here to speak with enthusiasm for the health and all policies recommendations being brought forward to you today. My name is Elisa Arona. I am the executive director of the Health Improvement Partnership. This includes the four hospital systems, the Medi-Cal health plan, multiple county departments, mental health and behavioral health treatment partners, and philanthropy granting in health. And I am thrilled to see this intentional effort to put health at the center of the city's decision making. In August of this year, HIP partners participated in the listening tour regarding the city of Santa Cruz's health in all policies work. And there was resounding agreement among the diverse group of partners that the health of our residents is contingent on far more than what services can be offered in a clinic or in a hospital. Adopting an HIAP ordinance is an important step 
in coming together as a community to consider the many other arenas of investment and policy that can promote and will ensure the health of our community. I commend you all for the commitment to community engagement that was clearly part of this process of bringing this forward thinking approach to today's decision making point. I assure you all that there is traction among the healthcare providers to work in collaboration with the city of Santa Cruz to spread the IHEP approach across the county. We are also fortunate to have an HIAP model implemented in the county of Monterey as, um, as Mayor Watkins shared. So we have a real opportunity here to affect change through a new way of approaching the way we do business that puts health at the center. I look forward to working with the city of Santa Cruz and making your work visible and supporting you. Thank you and have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thank you. Mayor Strutter. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council, City staff. It is my absolute honor to be able to address you today. And I simply just wanted to be here to commend each of you for this amazing work and for leading um, in this area. Uh, and we uh, hope to also be uh, starting our own process soon and implement something similar. So uh, kudos to each of you. And uh, you know, I, I hope you vote in favor and support of uh, the recommendations. Thank you. I support this. How can you not support this? Um, ever since Mimi did the presentation last year, like it's, it's, uh, we're all in agreement and I'm really proud to be part of Santa Cruz to have this part of thing. All the people that put the work into it, um, I super appreciate that. Um, I, within the report, um, a lot of the listening groups mentioned homelessness, um, but it doesn't show up on the actual ordinance. Um, and for homelessness, uh, the biggest social determinant of health and longevity is housing. Um, there's no other change as a social determinant that will extend a person's life, even if you're talking medical care. Um, there are a couple places that you could add it if you wanted to. Um, at the end of the second paragraph, uh, it could be added. It is also widely accepted in the medical community that the housing of those experiencing homelessness is a sig single biggest de social determinant of life expectancy. Um, you could end. It, you could add it as the fourth paragraph, the first word, homelessness, comma, food, food access, housing, transportation, or in the sixth paragraph where it says, whereas addressing the social determinant of health can lead to reduced health care, you could also add better outcomes for the community, and in regards to those experiencing homelessness, less trauma, more dignity, and extended life expectancy. Um, again, thank you very much, and. Uh, for this to be something that is part of our discussions is beautiful because we care about our people. And I hope it is also part of the discussion tonight about the shelter stuff. Thanks. Are there any other members of the community wanting to address the council on this item? Okay, seeing none, thank you for those that um, spoke to us. We'll go ahead and return back to council. Councilmember Matthews, uh, Myers, Glover, Vice Mayor Cummings, Brown. <laughs> Yep. Well, I'd, I'd like to put a motion on the floor. I suspect there'll be some changes, and I have some as well. <laughs> um, again, I want to thank um, Tiffany and Ian and Jebra for all the work they did on this. Um, so uh, I'm going to try and follow the recommendation in our um, packet here. I'm, I'm not sure it's entirely the same. Um, uh, first is to accept the HIAP evaluation report and recommendations. And secondly, to introduce for publication an ordinance adding 6.02 to the municipal code. Um, and I do have um, personally an amendment um, that I would like to add to that. Um, mine is, and I'll, I'll scratches on it. It's, I, it's all <laughs> marked up because I had typos on it, but you can maybe uh, project that. I would like to add in the, uh, and I'll, I'll continue on down with the rest of the items. Um, I would like to add under the definition of public health, which is on page 12.7, uh, 
um, the following. Public health is the science of protecting the safety and improving the health of communities as a whole. To me, that was missing from the concept of public health, and to me, it's fundamental. Uh, and then that statement goes, which I, I cribbed from um, Center for Disease Control and World Health, a variety of definitions. The mission of public health is to promote conditions in which people can be healthy. This work is achieved by researching disease and injury prevention, education to promote healthy lifestyles, and public policy to address the health priorities of communities and populations at risk. So I would just like to add that into the definition of public health. Um, and I agree with some of the comments that Drew made. We can come back, but for my motion, that's the one addition that I would like to add on the municipal code. The third item shown is the adoption uh, of the Health in All Policies Implementation City Council Policy. And um, I did have some uh, a change to that. The and that's on page 12.8. The implementation section there um, talks about things happening within a year or a specific budget amount, and those to me seemed uh, not appropriate for an ordinance that's intended to last over time. So uh, I would suggest uh, the following fund in implementation, which is um, the section 6.03050 simply say the analysis section of city council and commission agenda reports will include reference to how the report considers the high app pillars. It doesn't talk about it being prepared um, within a certain time frame. And then secondly, the functional procedures for integrating the high app framework into city operations will be defined in council policy. So it's just kind of a, a more general direction. Um, and um, I think that's it. Um, let me see. There is somewhere the reference to the $25,000 annual allocation. That's in the city council policy. That's over, oh, that's in, thank you, Tiffany. I, <laughs> um, and that's on page 12.10, yes, turn the page. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, um, I would prefer to take out that amount uh, and just say under implementation, um, when developing city council departmental work plans, the following things will be included. One is an annual budget allocation to support grant writing, monitoring, reporting to city council and or outreach. Two, annual evaluation of the city's high up effort. Three, training for new staff commissioners and leadership in all three pillars. And four, participation by staff and leadership in stakeholder and partner convenings to ensure cross-section, cross-sector collaboration. Uh, there again, I didn't put in the number per year, but I think the intention is there. So um, again, those are just a little bit editorial, but, um, and then the other would be to direct staff to return with an implementation work plan by the first meeting in January. And I would be happy to also include because I took the dollar amount to say we recommend 25,000 in the coming budget year for implementation. I'll second the motion, but then I would like to see if um, I could add some further direction and then we can maybe nuance some yeah. of the language. Um, but the further direction would also be to have our city manager's office research um, initiating uh, Tiffany's position to be full-time uh, climate action manager. I know that she has a shared portion of her time um, uh, spent doing other things. And um, given this work and uh, broader work, I think it'd be worthwhile for us to explore how to make her uh, full-time in that position. And um, I'm, I invite the city manager, I know, um, we spoke to, about this in advance, if you, if you want to say a few words as well. Yes, certainly we can definitely look at that as part of the, uh, the budget process, the mid-year budget process. Okay, great. 
Uh, I think the kind of language I'd be comfortable with would be um, direct the city manager to explore opportunities for um, uh, uh, more um, uh, robust staffing of this function. Is that, I mean, you know, I, I hate to hit, tie it to a person if you know where I'm Which going. could include potentially increasing yeah. our existing and it, and it's all budget. Too. Could we add that, which could potentially yeah. include, okay. I, I'm just gonna say to in, investigate the possibility for more res, robust staffing for this, for the high up function. We add, which could potentially include um, increasing our uh, not permanent climate manager to be potentially permanent. As a, as a specific option. That feels weird to me. <laughs> no offense on Tiffany. <laughs> uh, okay, well we can maybe look at that later. If I we want, we can separate that out. That's implied. And, and I will say, I, I didn't go into detail, but the expectations here of research, analysis, metrics, et cetera, are exceptionally ambitious for the fiscal and people resources that we have. And we have a lot of other functions to measure. And I mean, this is, I'm just gonna be honest, this is kind of written like it's a PhD project or it's a think tank project. <laughs> and, and we can't do all of it, which is why I asked about the other um, community resources that are doing the kind of research that could be useful to us that we don't have. And, and, I don't know if Elise is here. Yes, I don't know what HIAP is doing, for example, in terms of health data that could be useful that we don't have to re recreate ourselves. Um, so I think I'd like to just leave it there. Okay, so maybe what we'll do is, I'll just maybe ha say that that wasn't, um, we'll maybe separate out the potential amended amendment or a, a supplemental direction, direction yeah. and revisit that after we go through the motion as uh, as presented so by Councilor Mas. I'm gonna go ahead and withdraw that and then I'll reintroduce that or have maybe a colleague reintroduce that as a potential solution after, if and there's I, interest. Okay, I did want also in terms of amendments, um, uh, um, acknowledge Drew's comment because racial equity popped out at me. There are a lot of kinds of equity issues, that not being the only one. So um, uh, possibility is to talk about promoting healthy communities, um, equity across various uh, factors of disadvantage, of which there are many, ethnic, social, class, educational, et cetera. Um, that's just one possibility. Excuse uh, me, could you tell me where you're referencing in the document so I can track that, please? document, and I'm just, I'm just suggesting it as, uh, but it would be in, uh, it's not a numbered whereas, the, the whereas at the top of 12.6. Your, your page is not numbered. No. That's a, um, it's the second page. It's the second to last. The findings. Well, it's near the bottom of the whereas's. It's the second to last whereas? Thank you. Yeah. It just that leaped out to me as a rather restricted definition of equity issues. I'll just open to discussion. Okay, well, we, we can definitely discuss. I'll just sort of maybe, if 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 I may, um, just sort of reorient us around. You know, this is really clearly not perfect, but it's yeah. really good, and it's a step in the right direction. And we'll have ample opportunity if we move in the direction of wanting to make this a priority to refine, to recommit to engaging the community for input, and to have it reflect hopefully holistically what we want it to reflect. So knowing that there may be elements of imperfect, that there may be, um, there is absolutely opportunity for it to be iterative and grow, um, that's a really great first step. And, and, it's, and it's based on a model that has been presented by the go-to statewide um, consulting agency um, presenting these different opportunities for communities. Okay, I believe I had Councilmember Myers, then Councilmember Glover, <laughs> then Vice Mayor coming, then Councilmember Brown. <laughs> I just have a couple of additions. Um, overall, um, I just wanna compliment the subcommittee and Mayor Watkins. Um, you know, we, government likes to do things in siloed ways and I think currently um, we're really starting to see 
how that results in really missing some major issues as they arise in our community. So I think what this is doing is really blending um, what people would think of as typical city services um, with the recognition that, um, you know, there's people living in cities and there's families living in cities and there's kids living in cities um, and there's seniors living in cities. And so I, what I think this is, is, is powerful as a policy is that it really kind of makes us take a step to really acknowledge the population and the community as regards to sort of what typical city services are. So I really compliment Tiffany, your work, Ian, your work, the whole um, group that worked on this. Um, and I think as we see um, cities struggle with a lot of so societal issues moving ahead, this kind of uh, framework helps us uh, have a place to really evaluate things from. So congratulations on all the work that you guys did. Um, I have a couple of suggestions um, in terms of um, the, word the words environmental sustainability in the ordinance. Um, one, I would just suggest that maybe we provide a definition for that. And I'm gonna look at Tiffany because I know you've, you, you can probably uh, do that for us very easily with, with a minor amendment in terms of making sure that we identify what that does mean. And it does show up um, two or three space places in the ordinance. And I do think it's important. Environmental sustainability is sort of a big concept. Um, some people interpret that as transportation goals. Others uh, interpret it as land-based goals. Others interpret it as clean air or clean water. So if there's a way to kind of understand that, especially moving ahead, so we can really tie that into the actual uh, human health and uh, community health objectives as well. Excuse uh, me, Council Member Myers, may I ask you a clarifying question, please? So under the definitions, we do have sustainability. So are you suggesting replacing that with environmental sustainability or, I yeah? Would, I would suggest that we provide a definition of, of environmental sustainability okay. in the definitions as well. Okay, thank you. And um, a suggestion if possible, and I don't wanna create a lot of work for people, but um, I was impressed with the whole report. Um, I did read however many pages it is. Um, and I guess the most part, one of the most powerful things that I saw in this, um, and it really tracks with how we do our outreach during um, you know, general plan processes and other things, you know, when we update our transportation plans, these big planning processes, but um, the amount of outreach and, and groups and organizations that were involved, obviously our housing effort um, two years ago was very, very similar to this. Uh, I don't know if there would be a way uh, to capture, um, there's an impressive list, which I'm not able to find right at this moment. Um, Somewhere in an appendix. Yeah, it's in appendix, uh, appendix L. Uh, we have an impressive list of organizations as well as a list of the listening tour. A lot of these um, organizations exist in town. Uh, it would be probably overwhelming to, um, to try to describe each one, but um, it, it just capturing a way to really describe sort of the <laughs> interrelatedness of some of these groups might be helpful. Um, for those who may not be f completely familiar with all, especially the, um, the service providers health service providers, some of these groups um, are, uh, you know, so important to our community. I don't know if we can put a little snapshot of, of a few of them or if we can incorporate maybe even just um, the ability to look at those occasionally via the website or something like that and really get a sense of what their mission is. I think it would be helpful to provide context that way to this work as we kick it off. Um, those are just two suggestions. Let me just make sure I'm trying to keep this. I think those are my main one. Many of my other comments have already been made and uh, so I'll end it there. Thank you. Can I ask one more clarifying sure. comment? So you are not suggesting that we revise this report, but rather in the future, perhaps when we bring the implementation work plan or other products throughout next year to look at that, how those missions intersect and the interrelatedness between the organizations, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Booker. Thank you, yeah, so first I just wanted to ask if um, Cynthia could uh, repeat the phrase that you used when you were talking about racial equity. It was something along the lines of racial equity across, what was that? I just said um, various factors of disadvantage. Various factors of disadvantage. Because there are many. 
Yeah, I felt really weird about that, okay. uh, that, that's, that phrasing, because I don't think being of a racial category is a disadvantage. I think that socially and structurally, the system makes it a disadvantage. So I would really be, uh, I would appreciate if we didn't use that, that language. That was pro problematic for me. Um, and just to be open and honest and clear and transparent, as our book says. Then also, um, how many times did the steering committee meet? Or the, the subcommittee? Subcommittee met maybe, some, more, more maybe four to six times. Four to six times, and that was over six months, right? Correct. Okay, cool. I was wondering, because that was a lot of additions at the end there, because it was even really hard to track all of your amendments and suggestions. I would have thought those would have come to us in the, in the presentation, but uh, I don't know if we're gonna be able to get that up there at some point, Bonnie, to be able to review before I the vote. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm cool, because that was a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, especially with the addition of staff time or hours or cost or all that kind of stuff, that seems like that wasn't incorporated in any of the suggestions to begin with. Um, but uh, we'll get back to the amendments that I was talking about. So with regards to the second paragraph, um, I think we could add such as housing after the word factors. So the are influenced by the interaction of many factors such as housing um, but then also end that paragraph with it, it's also widely accepted in the medical community that the, house, that the housing of those experiencing homelessness is the single biggest social determinant of life expectancy. Do you have a, you have a question? I just have the question of where, which of the whereas is that you're? This is the second whereas. What was the other, um, what, could you state the last request? Uh, right, so second paragraph, second line after factors would be such as housing and simply not by genetics, comma, individual, or whatever, and then ending that paragraph with the sentence, it's also, it is also widely accepted in the medical community that the housing of those experiencing homelessness is the biggest, a single biggest social determinant to life expectancy. Um, I wonder if that would be a separate sentence in that the <coughs> framing is around, I think, a more common definition for the social determinants of health that I've seen, but a separate sentence could be that the influence of housing is an impact on... on, on, on no, um, I'm, I'm happy to put on that, the first part there. That's just how I'm going to rearrange a tiny bit. Interaction of many factors, not simply by genetics, individual behavior, or access to resources such as housing, education, or medical care. Oh, I would okay. like to fold housing in with those other resources. Is that, that uh, as, sure. housing in there? As long as housing is, is represented in there, absolutely. Um, I am interested, um, however, in getting specific language to acknowledge the impact of uh, shelter on people experiencing homelessness. Uh, and if not there, then I have some other suggestions, but I'd like to see that at the end of that, uh, that section. Uh, Tiffany, if, if I may, um, in terms of how I've seen the social determinants health, of health framed, the language here um, <laughs> is pretty consistent. Is that your interpretation as well with how it's written in, in many ways? Or it is, but I have to acknowledge I'm not an expert in this field, so right, right, right. I really can't comment any further on it. I would just say personally, I'd rather keep these whereas as general. There may be other places to. Okay, maybe we can look in. at another place. Yeah, I, I, oh, I sort of. Okay, well then, uh, in paragraph four on the third line, starting it, so it says policies related to homelessness, comma, food access, comma, housing transportation, public safety, education, sustainability, climate change, parks and air, et cetera. Where are you? Do you want to give me, give me uh, a number? Paragraph four, line three. On what? You're reading it. On the ordinance? Fourth whereas. Oh, the fourth. Okay. Okay. Third line. So the entire thing would read, whereas policies implemented by the city of Santa Cruz outside of the traditional health sector significantly affect the social determinants of health, including, including policies related to homelessness, comma, food access, comma, housing, comma, transportation, public safety, and so on. Okay, that fits sure. more clearly for me. Yeah. All right, thank you. 
Like so, wonderful, cool, right in there, excellent. And then uh, paragraph six, or whereas six, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, addressing the social determinants of health can lead to reduced health care costs, better outcomes for the community and re in regards to those experiencing homelessness, less trauma, more dignity, and extended life expectancy. As well as to a whole lot of other people. So I'd like to leave that one really clean the way it is. Okay. Well, at least we got housing and homelessness in there at least once. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we had, sorry, Vice Mayor coming. Then Councilmember Brown, and then we'll go to you, Councilmember Brown. I'm just going to acknowledge. I know there were a lot of comments that came up earlier around you know, <laughs> racial equity, um, the well-being of people, and I just want to point out that that has come up a lot throughout mm -hmm. this. That we, you know, we bring up racial equity within this, um, and this is within what four pages. Um, on a number of occasions, we also. Um, are mentioning that this policy is to improve the well-being of all people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we are really trying to be intentional around saying that we are trying, this policy is intended to not discriminate people because of race, housing, socioeconomic class, that this policy is to address inequities and try to bring more equity to people within our community. And so I just want to point that out um, overall. and. Um, and I have a, a, an additional motion to make after we move forward with this. Great. Council Member Brown. Well, Council Member Glover pretty much raised the questions for some changes that I thought would be helpful to make around acknowledging um, homelessness as, as in part as part of this. So um, I'll leave it there, but I'll take the opportunity to thank the um, staff, Tiffany, for all of your work, uh, consultants and subcommittee for your work to bring this to us. Councilman Burkhardt. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, I do appreciate you bringing this forward and I um, really love a lot of the language that's here and things that, you know, we're attempting to undertake and uh, define. I appreciate the uh, equality, equity, definitions and the differences between those two things. I think it's, it makes it really clear. Um, there were, uh, I, I was wondering if we could, if it would be appropriate on this one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, the fifth whereas to put in and city council member collaboration, interagency and city council cl member collaboration uh, can lead to improved decision making and outcomes and greater efficiencies in service delivery. Does that make any sense there? If it would be, I'll just say I think the intention was all the aspects of the city with all the other agencies okay, out there. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. That's all I had. Thank you. And I, I love the on page 12.7 uh, under the thing, the safe housing, access to healthy and affordable food, really important, really, really big. And the concept of stewardship, you know, that I always see our role up here as, you know, stewarding the resources we have here in the city and getting the best deal for <laughs> our voters and residents. So I appreciate the concept of stewardship and the responsible management of resources. Thank you for including that. Well, I just want to thank everybody for their input. And similar to our process, I'd say, um, with the community and internally, that um, the more fingers, the more um, voices, the more additions that sh show shared ownership over this, um, the better. So I appreciate the um, willingness to, to dive into this a little bit with us. Councilman Matthew. And I'll, I'll just say, I read through this a few times, and every time I read it, I saw different stuff. So um, sorry for the later things. I also resonated with the issue that Donna raised about sustainability. And this definition, I didn't even mention all the things that left out, <laughs> but this was one. Sustainability means creating and maintaining conditions so that humans can fulfill the requirements. I don't think of sustainability as totally human oriented. <laughs> I think of it as the well, whole natural world. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm wondering if we just flip the two parts of those. Sustainability can be thought of in terms of environmental, economic, and social impacts and encompasses the concept of stewardship and responsible management of resources. If we just put that first and then say 
it can also mean creating and maintaining conditions. Because I think of having sustainable institutions, a sustainable sure. environment. Is that, that, if we just true? flip those, would that do it for you? Or? I, maybe it's just me, but I think that environmental sustainability is a really important con co concept as we move forward because we will be making choices between water and habitats. Mm -hmm. So I just, I'm gonna hang on to my one comment around environmental sustainability because it is an integral part, the word environment there. Um, and, and it's actually used um, both in the state language as well as, as mentioned in the, so. Is there, I, I, I think we wanna do a first reading. Can we just? I'm wondering yeah. if, if, if we do the first Find reading. Throw it in now? Yeah. Or? I, I'll, I'll, I'll offer some language for the, for the second reading. Is that, would that well, then uh, dramatically the change it? Sorry. We, Sorry. No, it needs yeah. to happen. It needs yeah. to happen today. I wonder if though, what we could do in the interest of continuing to move this along, but knowing it's gonna be iterative, is that one of the um, first sort of, or one of the areas that the implementation um, kind of work encompasses is really ex exploring environmental sustainability as it relates to this work and potentially an integration. Let me just see if I, in the, in if the, you can rearrange some words. Anna, I got a thought here. Yeah, let me just, <laughs> I think Cynthia, I can, I see where you're, yeah. I, I'm fine with that, absolutely. I don't want to hold this up just okay. over that. Just flipping Certainly. it? Certainly, let's flip it. So you'll be, okay. so it'll be it'll sustainability, start sustainability can, can be thought of in terms of, in terms of, of, of yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And see where we're going with that, Tiffany? Yep, this means creating images so that humans I would say, and uh, humans and, let's just, okay, we'll keep it at humans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good with that. Okay, great, thank you. I think, um, thank you all for your insights into making it something that we all share and have a role in creating. Uh, do you have a comment, Mr. Bruno? Yeah, I just wanted to comment a little bit uh, more on the uh, question of staffing. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, could we do that after we finish up this motion? Because sure. I do believe that there sure. is going to be. Okay. A, is that's that okay? If that's I can fine, maybe ha but I just have you reserve that. that. Perfect. We'll go ahead and have you speak to that in a moment. Okay, so I think we're pretty much there. I know um, we had some nuanced language. Um, so Cynthia made the motion with the recommendations that I think she provided to you in regards to some of the language changes. Um, I feel comfortable with those recommendations and uh, as the seconder. And then the sort of some of the nuanced language, did you feel that you were able to capture um, much of what was decided in, in Th those areas, or do you have questions? I believe so, but can I can I ask a couple questions? So, we are not including the environmental sustainability definition. We are or are not replacing the equity definition with the state definition. I'm unclear on that. So we are not replacing it, but we are um, adding it. The public health definition is no, that no. what you mean? I'm sorry. She's no equity. equity. I oh, believe oh, Councilmember Glover state. had brought that up as hit one of his first comments. Oh, I forgot. State. Uh huh. Um, I, I don't guess remember. Not. Do you want to go ahead and restate that? Yeah, it was just mainly had to do with the uh, differences between the definitions because uh, there is no definition of racial equity in the Santa Cruz health and all policies um, aspect, and so and. Uh, I, uh, that, with, that was a second question. My first question was on the on equity itself. I believe you made two comments. Correct, One was yeah. on the definition of equity as it relates to the state definition, and then my sec my one of my next questions was the is the do you are you all wanting the inclusion of racial equity definition as well? So Great. Two, two Thank you. Uh, the first you know, part to that is. Uh, just the differences talking about the acknowledgement that it's a, also an outcome and a means to an end and also structural and a systemic concept. Now elsewhere in the document it references structural and systemic stuff. So that's less of an importance. And it's, you know, I was just mainly curious about the difference if people are okay with the existing language and don't want to add the equity as both an outcome and a means to an end. I'm okay with that. It's not, you know, um, uh, a, a severe thing. I am more uh, adamant about the inclusion of a definition of racial equity so that it is included in there. And to speak to the vice mayor's comment, yes, you're absolutely correct. We want to provide equity across all realms of 
our community. However, there are groups that need to be specifically identified to make sure that they're taken into consideration in the implementation of the policy and held accountable through the decision-making process, which one of my primary areas of focus is making sure that there is racial equity on this body and in our policies, which, you know, there has been problematic aspects with, so. I, if I could just, and then I know the vice mayor has a quick question or comment. In regards to the health disparities definition um, that really specifies the difference of preference of disease, health outcomes, or access to care among different distinct segments of the population, including differences that occur by race or ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, education or income, immigration status, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Does that uh, uh, cover sort of what your intention is around um, looking at how we're factoring in health disparities um, for, very, for specific subpopulations in, in this work? So it, it's good to know that there's an acknowledgement of health disparities and acknowledging all those different subsections. I'm just looking at uh, the state task force model and their intentional inclusion of racial equity and in a tremendous amount of uh, references in 15 pages of document and are very lacking to almost none. And I think that it's important that we include a definition of racial equity in there so that it's present. And I think it should be something that we should be focusing on as a primary thing because we have a severe amount of racial disparity in Santa Cruz in general. So it's something that we should be looking at and making sure all of our policies are intentionally uh, acknowledging and taking into consideration when evaluating the health and health policies framework. Uh, Vice Mayor Chief. Oh, did you have So if today is the first hearing, then we would need to know what that um, definition is in order for this to continue to be the first hearing. Is that correct? It is. So do you the, have that available then? Yeah, the, the suggested language could be, and I'll, I'll go slowly because I know it's not on the screen or anything. Racial equity is achieved when race can no longer be used to predict life outcomes and outcomes for all groups are improved. So it gets back to what the vice mayor was referring to about wanting to see all uh, included, but it's important. And the emphasis around this comes from the history of the country and how it was founded in racism and how it still perpetuates racism through uh, either unconscious bias or through under the radar racist policies which disproportionately impact low income people and specifically people of color. So that, you, that would be the language. I'm, I'm fine with that. Do you wanna go I ahead? got a place to put it. Um, I am happy in my motion to include in the section on definitions, uh, then we have equity is the first one. Uh, I'm happy to add equity as both an outcome and a means to an end. That appears in many places. And then there's a little inset there. Equities are unfair, avoidable, and unjust differences that are created, et cetera, et cetera. I think you could just say, for example, and then put your sentence in right there. Race is... Would that work for you under just sort of the broader definition of equity? I mean, it, it's it's something. Uh, it's better than nothing, but I don't understand why we just couldn't add another line and just define racial equity so that it's clear and specific. To me, this is a general description, and it fits there well. Um, it's, it's true that health disparities further on down refers to disparity, disparities by race or, es, race or ethnicity, but there are many other aspects of equity aside from health. So I'd like to just leave that first section on equity um, general, but include the, the sentence you offered <coughs> as a second sentence there. It's a compromise, but at least we'll get racial equity in there as a defined aspect of the overall yes. equity thing. So yeah. sure, absolutely. So to be clear then, after uh, letter A, equity is inequities, and after that will be a statement that will essentially be the definition of racial equity that Council Member Glover just expressed. Is I that just correct? Say continue that, that one section that starts inequities, and then just on that as a second sentence, just say for example, et cetera. And then we'll just go into the definition of why of racial equity. Or, or might, might I make a suggestion that we just continue the <laughs> equity statement so that it is equity is a fair inclusion into a society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. Like for example, racial equity is achieved when race can no longer be used to predict life outcomes and outcomes for all groups are improved. Because then it's not connected to inequities. We want it to be connected to equity and it incorporates the term racial equity in a definition.
or it could just be a definition of standalone in either way. Vice Mayor Cummings? I was gonna make a recommendation actually that I think might be something that fits. Correct in that. Yeah, so <laughs> equity is just and fair inclusion into a society in which all, which people of all races, ethnicities, gender, sexual orientation, age, disability, functional impairment, geographic location, or the combination of any of these factors can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. So it's pretty much taking this, the last line under health disparities, and it's just putting it in after in which, in which people of all, and then including that. Why don't you just say, Definition for racial all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential regardless of, that's a little cleaner, regardless of race, blah, 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 blah. Does that work, do you accept that yeah. then? Okay, I'll accept that as well. So instead, so in, at the very beginning of equity, it would say into a society in, um, regardless of, and then it goes into that last sentence of race, ethnicity, gender, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And has the clerk gotten this? Because I don't have it all down. No, we're going to have to watch the video. Okay. Yeah, but okay. I'm not sure where it's going. So, okay. Yeah. I, I think I know too, but I just, I want to get it right. Okay. Yeah. So it takes that, and then I think we could still meet the interest around having racial um, equity included in that, if, 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 if Councilmember Glover is open to it, as sort of a, a second <laughs> subset to the equity definition. Yeah. Okay, uh, let me rewind for a second. So uh, that's a great suggestion. I'm a little confused as to why there's such a resistance to putting the term racial equity in the document, specifically racial equity. And I uh, also find it strange that we're moving away from the state acknowledged definition of racial equity and focusing on how we can mesh it into this so that it's less specific uh, uh, around the issue of race. Um, it's, it seems strange doing this battle with you up here also, Vice Mayor Cummings, since uh, I would hope that we would be able to emphasize the importance of racial equity as this is the first time there's been black people, black men on the city council. So, you know, I, I, I get it. I mean, we can move forward with whatever, because I, I, I don't need to approve it. You know, the seconder and the motion need to approve it, but I'm just saying there's an amazing amount of resistance to put the term racial equity into this document. I don't understand what the what well. The I, th I think I think we have we have it in there. I think if if we're open to having it in there as a subset of the equity definition, it's still in there. Ideally, it, you know, given it's not your preference, it's it's still listed as part of the definitions in a defined term. Is that, is the that word the race is included, but the definition of racial equity is not included. So, yeah. but that's okay. Whatever. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings. I'll just state that you know. One of the big things, and it's not a resistance to putting this in by any means, but I think what we want and what we're intending to do is not just limit our definitions around equity to okay. just race. I mean, we have to think about women, we have to think about people of different ages, sexual orientations, functional impairments, all the things that we've listed here, we want to make sure that we are including when we discuss, when we're discussing equity, because it's not just race. And I think that, you know, it would be, you know, it'd be a disinterest to, to not include all of these people um, and people of our entire community into a policy that we're trying to create. So there's no resistance to it. I'm just trying to find a way that we can make sure that we're including everyone in this policy. I agree. And I think we have found that way by changing that first sentence to include everybody and then also saying as an example and then using the language around racial um, equity as suggested by Councilmember Glover. So I do th I think it's, mm -hmm. I think we're there, mm -hmm. if, that, if that works, okay. Just a quick response yeah. to the Vice Mayor. Uh, so, I don't think that the incorporation of a specific definition of racial equity in any way distances or lessens the impact or the inclusion of other people in relevance to this document. I'm looking at the state version of the document and how they have intentionally, in their 15-page document, included the term racial equity 17 times. In a city that has a 1.8% approximate uh, African-American rate, an even lower Native American rate, uh, or an Indigenous American rate, 
the, the issues of the disparities that are faced by the Latinx and immigrant, immigrant communities, uh, all of those things that surround race, the, the very real prevalence of white supremacy here in Santa Cruz, the history of white supremacy and the policies that have uh, built this city, that is why it needs to be specifically included in my opinion and that's why it, there is resistance because it can't, it, it, ra racial equity in the definition cannot go in the document. It has to be sparsed in with some other definition so that it includes everyone in this broad umbrella but we need to get specific about certain things but that's okay, like I said, if that's the way the body decides to go, that's great, race is in there at least so that's good. Yep, I think we're there. If I might make one comment. Um, <coughs> And I know th this is a difficult topic that we're discussing here and I appreciate the discussion around it and uh, I'm by no means an expert in this, um, but to the point on using the distinction between race and ethnicity with the respect to Latinx folks, that is ethnicity and not race. So I just wanna be clear that if we are trying to uh, be inclusive of those folks in whether it's using the term race or not. I just want to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so I think for the most part, we may have captured all that we needed to capture that got a got us to a place to hopefully be able to move us forward. So I will briefly summarize what I feel like we are at, and then maybe we'll go ahead and take the vote if that's okay. So we do and did uh, make a motion by Councilmember Matthews to accept the report and recommendations. Um, we have made modifications, some language modifications to the um, ordinance for the first reading. Um, I know that some of those were captured or will need to be captured. My understanding was there was um, some language to, and I, I guess I, I, I won't get into the specifics, but to the second paragraph of the whereas, the fourth, um, as well as some of the definitions and um, a shift in the sustainability area to um, encompass Councilmember Meyer's input. And, um, and then in the implementation area to incorporate uh, Councilmember Matthews uh, suggested document that sort of generalizes that, um, knowing that that could be further defined by the policy or the, the implementation plan. Um, and then some minor modifications to the policy statement, um, but with the overall interest in having the 25,000 be the recommended amount, even though if it's even though it's not listed in the in the actual okay. policy for the mid-year budget. And I would have that be a fifth part of the motion. Okay. To recommend 25,000 for the 2021 20, budget consideration. Okay. Yeah. So that would be the fifth part of the motion. Okay. Does that adequately? Do you have any um, burning questions before we uh, move it? No, okay. I do not. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other input? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. I do know there was sort of that pending um, element around trying to um, uh, really uh, have a higher staff level dedicated to climate action. And um, I know uh, Mr. Bernal uh, wanted to speak to that and then I'll go ahead and hand it over to Vice Mayor Cummings. Yeah, in thinking about that a little further, what I would suggest is, I, I under, first of all, I understand the, the logic of having Tiffany uh, do some additional work on this given the tremendous you know great work that she's done and uh that might be very well very well be the best approach however in order to sort of keep a clear separation between the policy making role of the city council and the implementation role of the city staff what i would recommend is you just direct us to look at making sure that we provide appropriate staffing for this work and then we bring that back to you uh, so that was just my thought again in order to just kind of be consistent with uh, i think that would be the appropriate council action and direction at this point I just have a brief question about that though, because it doesn't seem consistent. We did have an item that came back with two potential positions that came forward with our input on, and that was in regards to the homeless coordinator position as well as the communications position. So I'm sorry, I don't know if I follow your logic on how we don't weigh in on specific individual positions. Well, I think, I think those were brought, you provided general direction about the need for, uh, well actually in that particular case, staff felt that there was a need for uh, particular staffing to address particular areas. We brought back to you uh, specific recommendations on the classification 
uh, the qualifications and the budget to do that. So I think it's a similar thing. Your interest as a city council is to ensure that there's enough and adequate staffing for this function. And what, we, what I would recommend is that you direct us to go back and look at how to do that and to bring that back to you, rather than specifically delineating right. how to do that, because that's more of an implementation role. Okay. That's just a suggestion. I think, I think the, the, the end result is, is, is the same. I think just to be consistent and, and clear. Okay. Um, so I'll just move, move that we direct the city manager's office to explore increasing staff to support health and all policy and um, including the, the increase of the climate and sustainability manager position to full time. And, um, and bring back report on or before the next of the midterm budget. All right, I'll go ahead and second that motion. Further discussion? Can, no, do you want to ask, do you have a question, Councilman Meyer? Well, I, I guess I just, so one of the things that I know that Tiffany works on is flood control, the flood, the flood maintenance, flood control, which is a really important thing environmentally that we have a, a really great person working on. So I'm, I'm just, I don't know enough about what Tiffany does. Um, I, I, I don't know if all of this gets rolled up under her position or not, but her head around um, planning for this flood stuff into the future is really important um, for, for our whole community because we are at real risk on that. So that's the only thing I'll just sort of throw out there as far as I know what her role is. Sure. I'm, uh, okay. And I would just, I'll just say that this is, you know, staff support and, you know, knowing how much work went into this from Tiffany and knowing that um, it's not a full-time position, that um, given that sometimes these tasks get, um, her role is, is utilized to address these tasks that are linked to sustainability within our community, I think that it would be good if we moved her up into full-time in case um, some of these duties get put onto her in the future or, or to whoever's in this role, I should say. So it's not linked to an individual person, it's linked more to the role under climate and sustainability. And, um, and this isn't to say that this work would fall on to the person who's in that role, but exploring the staffing support um, for the health and all policies. And in addition to that, um, the climate and sustainability manager coming up to full time, I think is where I'm trying to go with this motion currently, so. Matthews? I'm sorry, I'm just not totally comfortable with this. I think we're mixing adequate staffing for our climate action plan with the next step on the HIAP. And I think a very general statement asking city manager to come back with recommendations for appropriate staffing for both the HIAP program separately, our climate action program is the way to go. Yes, ma'am. That, that was the intention in the motion, because it was staffing to support health and all policies and um, the separately and separately the climate sustainability manager position at full time. Well, that's describing um, the climate action person full time at climate action and something else. I mean, I wonder if you could say and potentially general. and potentially seeing if it uh, to explore it. How about that? And leaving it open. <laughs> Or do you want to speak to this, Tiffany, since it is your position? Well, I mean, in the report, it does say that all of these things that are going to be carried out are going to be done by me. Right. So I just want to make that clear mm -hmm. um, that that is called for and that that's really why we asked for the support of a consultant. Mm -hmm. um, should there be much more beyond that, that would be, I mean, there's going to have to be choices about yeah. what yeah. is on the Climate Action Program work plan and what's not at some point. I mean, so just to be real. Do you want to just say, you know, as a possibility, and that kind of eliminates the directive to make it specific around full time. Right, I mean, I, I understand the, the suggestion. So I think that's clear. Again, I think if you just keep it generic, I think that's fine. Obviously, you look at I mean, me. and obviously we've had conversations yeah. about that. There's no, it's, it, there's some logic in exploring that. We recognize that, we know that, um, and, and, and we will definitely look at that. So. And just wanted to be clear about the direction that. Okay. Councilman Brown. Well, at the risk of carrying on into muddying the waters, I, I'm just wondering would it be possible to say um, 
um, explore staffing to support the health and all policies program, including but not limited to uh, movement of the climate action or climate and sustainability manager position to full time. So it's in there that that we that we are suggesting because I think that's actually a very good idea, and I'd like to make that clear that that is an avenue we want to be pursued. Does that work for you guys? That was the, yeah, and that was the intention of the motion, so. Okay, and I think it encompasses what you're expressing interest in wanting to do. That's fine. <laughs> okay, are we good? Yeah. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you. Why don't we take maybe just a short uh, five minute uh, transition break as we then move into the revenue subcommittee. Or potentially, I thought it was going to be the, the, the committee members, but I'm happy to provide an overview. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll start off and just introduce the item. So, the, as you all may recall, that um, the council established this ad hoc revenue subcommittee committee. We had a debate about committee versus subcommittee, and now I think it's it's uniform throughout committee. Um, to consider revenue enhancing options for the city for city council action and um, it was a, a broad uh, suggestion to look at various revenue measures and including the transient occupancy tax the hotel tax uh, we received um, some reports uh, presentations from uh, the action labs a uh, set of action labs that teams that were established by the city, and these were, I mean, this is an amazing thing that I, I learned a little bit more about that the city has done, bringing uh, staff from various departments together uh, on these teams, interdepartmental teams, to look at various revenue enhancement options. And they really did a lot of work and gave us a great basis on which to kind of determine how to proceed. So. Out the Action Lab topics uh, presented were transient occupancy tax, real estate transfer, um, and some of these were not for council action. So, and they're listed in kind of on on the agenda report. I won't go through them all, um, but you also have a grid that shows what those were. As a result of those presentations and our kind of. Uh, early discussions, we decided to pursue the transient occupancy tax potentially for the March ballot. And that led us to very quickly contract with uh, Gene Bregman and associates who have done polling for the city uh, for other revenue enhancement and other measures uh, over time. So um, we were able to make that happen pretty quickly. Um, the results were positive that we that there is broad support in the city among city voters for uh, increasing the TOT um, by two or three percent, with a caveat that um, the polling ref the results really reflected opinions without any uh, formal organized opposition campaign. Um, it was kind of just at the point in time. Uh, Question. So we also decided that it would be useful to uh, engage with the um, lodging industry, hotel lodging in visitor serving industries. And so we had some really uh, what I consider to be very productive and informative conversations about our intentions. And we got a lot of feedback, which helped us uh, kind of rethink the timeline. I think we fully intend that we want to go forward and uh, make a recommendation. Um, but we felt that it would best be um, recommended to be placed on the November 2020 ballot, and that will give us time to do some additional community engagement and bring a proposal that um, kind of reflects some, uh, some additional stakeholder and, and community involvement and feedback. And if my and if uh, Councilmember Matthews, my colleague on the sub on the committee, wants to add anything, um, well, I would say the conversations were um, constructive. They weren't hostile. Yeah. They were concerned. <laughs> um, the people that we met with wanted to know um, 
how is the city spending its money these days? And so we asked also, and the um, finance staff has started to prepare some um, revised, um, just basic um, city budget 101 type documents that we could share. Here's how we're spending our money. There was a question, should it be a dedicated um, measure with a two thirds so people would know where it was going or should it be a simple majority which would be a general fund, in which case we might adopt a resolution as we've done in the past. So these are questions that were as yet unanswered. And um, we just definitely thought that the opportunity to uh, do more education in both directions and, and actually build a case would be desirable and that trying to shoot for the March election uh, under the circumstances would um, would not be a smart move. <laughs> so we ask that we our our committee be continued to uh, on to continue this path. Thank you, Councilor Brown. Thank you. Thank you for adding those uh, elements. And I would just add that among the other revenue enhancement measures that we talked about, some of them will be coming to you in the interim um, related to the um, a public safety impact fee and child care developer impact fee. So those will move forward independently of um, the extended timeline for the TOT. And, and just on that, those will be structured as fees and not as a vote. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, council can approve those. Great. Directly. Well, I just want to thank you for your work on this. I know this is critical work and I appreciate your thought going into this and also um, awareness that it needs more time. So thank you. Thank you for the update and for the for the recommendation. Mr. Bernal. Uh, it, one of the things that uh, we had asked uh, our pollster was to be able to present uh, today and he wasn't able to do that. However, I do have uh, the, his PowerPoint uh, uh, slides and if you'd like, I'm, I'm happy to go over the, the poll results as, as well. Well, you know, in the interest of time, um, uh, I'll go ahead and see if my colleagues want to see that data or we can maybe see it offline and then go ahead and maybe have that. It's up to the, the council. The whole like. How do you all feel? We have quite a bit to get to still before we have our break. Um, do you want to, is it a brief just summary? How long would it take? Yeah. I, I'm just curious about, that was one of the questions. Uh, I can go through it pretty quickly, five or minutes. Or if people, I'll just suggest that if people have questions, questions, you could ask your questions. The, the graphs and the comments are pretty self-explanatory. And, and that's in our agenda packet. Yeah, there's a, he actually wrote up a report as well. So uh, that's in your agenda packet. And then oh, I'll pass out also yeah. the top line summary that you can look at uh, at your leisure. 13 point oh. something or other. Yeah. 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 And okay. They're I, really easy to read. And, and if I could, uh, you know, our intention is to, um, through in our community engagement, we may potentially um, include some of this presentation. So, you know, we could certainly make that information available to council members if you want to get the, the full presentation okay. at some point. That would be great. Maybe at a future time we could get that full presentation and maybe Gene could come if, if, if he's available so, and present that data, which is always helpful um, for clarification of I questions. Councilor Romay. So this uh, presentation would be available on today's agendas uh, as an attachment? Um, the specific yes. memorandum? That's, okay. That's in what's published. Okay, great. Yes. I have some slides, but I could, we can That's definitely okay. make uh, okay. include those in the agenda packet. There's no problem with that. <laughs> Essentially, the slides that are within his, uh, re within his report are in, in a PowerPoint uh, yeah, okay. format. Oh, okay, great. So we already have that information. I saw that. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings. I said one question, and that was whether um, the committee is going to continue to pursue the real estate transfer tax, or is this simply, um, is the emphasis and focus now going to be just on the transfer occupancy tax? Our intention was to pursue this one, I think pursuing two tax measures in one ballot is <laughs> probably getting a little ambitious. Thank you. <laughs> so, but I would just add that we, we did agree that um, we didn't want to sideline it entirely. So we do want to continue to have that conversation and um, kind of move forward with getting, gathering some additional information based upon what we got from the action lab. I just have a question um, for the committee. I also met with the with the the group of I don't know if it was the exact same group, but uh, a group of uh, the tourism and hoteliers. And I had a couple. I just had a question. I mean, it was very clear to me when I when I met with them. Um, they certainly wanted quantifiable quantifiable impacts, um, specifically around safety, security, and homelessness. Those were the three things that really surfaced in our discussion. Um, 
And so, and they also just mentioned the need, to, or, you know, just wanting to understand how they sort of, what the process looks like in terms of the engagement um, from here on out. So I don't know if the committee has had a chance to discuss that or with staff or not, but I'm just curious if you can comment on that. Um, I will just project a bit on the process that we used um, when we last did a TOT increase, and that was working initially with some leadership in the visitor industry, and then they're taking a lot of responsibility of setting up meetings and communicating with the smaller properties and um, where they might have more um, just credibility than us marching in. And um, it was um, a good communication back and forth, I will say. Um, we asked them, what are your primary concerns about Santa Cruz? <laughs> they say housing and homelessness, just like everybody else does. So uh, I think we're pretty aligned on the key issues. And um, it's just a matter of understanding the demands of the budget and how we are allocating our funds and so forth. Um, they were genuinely interested, wanted to know more. Yeah, and I think the, you know, specifically around safety and security, there was a yeah. lot of comments around that. So. It sounds like there would be, it's kind of envisioned that a similar, possibly a yeah. similar type of process would be, mm -hmm. would be initiated. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Council Rosario? Yeah, I would just add the um, Visit Santa Cruz director has specifically requested that. And so we're now just working on figuring out what that format would look like and looking to past uh, cases where this has happened. And um, so w we do intend to do that and also, um, continue to engage with uh, with that, the community about the kind of how, what we might do to direct funding related to either a resolution or um, a dedicated tax proposal measure. Sure. Great, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Unless there are no additional questions, we'll see if any members of the community want to address us on this item. This is item number 13 in our general business um, agenda. Please step forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Okay, Chair Philip, Santa Cruz. It's pretty easy to pass a tax that uh, where most people don't have to pay it. They, they don't seem to mind that. But uh, anyway, I strongly demand throwing out any idea of a massive increased real estate transfer tax in its entirety as your efforts to justify it, linking it to problems that would be payers of that don't really face is pure indiscriminate theft. First of all, the manner and actual questions posed by surveys greatly affect the answers. I imagine if you ask, does it make sense, others should have their already taxed wealth stolen by them by government to generally use as it pleases while hinting at intended uses but not actually committing to specific uses, none of which benefits those taxed in such a way, you'd get a different response. The loud answer would be no. Uh, we may have problems, but the tax base of Santa Cruz City is not intended or appropriate to use for social programs or are problems. Uh, this simple fact seems lost on the, on the council. Welfare is a responsibility of the Fed and state since it has the proper scope of progressive income taxes that tax profit, not just steal wealth from anyone who has any, which is less likely to damage the economic engine and would be a uh, gross injustice if, if it were uh, in place. Additionally, it is indifferent and arbitrary as to profit. You would tax someone who has a loss on the sale of their house, ridiculous. There are only 28 municipalities in California that have larger than the usual real estate documentary transfer tax, which is intended for the cost of processing deed transfer in perpetuity, uh, which have been a morally hijacked, uh, you know, this tax has been morally hijacked for hinted at purposes without actually committing to specific programs or achieving specific results without any accounting of cost benefit out of approximately 400 plus in the state, which have not adopted this absurdity. Uh, they are mostly uh, leftist strongholds who do not respect individual rights like those in Alameda County and elsewhere. Uh, I see absolutely no effort whatsoever in the committee to reduce costs and, and increase efficiency in the city. In the city I'm going to go ahead and uh, go ahead and interrupt. You know, unfortunately, we didn't have the time uh, set, but we did have your two minutes go. And you're okay. welcome, as always, to All submit right. your comments. Right. Sorry for that confusion. Please. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello, Elise Casby. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank you for considering the TOT tax um, and the real estate transfer tax. I just wanted to make a quick comment that 
I could not tell that this, this agenda item was going to include the TOT or, and so I think sometimes it might be helpful to have different phrasing of the agenda items or include a few more details so the uninformed public might have a better understanding of what's gonna be discussed. But I just wanted to just emphasize that um, I think at this time with the increase in Airbnb um, uh, situation where pe private property owners are able to increase their incomes using their properties with a Airbnb, uh, enhances and complicates our situation of being a tourist town. And I just also wanna add into the mix that with the just absolutely ballooning homeless population around the country where homeless people are moved on, um, that's one of the main things that's happening in cities around the country and in California in particular because of our warmer climate. I just wanna say a lot of people have come into the town who are actually transients who are homeless. Um, and in some ways I hate to say that because I think it, it can prejudice the issue in some ways. But what I'm trying to say is that I hope as the committee goes forward that you'll pay special attention to Airbnb and the impacts on neighborhoods, that you'll pay special attention to the ballooning homeless issue and how cities across the nation are Busing people home is one of the most consistent programs that are being offered, just moving people on out of their city. But this, there are impacts on our environment and on our communities, and I just really think that this is an opportunity to help change things for the better. Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Councilmember Myers. And nobody else. Well, um, I'm happy to make a motion and move us forward on our agenda, busy agenda today. Um, so I'll move to accept uh, the report regarding the recent work of the City Council Ad Hoc Revenue Committee and continue with the City Council Ad Hoc Revenue Committee and extend its time frame through June 30, 2020. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by Council Member Myers, seconded by Vice Mayor Cumming. Further comment, Council Member Crum? Uh, would you consider a friendly amendment that we add uh, another member to the, um, to the committee? I believe. I, I believe the committee's been working pretty efficiently, so I'd like to stick with the committee as structured. Okay. Thank you. Do, do, would I have to make a, a separate motion to that to, as an amendment to the main motion? I think what we could do is vote on that, and if you want to maybe make a separate motion, that would be. I have a question regarding that, Mayor. whether or not that's been discussed amongst the, I think that what would be good is if the members of the committee, you know, bring back if they would want an additional member to the committee to an additional member added to that committee. I think that that would be appropriate um, so that they can make the determination given that they've been doing all the work. Okay, would that be accepted as a potential uh, Councilmember Brown and then Council? I'll just say I we have not discussed it as a committee. As I've said before, I'm amenable to having a third person on this subcommittee or com committee, sorry, um, and, um, but I also, we haven't discussed it, and so I'm kind of agnostic, but I, I've said I would support it if that was the will of the council. Council Member Matthews and then Vice Mayor. You were appointed as two, we've served as two. Yeah. So um, as a potential uh, next step, and then maybe I'll have Vice Mayor Cummings, maybe it could be explored that if they want to bring back an, um, a recommendation to add a third member, they could do that. Is that, um, uh, does that need to be, I'm not sure that needs to be part of the motion. I think it, the intent is clear. Yeah, okay. okay. All right, great. So um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously and thank you for your committed work. <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and move on to item number 14 in our agenda. And that's our general plan and zoning ordinance reconciliation effort. And we have uh, Lee Butler here as well as Sarah. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I will stall for a minute while Sarah pulls up the report. Um, back in August of this year, the Council provided direction for us to um, cease the prior corridors uh, rezoning effort and to re-engage various community groups 
and um, we have embarked upon that effort, the initial stages of that. We also have um, started, we have submitted for a grant uh, associated with um, developing objective standards for our multifamily zoning districts. And Sarah now has the presentation ready and she can give you all the details surrounding our current status. And Lee has done a nice job summarizing. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I am gonna just go through what has gotten us to this point and then um, bring you up to speed on what we've accomplished in the last month since our um, prior update. So um, we are working under direction from August 27th to um, cease work on the prior um, effort to implement the general plan, colloquially known as the corridors plan. The new project will preserve and protect residential neighborhood areas and existing city businesses as the city's number one priority encourage appropriate new residential and mixed use developments, specifically including enhanced affordable housing opportunities at appropriate locations along the city's main transportation corridors. And um, among a couple of other things like reporting back every month, allow the city council to adopt zoning and general plan amendments no later than November of 2020. So um, there is this, exists this mismatch between the 2030 general plan and the zoning ordinance primarily focused around um, the areas that are available for um, high intensity mixed use development along some of our major transportation corridors. The general plan um, creates some new mixed use land use designations that were not previously part of the zoning code or the prior general plan. Um, and the land use pattern, um, which we are currently um, operating under as dictated by the general plan would focus a lot of the in anticipated growth over the next um, decade into areas that are um, already fully developed and served by transit along our major transportation corridors, which are as listed in the general plan, um, Water Street, Soquel Avenue, Ocean Street, and um, Mission Street. So again, here's our existing zoning map. You'll see the areas in pink are our um, commercial areas, and you'll see those focused along water, Soquel, Ocean, and Mission. Um, here is our general plan map. Again, the pink is focused along water, Soquel, um, Ocean, and Mission. And there are additionally these striped areas, which are here shown not in stripes. So here, stripes, here, solid colors. Um, and the areas that are shown in the lightest color yellow um, arguably could be implemented by the existing zoning. You can meet those FARs under our existing height limits and, and density standards. Um, so the areas uh, where we really are operating without um, sort of effective zoning that can fully implement the general plan are the areas here that are shown in brown and um, orange. So um, since the last time we were here, we have held a second focus group, um, which included um, a whole host of folks, including representatives of Safe Santa Cruz, which was the group that was mentioned by name in the um, direction that we received in August. So, um, oh, I'm missing a picture. Uh oh, <coughs> sorry. Um, last minute PowerPoint presentation. So, um, Representatives of other community groups also attended. You know, we had some two representatives that had been on the former corridor advisory committee. We had um, architect, uh, an affordable housing developer came, um, and just generally, we had a very productive conversation about um, what land use should look like in Santa Cruz over the next few years to decades. So one of the things that came up in this meeting that was, um, you know, that we have staff has heard before, but it was sort of interesting to hear sort of the, um, the deep history on this is about um, this issue about preserving and protecting existing neighborhoods. Um, some of the sentiment around that was really about feelings about disparate treatment between the east side and west side that is um, old and longstanding and probably not news to any of you, but um, the intensity with which those feelings were felt was sort of news to me. Um, just that those feelings are still very present and, and really quite intense between the east and west side neighborhoods. Um, regarding creating a variety, reg regarding, um, again, still on this topic of preserving and protecting existing neighborhoods and existing city businesses, um, participants talked about 
the desire to create a variety of types of housing. So um, rather than, there are some things in the city's codes and um, general plans right now that really encourage concentrating small units all together rather than allowing those small units to be like spread throughout other types of housing projects. Um, so that was sort of curiosity to a concern from various members of the group. Um, they also wanted to see policies that allow new development to integrate with the existing neighborhood rather than forcing it to sort of stand alone as its own like self-contained project that um, you know has its own new community rather than being part of the broader neighborhood and community. Um, there are also, we were thinking about um, city businesses and commercial redevelopment. And the, you know, we, the group did discuss, there, were, there are probably some locations along the corridors that are ripe for redevelopment and are just sort of waiting to be redeveloped um, where the existing land is underutilized currently. So there are some areas where um, you know, new development, different kinds of intensity, if appropriately, des appropriately designed and integrated with the neighborhood might be very well accepted by those neighbors. Um, but then there are always concerns as we bring in new development, um, and we discussed this in context of commercial spaces, but it applies to residential spaces as well, that you know, new construction um, rents kind of come up to market rate. And so any existing um, discount that might be enjoyed, excuse me, by a local business by virtue of being in an older building, um, that, that same benefit wouldn't be available to them in a new building. So um, on the topic of the def defining sort of appropriate mixed use development, um, this group really talked a lot about traffic. And um, so as new development comes in, how is the traffic managed so that we don't get cut through traffic in neighborhoods so that um, as, neighbor as neighbors are trying to exit their neighborhoods that they are experiencing an acceptable level of service at intersections. Um, and that they feel like they can still access the commercial areas that are adjacent to their neighborhoods in an effective and useful way for them. And then one, um, one participant brought up um, the, I guess the city of San Francisco recently had it on the ballot about choosing a, um, to focus on pedestrian infrastructure like on Market Street. I'm gonna get this wrong now, in public on television. Um, they, there was a, uh, they put an initiative on the ballot to really decide are we focusing on car infrastructure, or are we focusing on um, bike and pedestrian infrastructure? And I think it was specifically about Market Street. And the voters voted and said focus on pedestrian and bike infrastructure and focus less on cars. And they were kind of wondering, you know, maybe we need something that's that clear and distinct here for Santa Cruz to really say like this is the mandate, this is how we want to focus our um, you know, our, develop, our land use and transportation um, efforts. So regarding enhanced affordable housing opportunities, more so than the last group, this focus group was really interested in the number of units that are created that are deed restricted, income qualified, affordable housing um, dwelling units. There was less interest in sort of like, is there a definite, another, you know, expanded affordability level, which the first group was more um, interested in and, and brought up more for us. Um, but they, they did bring up the, an idea for a, you know, a local density bonus that, you know, again, this idea that you know, are, there are some areas along these corridors that are sort of ripe for redevelopment. And um, it sounded like, at least from that group that was there, that additional intensity could, might be appropriate and in fact might even be desirable if it gets us this hi a higher number of units included that are deed restricted, income qualified, affordable housing. So um, this second group also had the benefit of a meeting you know, after the governor had signed um, the Housing Crisis Act of 2019, SB 330, which um, as we have discussed here before is um, a state bill that really limits the um, standards and criteria that a local government can use to regulate development and to um, influence the intensity and density of use that's created on a property. So um, with this focus group, we were able to have a, a conversation that was informed knowing that that was in place. So um, the focus group was very interested in you know, creating objective design standards to get in place sort of as promptly as possible, um, which we, have, we are working on. Next slide. Um, and you know, I, I wanna be clear with 
your counsel with the public, and we were clear with the focus group, um, you know, proceeding down this path towards developing objective design standards for our zoning code does not preclude us at any point from taking a left turn and saying, you know, or splitting the path, really, honestly, it would be splitting the path because we're gonna continue on that route of creating objective design standards. But um, we always have this option of like splitting off on a path that says, you know, we also wanna um, take a look at these maps and look at where this intensity is, this development capacity, and think about how we might rearrange it throughout the city. This would involve a general plan amendment. Um, and that would be a significantly broader and deeper community outreach process um, it could, depending on how that happens, require a little to a lot of additional environmental review also um, in terms of you know, traffic studies and any other sort of um, sensitive areas that might be affected by relocating that intensity. And then by necessity, that would be a much longer process. So, um, and there would be a cost associated with that obviously as well. So uh, that's just, doing one project doesn't, preclude doing the other, um, and I wanna be really clear about that. We haven't said, no, we can't do that. We are saying we're gonna start by working towards this goal of having objective design standards in place as soon as we can. So, um, since the meeting, we have also okay. completed the SB2 grant submittal um, per your council's direction in October. Um, that project will um, be focused on creating objective design standards for multifamily housing projects. So that would include um, exclusively residential projects as well as mixed use um, multifamily residential projects. Um, and as we're envisioning it now, we would be sort of relying on the, exist the categories that are created in the existing general plan. Um, and then when it comes time to apply those zoning codes, um, again, that would be another opportunity to say like, you know, are we applying these in the right place? But do we wanna be like, you know, choosing different locations for them? So that was submitted at the end of October. Um, we've had staff level approval confirmed by the state. So now it's, you know, with financing and we got them our tax ID number and all that stuff. So um, we are working on the RFP to have that um, go out sort of ASAP so that we can start collecting um, all those good ideas that come with proposals when we, uh, you know, when we request them from clever consultants. So, um, with that, our recommendation at this point is that you accept your council accept the monthly report on the general plan and zoning ordinance reconciliation effort, and we are available for questions. Thank you for your presentation in the work and the update. Um, so does the council have questions, Councilor Brown? Uh, I actually don't have questions. I don't think I have questions at the moment, I, but I am prepared to make a motion when the time is appropriate and wonder if there, members of the public want to weigh in at all, if anyone's here. Any questions maybe, and then we'll go ahead and open it up to public. Yeah, um, well, I was just wondering, was there any general areas of agreement amongst the group of where development, was there consensus where development should take place? Like, for example, downtown or somewhere else in so the, I mean, the direction that we have from the 27th says to focus development along the corridors. So honestly, we didn't ask that question about where should it go. Um, there, there was some discussion, and, and I'm gonna draw from both focus groups at this point, there was some discussion about, um, you know, are there other areas of the city that are well served by transit that perhaps should be redesignated, that are currently designated single family? Um, are, there, are there ways in which these, the, the existing sort of corridors might be like, widened and we consider some land that's behind the parcels that front right onto the corridor. So there have been like ideas about other places where, you know, development capacity might be sort of reallocated for, versus those specific parcels. Um, I mean, all, I think all of those ideas though, um, they really need to be part of a big community process. You know, like we're, we've talked with people who were involved with the prior effort, which, is the direction we're working under. Um, and I think, you know, as we've seen that, that that prior effort missed a lot of folks, you know? I mean, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of constituencies that weren't specifically targeted and consulted. So um, also it's our first place to start. So I do hear, um, hear what you're saying. So yeah, I mean, I think downtown along the corridors, I think there's a general consensus that those places are gonna redevelop and it does make sense that an amount of development happens there. Um, and this question of are there other places where it also makes sense, I, I don't know that there was generally consensus. There were different ideas that were kind of tossed around, but um, 
we weren't trying to pin anybody down exactly, so we didn't get to exactly do Bay Street, do High Street, you know, move it to Seabright. We didn't get to that kind of level of detail. Or the, the West Side industrial lands. You know, that didn't come up in our meetings. Thanks. Thank you. Question, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, did you have a question? No, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, you did have a question. Okay, yeah. go ahead. I just, first off, I'm glad you all were able to get that um, SB2 grant proposal off because that's going to be good additional funding for that yeah. process. So thank you all for that and thank you for the presentation. Um, the one question I just had is um, around kind of what, are there any next steps currently to doing more community outreach? So, um, our next steps at this point are around um, getting a consultant on board to start with those. And one of the things that's gonna be, that, that we're, we're already putting in our RFP is that um, equity and community outreach is a goal of the process. So we're, we, I, I, it's really important to us that um, equity be a goal of the outcome as well as of the process itself, that we make sure that um, all these various constituencies are consulted you know, by name. So. That, so that's kind of where we are right now with, in terms of community outreach. So we as staff weren't planning to do any more community outreach until we have a consultant that's part of the project. Thank you. Councilmember Myers? Yeah, I had a, just a question about, um, sorry, I'm looking at the staff report right now. Is the, is the state providing, I mean, I can't imagine that we're not, we're not, we're not the only community that's sort of getting woken up by SB 330 um, in terms of sort of, I, I'm just curious, like I'm, I'm thinking of a jurisdiction that may be in the middle of their general plan process, for example. Um, is the state providing, I, you know, so this is a five, kind of a five year t her time period. Is the state providing any guidance um, such that, you know, this, this problem that you're describing right now with, you know, kind of running two parallel processes, possibly reopening or doing a general general plan amendment. I mean, all of those things can take many years, um, frankly, especially in our community because we're a very active community. So I'm just curious, uh, you know, if there's any guidelines or guidance coming out of the state on some of these possible co conflicts as communities are making their way through this. Seen anything? I haven't seen anything, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, coming out of the state. It's you know so new that um, I haven't seen guidelines coming out of the state yet. We are anticipating another round of grant funding next year that some communities will be applying to um, efforts such as this. Um, I will tell you that um, I am hoping to bring that to the council with a uh, recommendation for using that money. It's about $300,000 um, and um, spring or mid of next year is when it will become available. Um, and that would be going towards our next housing element. So we do have our next housing element cycle um, coming up in just the next few years, we'll be getting our arena allocation within the next year or so. And um, with that, we'll then need to embark on an update to our housing element. And so um, they have recognized that um, they need to fund some of these planning efforts, which is great. Um, with it being so new, we're not necessarily seeing specific guidelines, or at least I haven't seen specific guidelines yet at this point. But I do expect HCD will be coming out with, um, with some things in the near future. And of course, there will be case law that um, is undoubtedly going to come out of the um, recent bills that took effect early this year and the ones that are taking effect as of January 1. So I would just request... Um, Martine, and um, especially if we could make sure our state lobbyist is kind of tracking, if there's any any legislation that's spinning up, you know, due to the fact that jurisdictions are now starting to do this work. So whether that might be flexibility in your general, you know, just, you never know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, the, you know, there will be other jurisdictions that are coming up against community, um, worried communities about what their communities will look like in the, in the future. So if we could also just make sure that uh, our lobbyist is really on top of this to see if there's any bills that might spin up that sort of further refine or provide direction based on SB <coughs> 330. I think that would be great. Thank you. I like that suggestion. Okay, why don't we go ahead and see if there's any member of the community who wants to address us on this item. This is item number 14 in our agenda packet. Please come forward.
Uh, well, I actually think this is a really exciting moment in Santa Cruz because even though the, um, basically the, the voting down of the quarters plan was extremely difficult and hard on certain groups in the community, I think that it's, it's what it is actually is an opportunity as um, the staff person whose name, Sarah, um, uh, just said that um, it, it affords a lot of um, inclusion, I, I can't talk today, opportunities for inclusion of greater community input and discussion. So what I would like to add to the discussion is, First of all, um, since I went to the College of Environmental Design for three semesters in Boulder, uh, back in the dark ages uh, when I was young, um, a lot of the really interesting environmental uh, designs, sustainable designs and so forth, have really been repressed by what I'll just call general conservative trends in the community that have to do with uh, multinational corporate power. Um, and so forth. So to try to get to where I'm going with this, I would like to say that I firmly believe that huge sectors in our community can uh, find reconciliation and compromise in really creative design planning. And that there are community planners and designers around the country, and I'm gonna mention just one, his name is Mark Lakeman, and he was brought in here to uh, give a presentation at Loudon Nelson. And so he's just one, uh, who he, his family history is in urban planning and design. I really believe that a lot of the density that we want and need, as well as um, just, just greater sustainability and more inclusion can be achieved. Thank you very much. Great, we'll go ahead and then, um, seeing no other public comment, we turn back for council action, council member Brown. <laughs> yeah, so thank, I wanna thank staff again for <coughs> continuing to provide us with um, updates and information about how you're approaching the direction we gave you and um, just really appreciate that you um, went out and, and have done these focus groups and provided a really uh, detailed feedback about that those meetings, um, which are very helpful to me in hearing uh, what uh, people in the community have to say. I was particularly um, excited to see that one of the um, uh, one of the main foci of the um, the second focus group was really about um, thinking about ways to incentivize. Um, in return for increased density, affordable housing units, low-income housing, deed-restricted units, because that was kind of one of the primary goals that I had in originally bringing this to the council. Um, and so I think, um, and I just wanna make a couple of comments before, and I have a, a motion, I wanna accept the report you've given us and, and provide a little bit further direction to take a baby step towards getting some additional information. Um, I think, um, you know, I've been he we've been hearing a lot about the m motion that was made. It's been out, uh, it's been discussed in the uh, <coughs> media and the public. And you know, I want to remind us all that when the corridors plan was uh, discussed and approved, um, that was before the density bonus law was was adopted by the state of California. And the density mm -hmm. bonus law es essentially allows for as much density along the SoCal water high density mixed use corridors, the district, as the general plan as amended for the corridors would, would permit. So I, I feel like we're, you know, we're kind of talking about this idea that we're kind of killing the plan and no development is ever gonna be able to happen. And that it was, I, I don't believe that's the intention. I do recognize that the, um, that SB 330 requires that we, uh, the Housing Accountability Act for folks listening, uh, requires that we not reduce density without uh, transferring it to um, elsewhere in the city's general plan. Uh, so given that, and I, given I, my interpretation of the feedback, the agenda report suggests that uh, the focus group recognized that challenge in your discussion about SB 330, 
and seem to be supportive of the potential for reallocating densities um, in other locations, other configurations. Um, I think it would be helpful for us to get some additional information about that. And so I wanna make a motion that um, we accept the staff report um, and with much gratitude uh, <laughs> and put that in there um, and direct the planning department staff to analyze one and it's up here for folks who um, so we can be really clear about what we're talking about uh, one the number of units that would need to be transferred from the water soquel high density mixed use district to retain the current zoning ordinance densities um, if we just focus on those that area, I, I don't know, I mean, it would be interesting to, to find out what number, what that looks like. And two, um, to analyze properties where, or spaces where transfer densities might be appropriate in the downtown, properties on the far west side, in other areas of the city, or in alternative configurations. And so that's the motion. Second. I, Thank you, thank you. I did you want to say one more thing? Um, I, um, you know, I recognize that uh, when we discussed this previously, um, the, when staff brought this forward as a possible option for the council a, a route, route for us to take, that there was discussion about the kind of extensive process and the you know time, can, time and resource uh, resources that would be necessary to achieve this. So I. Um, I, I wanted to include at the end of this, though, so as part of the motion, if the second or uh, would accept that, to return to the council with a status report in January 2020 about how this might be, um, how you might pursue this information gathering and community engagement process, whatever you think might be necessary to move in that direction. Um, so. That would be um, helpful, I think, for us once we see what the um, what the numbers look like and what the density that would need to be transferred. Um, while I will just remind us, potentially achieving the same goals in as as were adopted in the corridors planning process um, for the the corridors, the Water Soquel mixed use district. So. That's motion. my, I'll, I'll leave it there, I think. Okay. Accepted. Okay, so I just have, a, I have a, a, a question for clarification from the staff. Is that essentially uh, the path to the reconciliation and sort of reopening of the general plan, essentially? Is this, is this, because what the information if eventually would lead to would be potentially the path that you described. Does that feel accurate? Or, and, or well, is that maybe the intent? I, I, so, so the information, I mean, so we can bring back information and that can lead wherever your council chooses. Right. Um, <clears throat> if, if you want to move forward with actually then redistributing that development capacity to other places in the city, we are going to advocate really strongly that, that the choice about where those locations are not be made in City Hall, that it be made out in the community. Um, and we would really want to engage in a pretty hefty community process around you know, we have X amount of development cap capacity, which is approximately X number of, Y number of units, um, and where does it belong? I mean, that's, that's a major general plan update, which is a useful process to do, right? We update our general plan on a regular basis because it's a useful document to have and to make sure that we all sort of feel comfortable in the values that underpin it. Um, you know, relocating that density to, or that development capacity, I should say, to places that are not along the corridors, um, would require changes to the general plan that go beyond simply the maps. I mean, that gets into the policies and the values and the vision, right? So that there are a range of ways that that could go. And so I think developing that information and sort of talking about, you know, what if we accept that like the, the medium density mixed use designation can, can be fully implemented by our CC zone district. And that essentially will, we accept that there's not a, in terms of capacity, there's no mismatch there. There's a tiny little bit of a mismatch in terms of the uses that are allowed, but that's sort of secondary. Um, so, so if we accept that we're just really talking about these areas on the map that are dark brown or orange, you know, in the general plan map, um, if we're looking at places to reallocate that density, that's that hew closely to the areas where they already are. So maybe it's like taking the corridors and going back a little bit. Maybe it's, you know, elsewhere along <laughs> some of these existing corridors extending further north or south than our 
um, our environmental review would be less intense, you know, because it would largely have already been sort of considered. Um, but then if we're talking about, you know, redistributing it to really other parts of the city, then we're gonna get into that environmental review as well. So again, I mean, I think we can definitely, we can return with this information. Information can allow you to make whatever choice you wanna make then at that point, being informed with different level of certainty about what we're discussing. Okay, thank you. Long answer to your <laughs> short question. Other comments or questions? Councilman Matthew? These are for clarifications. Um, on this motion, if the, <clears throat> reallocation would result, uh, would would still sustain the same number of units now allowed through the density bonus, what's the need for transferring the numbers? Do you understand where I'm going with that question? Underlying zoning with density bonuses sure. now apparently equals what was anticipated through the corridor plan rezoning. So aren't they the same? So I think I mean, the, the distinction, yes, yeah. that's yeah. that's the distinction. Yeah. So if, in order to utilize the density bonus, a uh, project developer would need to provide deeper levels of affordability or a, um, a higher number of affordable units. And so that in exchange for that, they would have um, you know up to a 35% density bonus. Of course, um, as of, um, January 1st, 100% affordable projects could get a substantial, no no density limit with additional heights and uh, three three additional stories beyond what's allowed and 33 feet. Um, and no density if they're within a half mile of a major transit stop. So that aside, just a standard um, residential development or mixed use development project would have to provide the deeper levels of affordability in order to get that same level of density. But my point being the massing could be more or less comparable. The massing could the be difference comparable. Is the affordability. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I have a couple other questions too. Um, that was just an information thing. Um, uh, as I look at the motion, it does not affect uh, <laughs> potential projects along ocean or mission. Do I understand that correctly? Yes. Okay. Um, I will point out that downtown is already significantly rezoned to accommodate a lot more density, which we all know, um, but it's not obvious to the public just looking at downtown as it is, but um, there are quite a few projects in the works now. So I think I think it's not, it would not be a matter of transferring from the east side to downtown because downtown already has been designated for hundreds and hundreds of units. Is that a correct statement? So downtown has been designated and um, the, height limits that we have downtown are essentially the the height that developers would currently go to. So um, right now the building code, building code allows for wood frame construction of uh, five stories over two levels of concrete podium. Um, and there are some loft areas in what could be a six story but aren't technically considered a six story. But it, it caps out at 85 feet. Um, under wood frame construction. Developers aren't gonna go to uh, 90 feet or 100 feet or even 110 feet um, and um, use steel construction at this point in time. However, coming down the pipeline, there are um, uh, engineered lumber um, standards or uh, uh, treated lumber standards that are already being utilized in um, Vancouver, British Columbia, for example, that we expect to get folded into the building code. And so there may be some um, slight increment of additional development capacity that in the coming years becomes feasible in our downtown based on those new um, uh, building code standards that allow for wood frame construction at higher, uh, at higher heights. But for now. But for now. <laughs> and, and that's my, my third point is that infill occurs over a, a pretty long time frame. So it's not like everything's gonna be different in two years. Right, and if, if I may, it, you know, there is also the potential for um, like the south of Laurel area. You know, when, when we're talking about the downtown, yeah. I think we traditionally think about the downtown plan area and there certainly are additional options if we're looking to the north or the south of yeah. the downtown. Councilmember Brown, then Councilmember Myers. So uh, just a couple of comments, and I think uh, that other areas of the city kind of 
I included that in there to cover this, that there may be places that are not, if, if we use the traditional definitions of downtown, um, may be left out. So that's why that was included. In terms of the density bonus, though, I want to clarify something because um, the, my understanding is, and let me know if I'm off base here, but my understanding is that if we rezone uh, to the 55 units per acre that's included in the, um, the corridors plan, in the general plan for the corridors, from 40 units per acre, that then a density bonus would mean 75, 75-ish um, units per acre potentially in those spaces. And if we don't do the rezoning, the 35% density bonus on top of the 40 units per acre would, lead, would be 54, so one unit less per acre. So that, so I, I'm talking about a close to doubling the density on the corridors if we, if we proceed as according to the general plan and, and then have to comply with state law. That's what, that's what I think would be possible here. And that's why, that's the difference, I guess, in I'm trying to respond to your question, Council Member Matthews. So I'm gonna try to respond and try to not get too complex because the new state laws um, are very complex. And so AB 3194, which took effect as of January 1st of this year, actually mandates that cities allow what is allowed by the general plan, even if it's inconsistent with the zoning. <clears throat> and so I, I would agree with most of what you said, and I have to caveat it a little bit because um, Right now, a developer could come in and build to the general plan density, and it, we would be obligated to accommodate that. Um, so um, that's the that's the only sort of caveat. If if we, when you're saying rezone, we would also have to concurrently drop the general plan designation down and then reallocate however many units um, are the delta between the current GP and the future GP under SB 330, we would reallocate those to other locations concurrently in order to stay in conformance with the state law. Does that help clarify things? So, so I, think, I, I think if I could just summarize what Lee said, he's saying that um, the general plan governs and that's in place today. A, a, a developer could come in today and build to that density. They could apply for a density bonus on top of that density yes, that is in that. today's general plan. So there is nothing, um, you, know, you know, we're not protected from that by not having zoning in place that conforms with the general plan. So just so that's, um, that's clear. Any other questions before I open it up to public comment? I think I'll, oh, we I think I'll skip the public comment. Excuse yeah. me, sorry. Did you have any other? No, I, I'd like to hear from the public. No, we did the public comment. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> forgive me. We already did that. Any other clarifying questions? I have one clarifying. In terms of the timeline, does um, um, gathering the data by January feel easy, you know, possible or in terms of your other work load or? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the we can come to the second meeting in January. I think that's. To, in terms of just having the information available to have a discussion, we will. There will be no public outreach, um, you could get and that then in. we could have a whole big list of places of alternatives. But I, again, I'm I as staff, I'm going to be really cautious about predetermining anything. You know, I mean, really, that's a community conversation that would need to be had. Okay, great, uh, Councilmember Myers. Yeah. Um, I just want to state that I, I understand the intent of the motion um, and the and the additions. Um, these are questions that we do need to to ask. Um, I just feel like we've got it just by putting one and two down. I think we've gotten out ahead of our community already, and so I'm I'm not going to support this motion. Not because I don't think these are important things to look at, but I think that. Um, especially with number two, I, I just, I think we need to do more outreach. I mean, um, I understand the neighborhood's concerns over on the east side, and um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if similar <laughs> concerns pop up anywhere else that we put this density. So um, I think our community really needs to understand what the state is, is asking of communities now, and um, 
I'm not sure that doing this work is going to solve anything that's different than what the, the issues with the corridor plan, except that it's gonna feel like, okay, you know, there was an advocate for this part of town and now we've put it over to this side of town. So um, I just think this is premature. I, I would like to just um, figure out a way to, to be more inclusive um, and communicative about all the questions that we're asking um, I think they're all valid questions, but I, I'm not gonna be able to support these changes to the motion today. Any other comments from council members? Any other questions? I have one. Councilmember one, Brown. One quick comment, because I, I actually really, uh, you know, I'm absolutely, sh I share those concerns, um, <coughs> council member Myers, and I, I get it that um, we're gonna need to do a lot of community outreach. I think part of this response is not simply being an advocate for the east side, but really advocating for a community engagement process that had it happened previously, we might not be here where we're at today. So I agree with you that that needs to happen. Um, and when it comes to the question of moving density around, um, you know, I think that we also need to look at where the density currently is, right? I mean, there, it, we're talking about some areas of town have much lower per acre zoning um, and per acre density in, in the general plan than this area. So um, so I think that needs to be, you know, thought about and discussed as well. Any other council comments? Councilman uh, Matthews? Uh, yes, uh, it gets back to how deep into a general plan revision are we going here? That's yet to be seen. I think <clears throat> one, um, understanding what um, the delta is under number one here. Um, and then two, um, hearing from the community. I think uh, Sarah expressed one of the things that we heard just in our first two outreach meetings, which was maybe we go lower on the corridors themselves, but then have a wider transition area down to the neighborhoods. Something like that may not require a substantial amount of policy revisions in the general plan, um, although it would require changes to the map. It also would limit the amount of CEQA review that's needed. We would still need to look carefully at that, but it would have a, a smaller differentiation than would be the case if we were reallocating that density to elsewhere throughout the city. Did you have Just a follow up on, that's interesting, but that's not what's in this motion here. Alternative configuration. The, okay, at the end of the motion. Alternative configurations means properties who are transferred densities, other areas, or alternative configurations along the existing corridor. I put so I that to the maker of the motion. I think this, I, if I may interrupt here, I think that there are a lot of ways that we can read the wording of this motion and we can bring you back with a lot of options that we have heard thus far from the community. And um, I will just be upfront, when we bring that back, we're gonna say, this has not gone through a community process. This is just a palette of ideas that have been generated thus far by the people with whom we have already spoken. So, um, you know, all of that would come with the caveat of, you know, we haven't reached out to renters or students or um, the employees who don't live in town. So, you know, all of that stuff I would wanna, you know, we would wanna include if we got into a deep um, amendment of our general plan, I think that's appropriate and the responsibility of our community to be involved at that level of, uh, of depth. So um, I am okay with bringing back this information and leaving it to your council to decide then again about how deep do we wanna go Right. This is, this is always the privilege of your position is to decide how deep do we want to go with this, how long do we want to spend on it, how much money is it going to cost, and what are our other, um, you know, competing priorities. So, I'll, if I could just ask the maker of the motion if you would include in that because it doesn't look like that's the intent now would be to say in alternate configurations along the existing corridor, because you talked about people seem pretty willing to think well maybe it's lower but deeper. That's different. From the very limited well, <laughs> group that's, that's of folks what, that we have that's talked what's with, been driving this so yeah. far. Right. Sure. I mean, or, or, but also alternative configurations where we have uh, good transit. You know, we Bay Street has really good transit mm -hmm. service, and it, a lot of Bay Street is zoned for single-family mm -hmm. uses. You know, I mean that, and I, uh, you know, that would require a lot of consultation with the communities, right? That's. 
Um, that's not an insignificant change to make to the current plan. And, and so. just if I could, and then I'll shut up. <laughs> um, just a, for example, along Bay Street, they're all little single family parcels, mm -hmm. whereas the, some of the others' corridors have larger opportunity sites existing that make more sense. That is, yes. I mean, and that, that's what generated the current plan, yes. I'm wondering if, it, did you have a question? I'll, I'll take my comment. I wonder if, because um, I, I hear the concerns and I uh, share some of the concerns that were raised by Councilmember Myers, if the maker of the motion would split the, the two uh, areas. I'm, I'm interested in the data, but I do fear we would go way beyond where we want to be without going through that vetting of what are the opportunity costs, how are we engaging the community within the second area. So if that would be, um, uh, accepted, I'll go ahead and ask that we split the motion. It's fine with me. I, just in response, the, you know, number two is really about bringing us a status report on, you know, not predetermining, but how that process would go, where are some of the possible places where we might start to engage in that outreach. So, but it's fine with me to split it. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that that is my intention. Okay, so we'll go ahead and split it. So um, for the first bullet, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And for the second bullet, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. No. And so that passes with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Crone, and Glover voting in support, Matthews, Myers, and myself voting against. And all those in favor of the timeline, is that what you mean? When you say bullet, do you mean? One, two, two, one, two, one, two, and, two. And the second, the second one, one. <laughs> the one, one that should be a two. Okay, <laughs> and I, are, unless there's any uh, area around challenges with the um, with the timeline, we'll go ahead and have consensus on that. Okay, okay, great. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, moving right along to get to our uh, all of our items on our afternoon session, we have item number 15 on our council meeting as, uh, agenda. And I don't know if our city clerk needs to finish up what we were just voting on before you introduce the item, okay? And this is the resolution to certify the county clerk's um, recall petition results and the placement of that on our ballot. Do we have Mr. Condotti speaking to this or do we have? We can. Okay, yeah. thank you. It's, unless you want to, but I did send you guys an email today to hopefully answer any questions, but this is basically just a ministerial act the, the petitions are already going on the ballot. This is just determining which ballot they go on. Um, this is to consolidate with the March 3rd election. If you guys do not adopt this today, the county clerk can just put it on the ballot. Um, any other election besides March 3rd will be deemed a special election, which will cost the city more money than if we had it on the March 3rd. Yeah. Any questions? Any questions? Council. Council Mercone. Were you able to do a calculation of how much just having this particular initiative on is will cost the city? I don't think there's any way to break it down. It's two to four dollars a voter, um, and we already have two ballot measures on it. So just you know, the more items we put on, the higher <coughs> it gets. But I don't think they can break it down. My understanding from um, the county elections official is that the the cost of consolidating with the city election is uh, determined on a per registered voter basis. Um, but having uh, more than one measure on the ballot doesn't increase the cost. Uh, uh, I don't, I, I think it does. But I, I just, uh, that's my understanding is it gets closer to $4, oh, the I more see. items, because you have more ballot materials to mail out, you gotcha. have more, you know. But, but, it, but it's within the range of two to $4. Promoter. Okay. Councilmember Glover. Thanks. And just to, just to clarify what we mentioned before, if we don't <clears throat> certify this or vote to put it on the ballot, then it would get deferred to the county, and either way, it'll be associated with the March third ballot, or that'll push it to a special election. Well, th they would probably put it on the March third ballot because they want to have one election as opposed to two back to back. Right. Thank you. Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, questions for the city attorney. I was just wondering for the public's interest, um, if you might be able to just explain a little bit, you know, how this process works in terms of us, ex you know, voting on this today. Um, there's people who are going to be running for different seats and people are going to be voting either in favor of the recall. And I think there might be some confusion in the community as to how this process works. And so I was just wondering if you could uh, just briefly go over that. 
Sure thing. So first of all, um, as, as the city clerk mentioned, this is a ministerial action. By law, the measure is required to go to the voters if it uh, obtains sufficient signatures in the petition gathering to qualify for the ballot. So that's, that's part one. Um, part two is that for a recall election, it's really a two-step process. First is a question and the, and the ballot uh, language that's uh, contained in the resolution um, bears this out. Uh, there's the first question is whether or not the council member should be recalled. Uh, and then if that uh, question is answered in the affirmative by a majority of the voters, um, then the second question is there are a list of candidates um, between now and December 9th, I believe, 19th, um, uh, members of the public who are registered to vote will have the opportunity to um, submit a ballot or s submit their names for consideration on the on the ballot. Um, and so then the second question would be um, the, of those who submitted, which um, candidate for the replacement receives the largest number of votes, the highest vote getter would, would serve out the duration of the term of the council member who uh, is recalled. And there are two separate questions and uh, members of the uh, candidates can file for either office, but not both. So the same person can put their name in for both seats. And did you have anything to add? Okay. Any other questions? Mr. Governor? I just want to make sure. Uh, did I, I just want to make sure I didn't mishear you. Did you say you favor the recall? No, I said that I asked the question of could the city attorney explain this process? Okay, for how, the, I, I for the how does how does this work <laughs> for the general public? Yeah, it knocked me sideways. I was like, what? No, that's okay. Thank you. If there aren't any additional questions, we'll go ahead and hear from the public. Is there any member of the public that wants to address the council on this item? This is item number fifteen on our agenda. Please come forward. You'll have up to two minutes. Council members, I think it's important that everybody understand how this came about. Uh, the Rose Report was in, employed to investigate uh, 11 or so allegations of misconduct on the part of two council members, and only two of them were sustained. And that sustention pivoted around one council member's personal experience, that would be council member Myers. And from that, um, we've had two groups in town who have gone out collecting signatures with varying levels of uh, mendacity, don't get to use that word often, um, lies and damn lies were used to coerce people into signing the petitions. Um, the signatures were submitted and I'm sure that the signatures were verified but we have a complaint that's been filed with the Secretary of State regarding unfair campaigning practices on the part of the signature gatherers. And we are following up with further evidence that some of the signature gatherers were underage. And if this proves to be true, there will be a whole bunch of uh, signatures that should be thrown out. And so I would say that um, the citizens of this community need to be very careful in how they evaluate how this came to be because it's bogus. Oh, um, my name is Ralph Tunstall. Um, I'm, as a um, street musician and performer, <laughs> person that has advocated for people like myself to be able to do what we do is Ben Drew. He's made meetings with us. And with the situations being as volatile as they've been of being downtown, rules changing one day, not knowing what's going on, the only person that I've had that I feel has been an advocate for me and people like me has been Drew. I mean, like we were having a meeting and someone came up and asked specific questions about that and not only was he ready with answers that weren't like rehearsed but it was a personal thing that we got to experience that this is someone we know advocates for 
street performers, people that, I mean, I got PT at <clears throat> A little PTSD last winter sleeping on the streets down here, uh, but I'm one of those people who uh, I've been blessed and I've gone through the system. I've stayed at Coral Street. Um, I've went to an SLE. I've been through this the whole system, but it's not as easy as people think it is. So you know, a lot of things that he has advocated for for us, our future. So I just wanted to say in his behalf that yeah, I think that this is completely. A waste of time and money. Thanks. Um, this is disappointing. Um, I voted for Drew Glover and Justin Cummings in 2018. They represent me. I'm a progressive, I'm queer, and um, I live in Santa Cruz, and most importantly, I'm poor. Um, my first job was as a janitor, and I've never gotten paid more than $16 an hour, and that was for a very short amount of time. I own one pair of shoes, they're on my feet. Um, the attempted removal of Drew Glover is a coup. Um, they want to remove me and people like me. They want to steal our voices from us. They don't consider us civil enough, dignified enough, or important enough to listen to. We chose Drew for the precise reason you were trying to remove him. He calls out negligence, elitism, and moral, moral failings. He does not let them sit and fester. He hosts weekly meetings in which the community can come together and discuss pressing issues and ask difficult questions. He moves to extend our time to speak while some would like to shorten it. I'll read you a quote. Um, if not for my gender, if I were a man, they would not question my integrity. Um, there would not be this question of my um, character. Um, that's a quote from the mayor, and I would like to respectfully disagree. You are elected uh, officials, and no one is above scrutiny when they are an elected official, regardless of gender, race, sexual orientation, anything. None of you are above it. None of you are above questioning. The decisions you make are life and death. You should be encouraging people to question you. Asking difficult questions is the first step to understanding, and people who demand that they never be questioned are people who fear being understood for who they truly are. Hi, Elise Casby. Um, my basic uh, proposition today is that the community and all of us elected, well, I'm not elected, but you are, all of us uh, activists and elected officials and as many people as possible scrutinize the legal and illegal aspects that have already happened in this recall. I think that this is an important case in the United States. And the reason is, is that the groups that are waging this recall are absolutely real estate, developer, multinational corporate speculatory real estate interests, and it is about big money. And it's also about small private residential owners, property owners, and I'm sorry, who are aligned with very greedy and hostile elements that are taking apart our city. And so this is about big corporate money. It's about corporate personhood, and it is about absolutely illegal activity every step of the way through. Let me just iterate some. The recall itself, it is absolutely being misused. Is a recall a democratic platform? Yes, it is. But the basis of the recall needs to be substantiated. Every important allegation in the Rose Report went unsubstantiated. The censoring did not happen because it was inappropriate and unfair. It was also hostile. The use of the Commission on the Prevention of Violence Against Women was egregious and hostile. The slander and the defamation of character that is happening here needs to be backed up with legal action. We need to look at the constitutional elements of this and if we have to set a precedent in this city to call out this egregious, horrible, and especially deceptive, where no malfeasance on the part of Glover or Drone has been substantiated, absolutely needs to happen. Hi, um, I'm Robert Endicott Keller, and um, last year this time I was homeless and I was battling with addiction. I was on my way to jail. 
and um, I've been poor my whole life. Um, today, my life is amazing, and it's because of the investment, I would say, that Drew Glover has put into my life, uh, personally and into the, the, the causes that actually can um, help me pull out of, out of, out of being that way. Um, the time he spends, he was coming into jail and talking to us in jail. Um, the time he listens to us, I think it's important that, that if you are, if you are, if you're poor, and you suffer with, uh, you struggle with recidivism, and you have addiction problems, and you are home, uh, uh, experiencing homelessness, um, Drew Glover is your man. And I think it's messed up that you guys are trying to take our voice. He's our voice. He speaks for us. Um, there's a group of us out here that are like struggling. We're doing our part, but we, like, we, we need you guys to accept us. And um, Drew listens to us. He invests his time, his personal time. Uh, he, he listens, I mean, that's all I got right now, but thank you. I just wanna say I feel really sad about this. Um, I have nothing but the deepest respect for both Council Member Glover and Council Member Crone. I see how deeply they both care about issues that concern the community. And I've just heard a few people from the community speak specifically about that, and I've experienced that myself. Uh, I don't live in Santa Cruz, but I call this my community, and I, I feel their integrity um, so I feel sad that this is happening and I feel especially distressed that, and, and sympathetic with what it must feel like to have to vote for this today or, or be, have to even have the, I don't know if they will vote on it or rescind their votes or whatever, but that there's that need to even do that. Um, so I guess if there were, I always look for some positive in anything and I think if the only two things I could think of is it's shown the division in our community and how that we don't listen to each other and how there's, you know, it's brought lots of things forward, this recall. Um, and the other thing that is positive, I think it's brought a lot of us together in a much deeper way in the fighting the recall, seeing, uh, learning more about each other, really um, <coughs> coming together in ways that I've, I have never experienced before. The groups that I'm part of are, are extremely beautiful. Um, people share deeply from their heart, and I see that we're all gonna go out and support you in uh, defeating this vote. So my heart goes out to both of you, my support. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, I'm Nate Alex Dutt. Kennedy at gmail.com 346-9888. What I've got to say is Drew has got to be one of the coolest guys I've ever met in my whole life. He's uh, very relaxed, very honest. I, is that what this recall really is all about? That we've got an honest politician that doesn't bow down to corruption? That's what it feels like. And Chris, you're a pretty, pretty darn cool guy too. So, uh, Anyway, I, I just, I hope when this gets to the ballot that people, that, that it will lose by a long shot. Just one, one of the guys I ran across that was getting signatures to re, for this recall, straight up admitted to me that the only reason he was doing it is because they were paying so much money for every single signature. I don't know what that exact figure is, but I know it's up there. I, it, I think it was like 10 or even more. Um, and yes, a lot of these guys collecting these signatures only because it paid so much. Let's see, uh, Chris, Drew, Sandy, Justin, you guys are all really good friends of mine. And uh, let's see, with the last 30 seconds I got here, I'll say, can you come to me and so we can meet up again that number for anybody listening, 831-346-9888. And I'll give the last 20 seconds to the next guy. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Rick Longinati, 
Um, I'm remembering last January when the council, uh, in the face of a lot of public opposition to passing a just cause eviction ordinance, that you all decided that you would want to investigate a stakeholder committee, a task force to study protections for renters. And the Center for Consensus and Collaboration was engaged. And Dave Sepos from that group came back to you in June and said, um, you know, there were some obstacles to moving forward with a kind of uh, stakeholder process. And one of the obstacles was the conflict on the council and the other was the recall. And he said, I feel sorry for this city because uh, you're about to go on a war footing for the next two years. He talked about um, a cycle of, of conciliation and a cycle of retaliation. And uh, we're still in this cycle of retaliation. Um, I think our planet's still in the cycle of retaliation. Uh, but there are seeds of conciliation everywhere, everywhere in all our hearts, because that's what we really want. Um, I think what we need to do is trust that there are processes to unite us, even around the thorniest issues such as tenant protections and homelessness issues. Um, uh, if we trust that, then we won't resort to the recall. I think the, the recall results from a, a lack of trust that we can really solve problems. So just take people out of office and that'll solve it. But uh, you know, I know we know that that doesn't really work. So uh, as, as you are leaders, all leaders of this community, um, can you please set an example to get us on the road to the cycle of conciliation? Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael Campbell. I'm recently a resident of Santa Cruz. I've come from Virginia Beach. I'm from the East Coast. Love it there, but not a place for me to live. I've been all across the country. I've never found love like I found here in Santa Cruz. I have not gotten and I have not been able to get help. This man right here walks up to me and talks to me. We sit down and we have coffee at Santa Cruz Roasting Company. And we sit down and we talk about how people here in the community, homeless people, can actually help. We talked about a um, homeless to house type project where you could do multi-skilled people that can, like say someone's a carpenter, someone's a framer, someone's a plumber. You could get all them to work together and get the community together with it, and you can all build a lot cheaper, more efficiently, less homeless, more jobs. It's, it helps with keeping people that are addicted clean. Because if you give someone something to do, they're not going to want to relapse. They're going to want to step forward and get help. And with S Drew Glover, he's trying to help. I do appreciate everything that you do, bro. I appreciate the everything that all of you do. And thank you very much. Y'all have a great day. God bless. Are there any other members of the community who want to address us on this topic? Okay, you'll be our last. Hi, my name is James Whitman. I've been a resident in this county since 1993, resident of the Santa Cruz area about the last six years. Been coming to the city council meetings maybe the last three and a half months. I have more familiarity with the Santa Cruz County court system than I ever wanted to. Um, been a builder for about 30 years. I guess my hands have personally been on between five and seven billion dollars worth of projects. I usually come in and fix stuff at the end. So I guess I'm somewhat of a real estate developer. Um, something that I see with Drew and Chris is they actually come in at some point during these meetings and make things happen and bring money into the city. So I'm just really frustrated that this is happening because I would really rather focus my attention in other areas. Thank you.
Good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Um, this is a very sad day for the city. Uh, the, I realize that you know the state law allows for recalls, but this recall started out with a bunch of lies and half truths on the recall petition itself. And then the people circulating the petition want to out of their way to make things up to smear these two uh, council members' uh, reputations in order to get the, the signatures. They were out there lying to the public on a, on a daily basis. And it's regrettable that the rest of the council didn't stand up and say, wait a minute, we gotta, we gotta do this in a fair and equitable way. We can't have people out there smearing uh, people's reputations, making things up, telling half truths. That isn't that isn't <laughs> democracy. That's a form of fascism when you go to those extents to try to get rid of somebody because you don't like their politics. It's not about that these guys did anything wrong. It's that just their politics. That's why they have this recall. It's the developers and real estate agents and uh, greedy people basically that are behind this whole recall effort and are trying to remove these guys from office because they don't like their politics. And that's no way to run a recall. If they, they wanna re do a recall and do everything above board and do it honestly, that's the way to do it, but they didn't do it that way. They lied, they cheated, and they smeared these two guys' reputations. Um, so we'll go ahead and return it back to council action. Um, I know uh, Bonnie Bush, our city clerk, um, describe this, this is this is primarily ministerial. This is something that we um, just sort of recognize was verified by our county clerk. And this is our, our process essentially to do, um, to follow sort of the, this, this sort of guidelines around that. It's not a position one way or another. Actually. Any questions, Council Member Glover? Oh, it's less of a question, more of a comment. So it's okay. a good time for that. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, thank you to everyone that came out to share your perspectives. That's really heartwarming actually. Uh, teared up there for a minute, <laughs> um, just about the words that you're using and the impact that I'm able to have on your existence uh, from up here on the dais. So thank you for coming to share that perspective with me um, and with the community. There was another perspective that was shared with me uh, in the community correspondence surrounding this item. It was one of two uh, items that came in, which I found particularly intriguing. And the statement reads as follows, quote, recalls have become a national strategy to undo democratic elections. Since the local recall petitions received adequate votes, an election must be called. If not by the council, then by the county clerk. But none of the claims in the recall petition rise to a high enough level to strike out a fair election. I would like Santa Cruz to be principled and not support undermining fair elections. I support the council, uh, or I suggest that the council defer to the clerk who is then bound to call an election and vote down item 15. That's according to elections code 11241. <clears throat> and for people that aren't familiar with it, it reads as follows. If the governing body fails to issue the order within 14 days of the signature validation, the county elections official within five days shall set the date for holding the election. If the recall is to be voted on by voters in more than one county, the election official in the county with the largest numbers of registered voters and so on, since that doesn't apply to us. Uh, I'd also like to point out that one of the people that has come up to speak twice to us today, uh, that has a self-proclaimed member of the recall campaign, who's made it very clear here in past, um, past meetings, has uh, recited severely problematic premeditated statements of right-wing, anti-diversity, anti-sustainability, anti-public program rhetoric. And I don't know about the rest of you up here on the dais, but that is not the values of Santa Cruz that I know and love. I think Santa Cruz should be a place that values and emphasizes diversity, sustainability, and equity. And we have the ability to do that with this council right now and send a message to not validate the campaign that has been wrought with lies, defamation, intentional misinformation, and other attempts to 
cause disarray essentially in our community. Uh, I believe, and I hope uh, my colleagues agree with this, that we should defer the decision to the clerk and vote no on the item or to table it. And so I call on one of my colleagues not being targeted by the recall to make that motion. So now would be the time for a motion and um, I can't make a motion. So I will open it up for a motion on this item. I have a comment. Um, so I'm really sad and dismayed to be here uh, deliberating or to the extent we have that option on this issue. Um, and I also understand that this is a ministerial action. I understand, um, Council Member Glover, what you, the point you have raised is a possibility. However, I just feel like at this point we um, do um, have a responsibility to uh, put this on the ballot. Um, and I can tell you now that, um, and I'm not, in no way does this mean that I am validating um, what's happening here. And this will be the first, last, and only I vote that I'll be casting in this matter. Um, but I'm not going to make the motion. <laughs> Yeah, just to clarify, um, I do. It, it's going to go on the ballot no matter what. So whether or not we make the motion and pass it tonight, or whether we don't make the motion and pass it tonight, then either way, it's going to go on the ballot. So it's not our responsibility to validate a process that has been based in fallacies, misinformation, and lies. And I think that if we vote in support of it, even if you don't agree with it, to still vote in support of it validates that campaign especially from us up here on the body, because I will say it is a dangerous precedent uh, where a small minority of citizens can start a citizen petition gathering process based on lies in the first place, throw massive amounts of money behind it, cover it with lies, hire people to, I was reported that people reported to me that they paid up to $16 a signature for them to come and do stuff, and then now we're here. So I, 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 I can make the motion, but I would encourage one of my colleagues that's not targeted to do it. If I yeah, could please. say that um, the law says the governing body shall um, make that call, and if you fail to do so, then the county clerk will do it. So the law does put that on you, but if you fail to do it, the county clerk will do it. Thank you for, for clarifying. Let me say that <clears throat> I hear a lot of the community concern around this. Um, you know, this has been a really difficult year for everyone, and um, and I respect everybody who I share this dais with. Um, you know, this whole process has been further creating divisions in our community, um, and I personally. Um, you know, it's it's been difficult being in, being up here and, and trying to work with folks as this has been going on. Um, I think that fundamentally what's underlying this is that, you know, if there are issues with this process, then we as a community and we as a society need to deal with the process under which this took place. So finance reform, um, how we can determine whether or not what people are saying on the streets are honest or not. But we currently, the county clerk, given the, the process that we currently have, has validated the signatures. And um, as a member of this body and under the laws and the oaths that we've sworn, I'll move this item um, so that we put this on the ballot. And I just hope that during this recall process or the, the election process that um, the members of our community um, really understand what they're voting for and that they, um, and that we'll, we'll figure out what's gonna happen in March, so, or we'll see what happens after March. So I'm gonna move the staff recommendation. Um, I appreciate how difficult this was for you. And I think we all um, uh, understand the difficulty. And so in that spirit, I'll second the motion. So we have a motion by Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by Councilmember Matthews. Um, any further discussion? Councilmember Glover? 
Yeah, that's uh, incredibly, as you can imagine, that's disappointing to uh, have someone that I ran with in 2018 to do that. Uh, also, it's strange that no one looked over to the city attorney. City attorney, let me ask you a question really quick. Uh, what happens if we don't do it today? What legal ramifications are there against us? County elections official will place it on the ballot. Right, but what negative legal ramifications will this body endure or uh, will come, come, come about? I really don't think it's an issue of legal ramifications. Right, and uh, so I'm just a little confused with the rationale about it being the law when it is written in the elections code that the body can not do it, and in that case it gets transferred to the city, the county clerk. So the rationale behind the motion falls flat when you look at the logic with regards to legalities and our responsibility as a committee. So just with that, do what you're gonna do, but uh, I strongly disagree. Just to clarify, the law states that the, the uh, governing body shall place it, order it placed on the, on the ballot, and I and I think the fact that there's a backup plan um, included in the statutory scheme reflects the difficulty of questions, just like uh, the one that the council's grappling with right now. Okay. Unless there's any further comment, we'll go ahead and maybe call call the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, so that passes with Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself, and uh, Myers voting in support, Brown, Crone, and Glover voting against. Okay, we'll take maybe a two minute transition as we move to item number 16 in our um, agenda. Did you need All right, we'll go ahead and reconvene at this point. Thank you. Okay, so we still have a number of items to get to before we have our afternoon break. Oh, and yeah, no. so next on our agenda is item number 16. So if I can get your attention, we're gonna go ahead and start our meeting up again. Thank you very much. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and have it. All right, if you, We'll go ahead and ask that I get your attention. We're gonna go ahead and start our meeting up again. We have uh, a couple more items to get to sure. this afternoon. Um, and uh, we have another evening item later, so we need to reconvene and uh, get going. So we are on item number 16 in our agenda packet. And um, let's see, that's the ordinance for the small cells wireless uh, facilities. And it looks like we have our presenter here, Joshua, welcome. Hello, yes, I'm Joshua Spengrud, Senior Civil Engineer of Public Works. So um, I have a presentation here, just a few slides. And this is really the same presentation you guys have seen. It's kind of how we've gotten to this point. Mike went through this last time. So the new FCC ruling, we went through this, the, what, what they adopted, uh, both the shot clock and how that, that applies. And then uh, the aesthetic requirements. Uh, in, unless somebody wants me to go through those again, I think you guys have seen those numbers of times. So after we came here uh, in June, uh, we were asked to make some modifications and we convened a subcommittee with two council members uh, and staff. And the, um, the direction of the changes that were asked for really were with regards to uh, accommodating ADA uh, requirements and uh, public notification requirements. So to that end, what has changed in the uh, ordinance itself is the rewriting of the purpose and, and intent, the preamble section, to include um, uh, more reference to uh, what the, why the city is compelled to go ahead and, and uh, make these changes or to the ordinance and what our limitations are and that we are actually trying to look out for the best interests of the city. Um, and then the purpose and intent section, again, a little bit later on, is uh, just, to, again, to seek reasonable accommodation under the ADA. The 
permit guidelines were changed. Uh, the public notification was changed. Uh, so the permit applicant has to now notify 300, or I'm sorry, it went from 300 feet from the proposed installation to 1,000 feet from the proposed installation. It modifies the timelines for providing public notification of permit applications. Um, there's a number, I mean, uh, they have to notify the public within, you know, two days instead of five days or, you know, there's, there's a number of things like that. I would direct you to the permit guide, guidelines themselves. And then instructions to property owners to provide notice to uh, employees or people who happen to be in the property that aren't owners so that everybody within that geographical area gets the notice. Then it clarifies the time window within which uh, uh, comments can be submitted to, to the department and uh, requires city staff to post a summary of the permit application on uh, the city's website. Now, we are going to be putting together a specific page on Public Works web website specifically for this, and it's, it's gonna have basic information, uh, location, um, applicants, things like that, but and if, if the public wants more information, they can come into our department and look at the application itself if they really want to. And then um, lastly, the fee schedule, uh, the appeal fee was uh, waived for, for these uh, appeals to this, for this ordinance. And uh, really that's, that's about it. And then Mike had some pictures of what we don't want and what we would prefer. All right, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to, happy to answer them. All right, thank you. Any questions from the council at this time? I think Councilmember Brown and then yeah. Councilmember. Well, oh, you go ahead. Okay, Councilmember oh. Matthews and then Councilmember Brown. I'm now looking for it, but um, I did see in uh, one of your explanations that uh, the um, here it is under permit guidelines in the staff report. Um, at the end of that paragraph, the notice by the applicant is now also to include a reference that a reasonable accommodation request under the ADA or other applicable law may be directed to the city. But then I think it, you say somewhere else that that creates the expectation that the city will be responsible for that accommodation. Well, um, the expectation, not the actual legal responsibility. So did, if you could comment to that. I, I, can, I can certainly comment. I mean, as far as the Public Works Department is concerned, we're going to review all the applications with an eye towards ADA accommodation as we always have, which is in terms of clearances on sidewalks, cross slopes, et cetera. If, um, if somebody wants to appeal on other, on other, for other issues, other reasons, they can appeal to, I believe the Planning Department has a uh, ADA coordinator now with the city. So depending on how reasonable the request is, I mean, I'm, I'm not comfortable saying whether it's a lost cause or not, you know, but uh, it's certainly a, a way for uh, residents to make their voice heard. Is that, I hope that answers your... Yes and no, but um, if someone uh, describes a perceived um, uh, ADA impact, um, for which there's no commonly agreed upon remedy, does it, does it fall to the city to respond to that? I'm gonna to have to defer to the city attorneys for this. Okay, because it says the uh, a reasonable accommodation may be directed to the city. I, I it's, just it sounds like your question. question may be directed to the issue of um, should someone request an accommodation due to perceived health effects of um, radiation emitted from the from the cell facility? Stephanie Hall has done a lot of work on that for thank you. I just um, clarify that. For, for the city and for other cities, and I'll ask her to address that concern. Hey, good afternoon. Um, so, as I've discussed, there are not any guidelines for EMF radiation or EMS electromagnetic sensitivity. But from what I understand, if there are no guidelines, the city and the uh, person requesting the reasonable accommodation would come to a compromise as to what would be a reasonable accommodation. And 
I'm not sure what that would look like since we can't regulate based on RF emissions, but at least the um, individual will be able to go through the city's normal grievance process, speak with the ADA coordinator and see if there's some kind of compromise that the city could make. Good question, Mark. I believe so. Other questions from council? Councilmember Brown? Yeah, um, so the, um, the original motion that we made included some language about um, kind of acknowledging our inability to uh, protect the health and safety of uh, the public. And so I'm just, and I didn't see it here. I did see that some of the changes around um, the, um, sorry, I'm just trying to find it here in the, um, that some changes that were, were uh, suggested are in here, but that one wasn't, so I guess I'm just wondering. If well, um, I think what might lead, well, go ahead. Well, so what might, what might lead to con confusion is, I believe that was handled in the uh, purpose intent, the preamble to the purpose and intent section, which was not highlighted as a change in the latest drafts that you guys have. Okay, so can you, uh, because I don't, it's in the, yes, I am, and I'm looking at the ordinance 15 point, 38.010. Um. Council Member Brown, if I can chime in. I, I believe that we added in, in the kind of the center of that paragraph in purpose and intent, we wrote the city is prevented from taking into consideration all citizens' <coughs> concerns with respect to the health effects of this technology. Yes. I think that was the language we added in to address that concern. Yeah, so uh, I guess the, re thank you for that. I see that is here, um, but we had initially talked about an acknowledgement, an actual acknowledgement in the preamble that we therefore cannot protect public health and safety. It's, you know, I mean, it's a little bit semantic, but it is to, to, to not just to acknowledge that is the case. Was there a reason that that particular language wasn't in here? Do you mean the language that was uh, proposed by a member of the public or? I see. Um, I can give you the exact I, I language. I addressed that, I believe, in the email that Tony, uh, yes. Mr. Condotti sent out. Ah, um, and was that today? Uh, let's see, that was on Monday. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, it's no problem. I don't see it. So here. I recommended keeping the preambles proposed since this was the version that the subcommittee had drafted and approved. Exactly. Okay. And I felt that the, or our office felt that the final proposal in the last sentence was unnecessarily painted the city in a negative light and did not reflect the city's efforts necessarily. I think that the city will be doing to the best of its ability, trying to protect the health and welfare of its citizens. Thank you, I appreciate that, and I'm looking back, I just don't see, I don't know why I don't have it in my inbox, that that memo, but thank you for clarifying. Just, other, just for the record, I, I was under the impression that this preamble language was reviewed <laughs> and accepted by the subcommittee, but should the council wish to add further um, purpose language, then that would be up to the discretion of the council. Mr. Myers? Yeah, I, I just would, I recall, I think in our last meeting, we I thought we had signed off on the preamble language. Yeah, yeah. I think okay. we did. So. Okay. And I would just maybe make one other clarif clarifying um, comment. Um, specifically, just regarding the conversation around ADA um, accommodation, I think we met at least two times, maybe three times, and had conversation around, around this, and, um, you know, my my thought on this is that um, you know it's unfortunate the federal government. I think this might be our new world. The federal government is basically taking away our right to really review this these the placement of these facilities, and ob obviously, um, the un it's been un you know it, the the uh, the unknowns may be broader than we think. Um, we're not sure, but. Um, I think where I came down on as a subcommittee member is really that um, we unfortunately are under uh, the thumb of the federal government until we can get um, some case law set that frees up local jurisdictions from, from these decisions and being able to reclaim some of our land use. 
Uh, this will be, I, th I feel like we have developed an ordinance um, and guidelines that actually other communities can use. Uh, I am worried that with the ADA uh, language that's in, in, the, uh, in the ordinance right now, uh, I think it's in the ordinance, I'm losing track of all my paperwork here. Uh, I, I am worried about some exposure for the city to um, potentially uh, some legal action from the, from the uh, from the industry. Uh, so I just want to sort of make a note of that. But I do think we've tried to put, put together a very strong set of ordinance, ordinances, guidelines, uh, and uh, I think it's something we can, should be uh, looking to approve tonight. Did you want to speak to the, any kind of potential liability around it? Or that was my kind of question. <laughs> There's always some measure of uncertainty with regard to this. I think, I think the committee worked hard to strike a balance between the, the uh, legitimate concerns of uh, interested members of the community and making sure that, that we um, also don't open the city up to unnecessary litigation. I, I think we, uh, where we are is, is a good spot to be in, okay. but we won't know for certain until and unless we are challenged. Um, and so it's not totally beyond the realm of possibility that we'll be back in front of you with the further proposed amendments. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Well, why don't we go ahead and open it up to public comment at this time. I had a request from Satya to have a group presentation on behalf of her group, which is EMF Aware, and I'll go ahead and acknowledge that request. So you'll have up to four minutes, and then we'll open it up to the rest of the public. Oh, wow. I have to say thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate that everyone, uh, that all my requests were considered and implemented. Um, I would say with just the exception of one of them, which I'm, I'm willing to concede. The, the statement about um, the city cannot guarantee protecting the health, safety, and welfare of the community. I think one thing that wasn't mentioned was the F. If you look on the paper, I'm sending around uh, an addition in the preamble of uh, in the intent and purposes of um, Section F, which is something that was incorporated in the Encinitas Ordinance and fully vetted by their attorneys. So then I, um, Attorney Choi just showed me that, that that's included in there. So I, I didn't have a copy of that, but she just showed it to me. So it's, um, that's included. I'm gonna go ahead and pause you, Satya. I'm gonna go ahead and ask our clerk to please set the time. So we'll have up to four minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, all right, thank right. you. So um, I just wanna make sure that you know about that because that's quite important and that satisfies me. I think it's actually a stronger statement than the statement about cannot guarantee, you know, on and on. So um, one thing, I'm also very happy to hear that we have um, an ADA coordinator now in the planning department. I wasn't aware of that. So, because uh, that was um, something I had noticed that there wasn't anybody up until now. So really happy about that. Um, one, one thing I might want to suggest is that the, the possibility of having more than five days for someone to come forward with a ADA uh, request for ADA accommodation. Um, and by the way, I just wanna say about ADA accommodation, ADA is not about health, it's about a sensitivity to EMF, wireless radiation, uh, or electromagnetic fields, say, which could come from many things, not just cell towers. So if a person is sensitive, say, I mean, they use the, the Fay case, uh, G versus the Fay school. They, uh, it was found that the, um, the telecommunications, uh, the, um, telecommuni uh, the ADA is not preempted by the Telecom Telecommunications Act which is very important to know. So for example, like if I was, this is a bad example, but they used it in the case, if I was allergic to peanuts, I wouldn't have to be forced to eat peanuts just because nobody else had that sensitivity. So um, it's the same thing. And I think it's just easy to think of it about health, but it's really about uh, functional impairment, which I heard talked about in the health and all policies. So I appreciate that while you know, we're being told by the FCC we can't consider health. We aren't, it's not really that. It's more equanimity. It's more about um, inclusion. 
for all of us. So, so that's to my question about five more, is it possible to have more than five days, like maybe a week, say, even would be good, anything, a bit better, 10 days maybe. Um, another question I have is about, okay, as I looked through the ordinance, I hadn't seen this the first time around, under the section of applicability, there are four types of facilities that are not included in this chapter. Number three, and I don't understand what these are, so I just want a clarification. Antennas and wireless communication facilities, it's under 1538030. Um, antennas and wireless communication facilities identified by the FCC or the CPUC as exempt from local regulations, so I don't know what those are. And then number four is small cell wireless facilities that are suspended, whether embedded or attached, on communication cables or lines that are strung between existing utility <laughs> poles in compliance with applicable safety codes. So I, I've never heard of anything like that. And it's kind of troubling just to know it exists, but I don't know why it's not regulated. Is it regulated somewhere else? Or what's, um, can somebody, clarify that for me. Um, so I guess there's really not too much else to say except really thank you. I, I feel so honored to have worked with all of you and we are really, um, many cities are looking to us to see what we've done and they are so grateful to all of you. So you're not helping just us in this community, you're helping all of California, and I would go as far to say all of the United States. Um, n not all councils listen like you do, so thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, not much to say on the subject. Well, one of the benefits of um, James Whitman, of doing what I do, is I work alone a lot. Stopped watching TV about 20 years ago. Don't really listen to regular radio stations. Don't listen to Nazi public radio very much. Used to listen to uh, KPFA, but stopped about six years ago because being informed didn't make me happy. So I listen to documentaries and stuff. Jeez, it must be an addiction. Six to 10 hours a day. And I do a lot of writing. There's only about seven people blocked from my Facebook. I don't have the viewpoint of George Carlin. I haven't given up on humanity. I've had a lot of interesting things happen in my life. I don't know what I can actually give you, but with all the briefness, I've already decided that the best thing I can do is to, re is to write a document and submit it to law enforcement and uh, emergency responders and schools and youth because they're the most effective on the bell curve. Now, there's a lot of information about the existing technology and the stuff that they're calling 5G, for more than 76 years, many militaries have been silently winning wars with this technology. You go right outside, and there's a street light, and that's military technology. So what do I know? I don't know much, but I got in trouble about two years ago, and I had a bunch of lawyers call me, and I stopped at about nine. One group, more than 150 lawyers, some of them had 40 years of experience. I listened to their stuff, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I got a question for you. Um, how many lawyers have you disbarred? This is family court. None. So I don't really, I have some stuff that I need to finish to submit to law enforcement and stuff. But if you, anybody wants to read how to disbar a family lawyer, I'm going to give it to them. Thank you. Speaker. And this is on item number 16, the small cell wireless facility. Hi, I'm Nathan Kennedy, and what I got to say about 5G, it is way too fast. What I'm talking about is from a computer security aspect, somebody could get into your computer over 5G, download your entire hard drive in a matter of minutes. Do we really need that kind of speed? 4G is already too fast. It's so fast that I try to get a bunch of downloads going, and it is hard to keep it saturated. So what I think we need to do, uh, as far as the uh, internet industry goes, forget about 5G, instead make it so that you can have home internet. 
DSL, cable, you can get uh, 5G-like speeds from that if we really need to have it that fast. But when it's wireless, when, it, when I'm picking up my cell phone, I'm talking on my cell phone, I don't need that kind of internet speed. In fact, at 4G, 4G is already screaming fast, so fast that it is difficult to use it to its full potential. Um, and also, 5G is way too deadly. In fact, in one case, there was a cell tower that was set up, turned on, and within moments of it being turned on, an entire flock of birds fell dead to the ground. We can't have that. It sounds too much like something out of Skynet in the Terminator movies. You know, that it's getting so fast that we're trying to get the into all the computers with 5G to hook up to each other and become one gigantic brain that wants to destroy the world or something nutty like that. Uh, so, no 5G in Santa Cruz, at least. We gotta ban it. it. It is ridiculous. From everything from computer security aspects to health aspects, it is too fast and too, far too deadly. Thank you. Hi, Rick Longinati. Um, I wanna thank the council and, and the staff for I think uh, the work that you've done in, in really pushing the limits of, of what is possible locally in order to resist uh, you know, a, a mandate that we have a little, very little control over. And uh, the only thing that I would suggest is that um, you let the public know what you know, which is that we have very little power to uh, regulate this technology on the basis of human health. So I, you know, I would suggest that you ask the city manager to release a press release to, to let people know that um, you know, you've done the best you can within the very narrow boundaries that you have. I, I would suggest even taking um, Mr. Condotti's comments from a recent meeting in which he put in no uncertain terms the lack of democracy that local uh, jurisdictions have to regulate this technology. Thank you. Good afternoon, Darius Mosin. Um, <clears throat> I'd be very cautious about local non-scientific entities like the city council trading in to an area that has very sophisticated technology with lots of variables. And frankly, there is no diagnosis for EMF sensitivity. There is no um, uh, <clears throat> reasonable medical organization or doctor that can actually issue a diagnosis or any kind of, certainly no prescription for it. I've tried. I actually went to my Kaiser doctor and said, gee, um, what if I'm, you know, I'm, I might be EMF sensitive. And she said, basically it's a psychosomatic <coughs> issue. Um, but that aside, my real concern that I'm seeing in this is the ADA language. What this means is, someone with, who can get a reasonable accommodation, much as uh, you can get a reasonable accommodation for an emotional support animal, and essentially go in to Starbucks and say, I want all the Wi-Fi turned off while I'm here. Somebody at an apartment building could ask me as a landlord, oh, can you ask everybody to shut their Wi-Fi off? And don't use cell phones. And I would actually have to comply. And to get a reasonable accommodation, you have to have some kind of prescription or a letter from a physician. Well, there's a huge market for fake service animal um, uh, documents on the internet. I had, I, tenants give me these all the time. They have $60 to $200, they get a, all the various documents and so forth, signed by a supposedly certified physician or you know um, therapist. And they could be used legally against, uh, organ, a part, you know, landlords, retail, that if they don't shut their Wi-Fi off. Thank you. <clears throat> and you'll be our last speaker. Good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, yeah, it's kind of crazy that uh, the Republicans in Congress and in the Senate always run on states' rights, and then they do stuff like, oh, well, States, can't, states and cities and counties can't have any control over the, the uh, 
self towers that uh, and then they put language in the law that says that health effects cannot be used as a reason to uh, not locate a cell tower in a certain area. I mean, it's just absurd. I mean, how can that be standing up for states' rights when you take away the rights of the states and the <coughs> rights of the local communities to do these things? Um, the problem I see with this technology is when I was a kid, my parents set us down, me and my brothers, in front of the TV. And that was our babysitter, basically. Now you see kids out there in public under one years old with a cell phone in front of them watching whatever it is their parents put on there for them to watch. And we're, you know, creating a generation or two of idiots that they're just attached to this phone. I mean, I see it all the time, people walking down the street, not paying attention to anything except their phone. They cross the crosswalks, they don't even look to see if there's a car coming or a bicycle coming. They're looking at their phones. Is it really necessary that we make it so that people can play World of Warcraft on their phone? Is that why they're putting out 5G? I think so. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead and return back to the council. Councilmember Myers, and then Councilmember Brown, then Councilmember Matthews. Um, I just want to thank the city staff, um, the uh, city attorney's office um, <coughs> specifically. Um, they really did a, t a lot of work on this, and I do think it's um, something that other cities will look to, to uh, for guidance. So thank you for all your work, all your research. And I want to thank Councilmember Brown. Um, we had a really productive subcommittee, I felt, and um, we, I think, got a product that we all feel pretty good about. So I'd like to go ahead and make a motion um, to introduce for publication an ordinance adding Chapter 15.38 to the Santa Cruz Municipal Code for small cell wireless communication facilities in the public right of way to adopt the attached resolution approving amended uh, small cell wireless facilities permit guidelines and adopt the resolution adopting a fee schedule uh, regarding the cost of an appeal under chapter 15.38. And I just wanna make sure that I'm referring to the right resolution because I know we were handed, I think, we were an updated uh, version. Yes, we distributed an updated version of both resolutions, uh, which is, um, which is the version that we would recommend the council consider adopting. So I'll just say adopt the uh, resolution provided on November 26th. Second. Okay, seconded by Councilmember Brown. Thank, Thank you for your work on this. Okay, do you wanna go ahead and make a just few a comments and then we'll have Councilmember Brown really just quickly. Sure. Yeah, I, I really wanna um, echo Councilmember Meyer's comments about uh, my appreciation for all of the work that you all put in to this uh, in the city attorney's office, Barbara and Stephanie. I know it was, um, uh, it took a lot of time and, um, you know, and Tony, also <coughs> Joshua, everybody who's been involved in, in trying to get us here today, um, the issues and questions surrounding this, uh, this issue are so incredibly complex and the realm of possibility for responding to it in a way that really, uh, tries to protect the public, public health and the public interest, um, is incredibly constrained and so uh, you did an amazing job of trying to work within those constraints and with um, you know direction from a council that was was really interested in this so um, I appreciate that and and thank you councilmember Myers for serving with me and I look forward to um, seeing this roll out Councilmember Matthews vice mayor coming this is truly a technicality I'm looking at the um, Permit guidelines, the, the one we got, and it's on page three. It's the instructions. It says, um, as part of the, and it's, I have the blue line version that was passed out. As part of the application submittal, the application shall, within 24 hours of submitting a permit application, provide notices as follow, follows A, by first class US mail, et cetera, et cetera, to property owners and occupants of buildings within a thousand feet of the project, 
B, <coughs> post the notice. It doesn't say and, and I'm, I, my guess is that it's both of those things. Is that correct? You should do A and B. So that's correct. Yeah, so we just throw and in there. Okay. Does that, and then I am curious about um, what period might make sense for just a report back on our experience. How many have been applied for? How many have gone up? How many deals uh, have sure. been, et cetera? I um, would happy, be happy to put together something for you. Uh, at a point that seems meaningful. At a point that sounds meaningful. You know what I mean. yeah. Sure, I do. I do know what you mean. Um, at, I would say that's going to take um, probably the new year. Yeah, oh, of yeah. course. Yeah. Yeah, and I, some period of time, I would think. But Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay. So it sounds like that edit will be incorporated. And then Vice Mayor Kevin? No, I just wanted to thank um, specifically the members of the public who brought this to our attention because um, they didn't, there didn't really seem like there were any tools that we could use uh, to try to help people who might be suffering from um, EMF sensitivities. And so I want to thank uh, Satya and the rest of the folks who brought this to our attention so that we could try to do something in the best of our abilities mm -hmm. under federal law to actually help um, people who are suffering from this. And then I want to thank the uh, council members, Donna Myers and Sandy Brown, for taking the time to kind of work with our legal staff. And I want to thank all of our, the city attorney's office and all the legal staff who also did a lot of work on getting us something that's getting us in the right direction. Okay, here, here. A comment? A couple issues that came up was uh, on 16.8, I don't know, uh, it's under 15.38.030, what uh, the member of the public was asking about, what, there's three and four, what, what, what does that mean? Antennas and wireless communications facilities identified by the FCC or the CPUC as exempt, what, what would be an example of those? Well, I think that's just an acknowledgement that um, we don't know what that, that could be. You know, the, it seems to me the state or the federal government could institute some sort of new technology or um, a new communication system or something that they just specifically say isn't regulated by current guidelines or local guidelines. Uh, I think that's just an acknowledgement that that could happen. And number four? Uh, the wireless Sorry. facility is suspended, uh, embedded or attached on cables or lines. That's already prohibited under the uh, design and aesthetic ordinance that was passed by the council in um, April. And who is the um, person, the ADA person for the planning department? Is there? My understanding it's a, a Miss Lawless, L-O-L-L-I-S. Thank you. And um, I was just wondering, a couple of issues that came up, would you, uh, for a friendly amendment, would we go from five days to seven business days to make an um, appeal for the uh, ADA? Should Does that sound reasonable? Make the maker of the motion is Councilman Oh, Myers. I'm sorry, excuse me. Is there a reason why we went with five? I'm gonna just get thank, some thank, yeah. guidance. Good idea. Uh, the FCC shot clocks. We were just trying to minimize the all of the notification, the okay. appeal, everything, just try and minimize as much as possible to squeeze into the shot clock period. Yeah, and I think the shot clock period is one of the things that we weighed a lot. And uh, the more that we we try to kind of put, add into that period, the less control we have over the outcome. <coughs> so I'm gonna. And does it sound reasonable to, uh, for the city to issue a press release about um, along the lines of what Mr. Longinati was talking about, about how we can't, you know, this is the way it is. This is a really difficult issue. And I think it would bode well for the folks who live in our community to say, hey, we're, we're struggling with this. We're trying, uh, but we're being usurped by the federal government and we want to do more. I'd also I'm make fine. her the motion, but I, I Agree. Yeah, I'm I'm fine with that, and I think it you know it's one more space in which we can make that point. I, I try to say it every time we talk about this <laughs> from the dais, but yeah, um, I think reminding the public that uh, we are constrained and you know are doing as much as we possibly can. And if I could really quickly, um, just want to add, and I um, apologize be for overlooking a um, uh, big <coughs> thank you to. Uh, EMF aware uh, group and the community and especially to Satya Ryan for making this happen. I mean, I when we got into this, I had no, um, you know, no, really not a lot of hope that we could um, we could do anything uh, 
to try to at least address the concerns of the community in as meaningful a way as we could, we could and I, I didn't have a lot of optimism about that, and I didn't understand the issue very well. Um, so really thank you for helping us make this happen. Great, thank you. Can I just get clarification? The first friendly amendment from Council Member Crone was not accepted, was not but the accepted. second one was. Yes. In regards yes, to the press release. With the pre sure, we can direct staff to, to create a press release. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I, and, uh, I'm, Councilor yeah. Matthews? Or did I you understand that the request was the city attorney to do a press release? The city manager's office to issue a press release. <laughs> That's yeah. what I thought. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we can do that, no problem. Okay. Great. Great. okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. All right, we will move on to item number 17 in our council meeting agenda packet, um, Tenant Protection Act, and we'll go ahead and invite up uh, Lee Butner, Butler and Bonnie Lipscomb. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Lee Butler, I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. And um, today we are responding to Council direction from the uh, 29th of October when we were talking about AB 1482 and the Tenant Protection Act of 2019 and its applicability to Section 8, um, Housing Choice and Project-Based Voucher Holders. So, in October of this year, the governor signed AB 1482. It takes effect on January 1st, and for properties that are covered, it establishes a rent increase cap of 5% plus CPI, or 10%, whichever is less. And CPI is consumer price index. This year it was roughly around a little over 3%, so that would set a cap of 8.2% or so. Um, it also sets for just cause eviction protections for um, uh, the covered tenants and specifies that when no fault evictions occur that relocation assistance or rent waivers um, of in the amount of one month be provided to the tenant. There are various exclusions. Um, this is just a sample of them, um, but uh, buildings that have been occupied within the last 15 years Individually owned um, single family homes, condominiums and townhouses are excluded. Dorm rooms are excluded. And then in living situations where the tenant shares a bathroom or kitchen with the owner who also occupies that residence as their primary residence, those are excluded. And then we've got section eight and um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a couple of slides. Um, there are some uh, I think there's some agreement on project-based vouchers being excluded, um, and there's some disagreement on whether or not um, housing choice vouchers are excluded, and um, we'll talk about it in, in just a moment. Um, so the council action on the 29th um, extended AB 1482 um, and gave it sort of a retroactivity clause back to September 1st of this year to protect um, the tenants who would otherwise be covered by AB 1482. Um, and then the council said explore um, section, additional Section 8 protections, including four months relocation assistance, um, payment of that relocation assistance within 15 days of the notice to vacate, and then um, providing the first right of refusal for tenants to occupy um, a residence um, if they have been asked to leave due to uh, construction and, uh, or demolition and reconstruction or um, rehabilitation work that causes them to vacate for more than 30 days. And so, um, we went out and did some very brief coordination in the time allotted that we had. Um, we reached out to ten Tenant Sanctuary 
and um, had some conversations about whether AB 1482 does actually apply to Section 8 tenants, um, particularly in relation to the applicability to housing choice Section 8 tenants. And just um, quickly for the council and for the community, housing choice um, Section 8 is a voucher that is received by an individual and they can carry that around to any uh, landlord who uh, chooses to accept that, whereas the project base, that stays with the project itself and doesn't move from one place to another. So um, in the conversations with Tenant Sanctuary, we had some conversations about that and we reached out to some of the folks that they recommended the um, California Rural Legal Assistance Group and um, they actually provided a letter today um, that opined that um, the housing choice um, voucher holders are not exempted, so they are protected by 1482. And uh, the, the way I read that, and I'll look to the uh, city attorney here, the way I read that, that the um, project-based vouchers are excluded from uh, the section eight, or excuse me, from the AB 1482 um, protections. And I'm seeing a nodding head there. There were a lot of acronyms in their memo. Um, and so. Yes, I would just, to add to that, um, note that Gretchen Regenhart is an attorney with California Rural Legal Assistance um, who submitted that letter that, that the council received today and is also present this evening. So um, I, I'm sure the council would be interested in hearing from Ms. Regenhart. And so what I would say is um, that um, if the council chooses to adopt one of these ordinances this evening, um, the applicability of 1482 to those groups um, is somewhat irrelevant in that um, you would be extending those protections regardless of whether or not AB 1482 applies. And we'll get to it shortly, but that is our recommendation that those protections be extended. Um, and so, um, if that's the direction the council goes, then um, the protections will apply, whether they are housing choice vouchers or project-based voucher tenants. Um, in conversation with the tenant sanctuary folks, we also had a conversation about alternative protections, like um, rather than providing direct relocation assistance, instead um, not having rent uh, paid for the, the final month or final multiple months as an alternative. And then um, I, I wanted to put this up because it, it shows that there are just different differing opinions and differing perspectives. There's not necessarily a right and wrong response. When I was talking with the tenant sanctuary um, representative, they said, well, section eight evictions um, result in a higher likelihood of homelessness. And then when talking with the housing authority, they said, well, it's a lower likelihood of homelessness if you're considering people with equivalent incomes, because if they have that housing choice voucher, that can help supplement their income in going to another location. So it's just different perspectives on the same issue. Um, going to the um, housing authorities per board perspectives, um, they held a meeting, uh, a special meeting on November 19th to discuss um, this specific issue that um, the council was um, planning to discuss this evening. And they, their board expressed concerns with, with fewer protections um, or more protections for Section 8 tenants. And on the, the fewer protection side, they obviously spoke with the, one, the desire to have parity um, and not have Section 8 tenants have fewer protections than non-Section 8 counterparts. With respect to more protections, they saw that as a disincentive for the landlords. And I'll, I'll quickly go through um, a, a bit here that was included in the staff report, and that was the Housing Authority staff report states, the number of Section 8 families that could be harmed by discouraging landlords from renting to Section 8 tenants is greater than the number of Section 8 tenants that face <laughs> no-fault termination of their rental agreement. At, every, at any given point in time, there are hundreds of families searching for a unit with a landlord who will accept a Section 8 voucher. And then the report goes on to state that countywide, there were 64 new Section 8 landlords added just in the last two months, which um, I thought was a very impressive number. 
and um, that, and I'm quoting again now, that although adding additional protections for Section 8 voucher holders would be well-intentioned, it is likely to have unintended consequences and could potentially do more harm than good by undermining our efforts to <coughs> encourage landlord participation. And so um, the, uh, that gets to their recommendation. The board actually recommended an equivalent amount of protections between um, Section 8 and non-Section 8 um, tenants. And that is what our staff recommendation mirrors. And um, they recommended that, and as do staff recommend that, um, just cause eviction and relocation uh, assistance protections be included, but not rent control protections. The, the board uh, conversation focused around there already being a sufficient amount of rental cost increase protections for Section 8 tenants. Um, and so staff agrees with that recommendation. And that brings us to the options that the council has. The council specifically directed us to um, evaluate these additional protections um, for Section 8 tenants, not just just cause eviction, but four months relocation assistance payment within 15 days of giving notice and first right of refusal. Um, not including retro, uh, rent control and having retroactivity to September 1st of 2019. Because this goes above and beyond the um, non-Section 8 protections, staff is not recommending this option. Um, the second option is protections equivalent to the AB 1482 protection. So that would provide just cause eviction protections for Section 8 tenants, both project-based um, and housing choice voucher recipients. Um, and it would provide one month of relocation assistance, no rent control, and would also have re retroactivity back to September 1st of 2019. So we're recommending that a, a simple ordinance, um, and in fact an urgency ordinance that I'll get to in a moment, that um, mirrors the just cause eviction and relocation assistance protections from 1482. And that is consistent with the Housing Authority Board's recommendation. So urgency ordinance or not, both of those two options in your agenda packet, you've got four, ordinance that, four ordinances, that's because for each of those options you have a regular ordinance and an urgency ordinance. The regular ordinance, assuming council acted upon it tonight as a first reading and then um, approved it on December 10th, that would take effect on January 9th. It's 30 days after the regular ordinance final adoption. That would mean that eviction notices made from September 1st through October 11th could be valid for Section 8 tenants. Section 8 requires a 90-day um, uh, notification period prior to um, an eviction, and therefore um, that, uh, that time gap between September 1st and October 11th, um, anyone receiving in a notice during that time could still be valid. Um, this action would only require four votes from the council. Staff is actually recommending that you take the option to urgency ordinance, which would take effect immediately, and that would, that would close that gap. So um, it would re revert back to September 1st, and um, anyone who received a eviction notice on or after September 1st would have um, these rules apply. Um, that requires five votes from the council. And so um, depending on uh, how the council wants to go um, and, and how many votes there are for that, um, there are options for you. Um, so with that, staff is <coughs> recommending the urgency ordinance mirroring AB 1482 with the provisions providing just cause eviction and uh, relocation assistance uh, equivalent to one month's rent um, be um, adopted by the council. And we're available for any questions that you may have. Great. Uh, let me first say thank you for within the short time frame. Um, consulting with some of our experts and community members on this topic. We want to make informed decisions and um, I'm really um, happy you were able to, and, and also show appreciation to the HUD board for scheduling a special meeting to take this, this topic up and provide input to us. Um, so I'll go ahead uh, and see if any of my colleagues have questions at this time and, and uh, thank you Gretchen for being here as well. If there's any questions or input also for you. Councilmember Matthews. Someone asked me this question, which had not occurred to me. In terms of the relocation assistance, is it the amount, full amount of the rent or of the amount that the Section 8 um, person receives? 
That's a good question. I would say that it is the full amount of the rent yeah. and we could clarify that in the ordinance. Yes, I think that that should be clarified. Any other questions at this time? Seeing none, maybe we'll go ahead and open it up to the community to see if there's any public input on this topic. Please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. As somebody who has worked for 38 uh, Section 8 tenants across three counties, I've been doing it for about 30 years. I have quite a bit of experience with this and um, to understand Section 8 is a government program and we landlords do have a half contract, about a five, six page half contract, housing assistance payments that is with the government, HUD, which details a lot of um, um, guidelines and rules and protections as for, uh, for the tenants. And as Lee said, yes, they, they have, we have to give a 90 day notice for uh, no cause eviction right now. Um, for um, a cause eviction, you know, one or the breach of lease, non-payment of rent, that just is the same as any other tenant basically. But the real troubling thing here was the, um, yeah, the four months relocation is really gonna spook landlords into accepting Section 8 tenants, especially if it's, I mean, on the one hand, they're, a lot of it's getting paid, majority, most of the time the majority is getting paid by Section 8. And um, I have tenants paying $2 a month. One tenant pays $2 a month. So why are you not burning the government for that four months um, for, the, for their share, if you will? It just opens all kinds of just, unintended consequences, but the key thing is, um, just speaking on behalf of Section 8 tenants and, you know, encouraging more landlords to accept it, and I've had great success with the, with the program, putting something like that would really just put cold water on anybody's, um, any landlord's uh, desire to take a Section 8 tenant. Uh, thank you, that's all I have. <clears throat> Um, I'd also support option two. Um, and in, a, in addition to this, maybe you guys haven't spoken about it, but the housing authority for somebody, a landlord taking section eight, they have new program that somebody gets just $2,000 just to sign up somebody for section eight and the $2,500 as an extra security deposit in case they have to evict and stuff. So it does cover that. So their ideas <clears throat> of fearing that you put extra protection and people not choosing to take Section 8, like that's a serious fear. Um, there was recently SB 329 was passed October 8th. It was a state law that says you can't discriminate based on how someone's paying. If you go on Craigslist right now and you search for section no Section 8, you'll find in Santa Cruz, I found 17 just now. It'd be really cool if as you're trying to protect Section 8 stuff, figure out who's supposed to enforce that because the state's not doing that. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Luckily, the previous gentleman said the same things that I was gonna say about uh, new laws uh, preventing discrimination against Section 8. Um, they at least can't actually state it out loud and may still happen. Uh, so just wanna say I'm in, I'm in favor of doing the urgency, um, ado adopting the urgency ordinance. Um, I do worry about um, creating an environment where it's harder to get Section 8 tenants um, that, Going from having the voucher to being in a place, um, but I, I don't I don't know the the dynamics of that. So, at the very least, I support option two, um, and I'm not against option one either. <laughs> Thank you. Any other members? Okay, please come forward, and you'll be our last speaker. Good evening, Scott Graham. Um, you know, this is a real balancing act because if you put in too harsh of a penalty on the landlords then there's gonna be fewer and fewer landlords that are gonna be willing to take Section 8. And as it is right now, people get Section 8 certificates and are unable to find a landlord to take those. Um, I believe that the uh, veterans groups have been given a large number of uh, Section 8 vouchers just for veterans and they're not being used because they can't find places that will take it. And so I would discourage you from doing anything that's gonna 
decrease the number of landlords that are willing to take Section 8 because it's already hard enough for people on Section 8 to find a place. And um, it's, uh, you know, a, a difficult thing if somebody's uh, kicked out, you know, evicted from a Section 8 housing, to then find another one. So I think, you know, like what was stated earlier that people that lose their Section 8 housing end up homeless more often than not. And I would encourage you to uh, go with the emergency option number two. Thank you. Okay. Did you want to come forward, please? Good evening, Council. Um, Mayor Watkins, um, I wasn't going to speak tonight unless somebody had a question, and I'm still available for questions if you do. Um, but what I wanted to just uh, mention to you is that if we are correct uh, at CRLA that, that the new law already applies to Section 8 uh, voucher holders, then by adopting this option and not including the rent control, you're actually disadvantaging the Section 8 um, voucher holders. So I mention this because I'm pretty sure this is not, is not something you're intending to do, but it's something that could happen if, um, if you adopt this option w without the rent control as part of it. And I wanna just say about Section 8, that um, about Section 8 uh, housing choice vouchers, that uh, although <clears throat> when people first lease up, there is a limit on how much rent can be charged, but thereafter, the landlord can raise the rent, and if it exceeds what the housing authority or HUD has said is the appropriate standard, then that increase is borne by the tenant. That's not uh, something that the, that the landlord um, pays for or that the housing authority pays for. So in fact, Section 8 housing choice voucher <coughs> holders are affected by rent increases. So um, just wanted to throw that out there in case it's something you haven't considered. And as I say, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. We'll go ahead and return back for council action. Vice Mayor Cumming. Yeah, um, so I actually had the opportunity to meet with Jenny Panetta and, and share the same concerns around um, making sure that, um, that we're not discouraging people from landlords in particular from taking on um, the Section 8 housing vouchers. So I'm prepared to um, make a motion to approve option two, the urgency ordinance to provide the same eviction protections to all Section 8 tenants available to non-Section 8 tenants under AB 1482. And, and then in addition to this, um, through our conversation, through the conversation I had with Jenny Panetta, the housing board is actually gonna be working with the county um, and the Community Action Board to develop a relocation assistance program for no-fault eviction and low-income tenants. Um, and so I'm gonna add that we direct staff to work with those same partners, the County Housing Authority, Community Action Board, to develop a relocation assistance program for no-fault no evicted low-income tenants to return as part of the 2020-2021 budget with a progress report to council at the second meeting in January. I'll second that. Motion by uh, Vice Mayor Cumming, seconded by Councilmember Brown. Further discussion, Councilmember Brown. I do have a question now, uh, as a follow-up to um, Ms. Regenhart's point, um, because now I am concerned that we may be doing something that is, uh, yeah, that is disadvantaging uh, Section 8 tenants vis-a-vis -vis other tenants. So um, before we take a vote, I wanted to try to clarify this um, because I. If I, if I read that correctly, then that may be what we're doing, but then there is also the um, factor that state law supersedes local, local law. So I, I don't know that we could actually make, create a weaker 1482. Um, we could, I suppose, for this short period of four months, uh, which I don't wanna do, but I just wanna get some clarification on that before we move ahead. 
So I believe um, we've got some draft language that we could add to address um, both your concern, Councilmember Brown, and your concern, Councilmember Matthews. Um, <clears throat> so at the end of uh, 21.07.010, that speaks to amending AB 1482 protections, or excuse me, extending AB 1482 protections to Section 8 tenants. Um, two sentences could be added, um, and I can email those over in a moment. Um, they would be, uh, full month's rent shall be provided for relocation assistance, including both the tenant's portion of the payment and the voucher amount. That addresses Councilmember Matthews' question. And then to address the concern that was raised from the CRLA and Councilmember Brown, any rent control protections that Section 8 Housing Choice voucher holders are afforded by AB 1482 shall also be applied to such Section 8 Housing Choice tenants. And that way, if it is determined um, that they are in fact applicable, then um, that would give them the same protections um, and, and not a reduced amount. Our attorney's taking a quick, a quick look at that and I'll email it over to Bonnie to put on the screen. Thank you for the creative fix to hopefully mitigate what could potentially be an unintended consequence from this potential action. Did you have a question, Councilman? Uh, just on the language, um, I wonder if you would consider just uh, saying to uh, direct staff to uh, work with the others to explore a relocation assistance program um, to return for consideration as part of the 2021 because we already have other housing. I mean, we just wanna see where that fits in with the other stuff. Yeah. So if you don't mind those two words. Okay, that's a, so, I, yeah, but if I could make a comment about this, I'd like to just really quickly, you know, I have been since during my time on the council have advocated for uh, the city establishing some kind of relocation assistance fund. And this came up initially when uh, there were <coughs> tenants facing evictions due to um, red tags on properties. And I know that that is a it's an ongoing concern. Um, and, and so I, I do really wanna advocate for moving forward with this exploration and, and providing us uh, a report back so that we can we can move ahead. I think the Community Action Board does a great job with their relocation assistance program, having worked right next door to the shelter project. When I worked at CAB, I know that um, they're very effective and I appreciate that the Housing Authority is looking to potentially use some of its resources to make a contribution. Uh, I'd love to see us do that as well and the, and the county, maybe we could incentivize the county by stepping up. So I just wanted to say that now because it won't come back to us for a while, but, um, I, I'm okay with the language change. Mm -hmm. Great. So, so as long as we move forward and consider this. So those will be um, added to the motion as accepted by the vice mayor and the seconder, Councilman Brown. And I'll, I'll also say that part of accepting that is that, you know, if we get a report back in January, that'll inform kind mm -hmm. of the potential yeah. for this to happen. And so. Yeah. Yeah. Myers. I just have a question. Do we have our, do we have a relocation assistance program now? I thought we did. I just wanted to make sure what, yeah, I know, but I'm just <coughs> wanting yes, to make we sure do. that. We provide yeah. funding to CAB for a relocation assistance. It goes through um, CAB. We okay. have funding, yeah, we have programs with CAB and the <coughs> Housing Authority, and I have a, just a brief overview of those just for this context. For CAB, um, we also, we give 11,000 of Red Cross funding and additional 30,000 through the core funding um, to CAB for relocation, which is the eviction prevention program, basically, and it provides up to three months. Um, rent and then additionally through the housing authority we give 110,000 um, through our programs which are the emergency security deposit program um, which uh, both is for security deposits but also in in a situation can also um, uh, sometimes be considered and used as less <laughs> as rent. And then for the landlord incentive program, um, we have 22, 22,500 for that, which is can be used for security deposit and sometimes also as a last month's rent. Um, and then we also have, um, oh, uh, then 19, um, 19 and a half thousand to CRLA for um, tenant uh, related counseling related to <coughs> evictions and, and um, Rental rental issues. So altogether, we have, and I think in this context, we can we can work with that. Um, but we provide from the city funding um, just shy of two hundred thousand related to tenant protections. 
And I just have, a, I guess, for the makers of the motion, is is the intent, is it a different relocation or it, would it be consistent with the kinds of things that we're doing right now? So just continuing the conversation and looking at potentially broadening that. Okay, thank you. And then I just have uh, one potential change on the findings. Um, so I'm looking at 17.16 on I, uh, item L. Um, I know we've received some communication both from the planning director as well as um, others. Um, there's language in here that um, that no fault eviction notices and threats of eviction have surged, and I'm not sure that we have experienced that, at least in some of the research and, and calls that I've made. I'm wondering if we could change that finding to read instead of having, and threats of eviction have surged the language we would read have been brought to the attention of the council. Um, I just wanna make sure that based on what we're adopting that we have, and also just respecting some of the information that the housing authority has put in their document, I just wanna make sure that we're tracking with um, the best practices that keep, that pr provide the most protection for, for people. Mr. Kondai, did you wanna to speak to that? I, I, I think council member Myers, uh, proposed language is, is more accurate than the finding that, that's in the okay. current draft. So I, th I think that's a good suggestion. Okay, great. Is that sure. um, accepted by the maker's motion? Okay, great. All right, um, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. We have one item that was <coughs> continued and that's item number 18, and that will be continued to January 28th, 2020. Do we need a motion on that? Nope. Totally. Okay, just so you know. Okay, great. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and reconvene and tell our evening item. 7 p.m. is oral communication. 7.30 is our evening item. There will be overflow available at our civic if need be. Okay. So we'll adjourn for now. Wow. I know. I didn't know. You can ask me two questions outside if you want.
All right, I'd like to call our meeting to order. If I could get your attention, please. Thank you very much. All right, um, go ahead and ask that uh, you uh, stop your conversations. I'll go ahead and call our meeting to order. Um, good evening, everybody. I wanna welcome you to our 7 p.m. session of the November 26, 2019 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. Um, before we begin, I'll go ahead and announce that we do have overflow available at the Tony Hill room um, at the Civic Center if needed. No, we don't. The main hall. I'm sorry, excuse the me, at the main hall if necessary. Um, okay, we'll go ahead and ask our clerk to please call the roll. <coughs> Thank you. Council members Crone? Here. Glover? Here. Myers? Here. Brown? Here. Matthews is here. Vice Mayor Cumming? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. So we're on um, the portion where we're having oral communications. I'll go ahead and remind folks that oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. Um, if I could get a sense of how many members of the community are here for oral, oral communications. Okay, eventually you're gonna wanna make your way to my left. We generally allocate about a half hour for oral communications, so we'll try to wrap that up a little after 7.30. Um, and that we ask that those of you who are here in council chambers or outside of Campbell cha council chambers um, abide by our rules of decorum and ensure that your fellow citizens have an opportunity to address the council without intimidation or any type of threat. If I do see any of those types of behaviors that are um, not following our rules of decorum, I will go ahead and issue a, war a warning. If it continues, I will ask you to leave. Um, I hope that you can um, uh, rise to the occasion and respect your fel fellow citizens so that we are able to um, conduct your business and our business and our city's business um, in a way that's transparent for all to engage. So having said that, we'll go ahead and move it right into oral communications. Please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. My pleasure to be back before you. I think I know most of you sitting up there. Uh, what I'd like to speak tonight, my name is Richard Lewis. I uh, represent a group of Amistad Vision International. When people say what you're up to, Youth Voice and Student Empowerment is an international human right. What I want to speak into is sister, sister in Mexico with a particular place in Jalisco where David Mayer had 6,000, the group that put on the uh, mariachis about a year ago. So I'm gonna try to send emails. I'd like the new mayor to kind of think about what it might look like as Watsonville has a sister sister with this area of Jalisco by Guadalajara. Economic development, build the bridge. Uh, so I'm gonna do my homework on what that might take and would like anybody on the city council to join that research. There is no reason that we can't create economic development with communication. I can't do it in three minutes. So just introducing the idea and the future of empowering Cabrillo and UC, the next mayor might bring to the table the idea of the next generation of commission. So we officially look at that 18 to 40 and bring their voice forward. Most impressed with what both of you did with those fifth, sixth graders at that one school next to the Peace Church. And I don't know about how much time I took, but I'm here because I'm really concerned about what's gonna be on the agenda. And I am homeless, but I won't be tomorrow. Somebody's giving me a motor home. But I'm also a homeless vet by choice. So we're never gonna find another Santa Cruz County and for a long time, I've been out there with, with what it is, but the people who aren't here are the, are the homeless <coughs> and by homes, Latinos. Thank you for letting me and Thank look you, forward Richard. to getting the emails. Thank you, Richard. Okay, next speaker, please. Please come forward. Hello, I'm natealex.kennedy at gmail.com, 346-9888. Uh, one thing I think we really need to do is get these council meetings broadcast on traditional AM, FM radio. Uh, just ideas of stations to be used at KSEO, KZSC, uh, pretty much any anyone that's local who would be into doing it. And I'm sure there's plenty of radio stations that would jump on the opportunity if we give it to them. 
Um, there's that, and we also need to have an audio-only stream on the internet if you want to listen to it live off the internet, uh, because there's a video stream, but it is <laughs> way too much bandwidth. Um, I One time I tried running it on a phone with limited bandwidth, and I hit the end of my bandwidth after about 20 minutes of watching the council. Um, another thing I thought we should do is allow video conferencing, such as Google Duo, uh, Microsoft Skype, all, this, all of these, we should have those go to the 4711131 non-emergency number, then when they're talking to the, uh, dis I mean, it can still be an emergency, but uh, you're talking, trying to describe them something that happens, you show the car wreck, the fire, whatever reason you're calling, instead of just communicating that it's happening at blah, blah address. Um, also, uh, for a long time, I've been saying we need more tandem bikes for the cops, and uh, I think that would really help enforcement. But also, why don't we not only legalize skateboarding, but start giving the cops e-skateboards, electronic ones that are motorized where they can really go fast on them and uh, have total control with a minimal amount of uh, experience. Uh, so, skateboards for the cops, too. Um, as far as, uh, oh, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Nate. Okay, next speaker, please. <laughs> My name's Pauline Seals, and I represent Santa Cruz Climate Action Network, which is about 1,500 local people. Um, but actually, first I want to say, I'm really glad it's finally raining. This is about the latest and that's part of climate change. I'm glad it's raining, but I'm awfully sorry for the people who don't have a warm, dry place to stay. Um, I'm here to present some signatures on this uh, petition. We've been uh, sending zero carbon by 2030. We have now another um, 30 pages of signatures for this. Lots and lots of people are totally in favor of everything that's on here. There's a letter here, I'll just read this a little bit. Reduce vehicle emissions, limit single-use plastic, facilitate food waste reduction, encourage plant-rich diets, and take other steps as needed. So, um, there was a report today about on the, the climate status, and they were saying that um, only China and the European Union have kept their promises and reduced emissions. <coughs> the U.S. is particularly bad, but um, we know that. But it's going to lead to disaster if we can't change things very quickly. Thank you. Hey, Garrett Phillip. I'd like to address the personal attacks on my character and the uh, miss... Uh, ill-conceived uh, sort of a uh, conflation of my own views with Santa Cruz United, of one of the recall council members earlier today, and the uh, Grover Crone fan club also defaming the character of Santa Cruz United and therefore myself. I'm not going to get into a contest of who's lying out of every pore on this matter or recounting and refuting all the falsehoods because it isn't necessary. Somebody is, however, lying big time. The 10,000 or so voters who actually talked to Santa Cruz United over four months were actually there are perfectly capable of judging the character of who was talking to them, and claims of big outside money can be easily refuted by monetary reporting requirements. You can't lie and fool people who know the truth. This will be the most informed electorate in the history of Santa Cruz. 10,000 voters have spoken, and I believe they and more will speak on March 3rd. There is just one element of truth to the fan club's complaints, and just personally for me only, and I suspect for a majority of people, the recall is indeed about more than the quite legitimate complaints of Santa Cruz United. Indeed, it is partly about politics. The ad hoc survey revealed the approval rating of the city council uh, starting with the election of the progressive majority massively dropped to a multi-decade low of 20%. The approval rating for the fire department was a city high, a city department high of 86%. I suspect this is because the people know when the bell tolls, the fire department will always protect all the people's interest all the time with all they have. 
the politics of passionately representing only a tiny fraction of the community who contribute near nothing, some are drug addicts, some are thieves, the militant entitled is not thought to be representing the vast majority out there. Indeed, the perception is the majority of the taxpaying public thinks they are considered somewhat expendable by the progressives, so it's just a guess. Since you know nothing about me and brutally mischaracterize me, I will correct that. <laughs> I am an individual who does not have to represent all the people you do. I represent myself and that's okay. Next speaker, please. <laughs> Next speaker. Oh, thank you. Good evening, I'm Jane Doyle and I actually would like to speak to something you've already finished with but I hope that what I'm saying will be passed along to the staff. Um, basically what I would have said had I been able to be here. I'll just, um, let, me, let me go ahead and pause you for just a moment. I'm sorry, oral communications are for items that are not on today's agenda. But, but you've done it, it was this morning. And that was on today's agenda. So no, I can't talk about that not today, but you're welcome to email us and reach out to us directly about either item as it relates to your opinion on the item. That's but okay. right now. I, <laughs> Quick, Excuse me, quick he's question. Sure, Council Member Glover. Just a quick question for clarity. That last speaker spoke on an item that was earlier on the agenda. You didn't stop him. Well, that was like, I, 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 I will just say, I, I'll just say that was a lot of a lot of information in that two minutes that were a lot of different topics. That, but that said, I do acknowledge that this is, but if there's specifically something you wanted to address is that, that was on today's agenda, this would not be the appropriate time, as it's really supposed to allow for an opportunity for members of the community who are speaking to us yeah, not on okay, today's that's agenda. That's fine. That's fine. But we I'm look forward talk to later hearing. anyway. Okay, I'll that see sounds you great. Again. Okay, and we'll look forward to hearing from you. If there's any any member of the community who wants to speak to us on an item that's not on today's agenda, please come forward. Mayor, Council, Brent Adams of the Warming Center. This is a public service announcement, although it's tangential, of course. Warming Center is gonna be open on Thursday the 28th at the Red Church. I want the community to be aware. Anybody who's outside can come in. We are completely 100% scalable. It means we never turn anyone away. Uh, we should be open tonight because there's forecast uh, over an inch of rain. Why are we not open tonight? It's because it takes 48 hours for us to turn around to have an all volunteer shelter to find a location and to get all the volunteers. Uh, uh, it, it, two days out, it, it was actually forecast to be only 0.8 inches. Only today did it drop into the one inch uh, factor. But it's 39 degrees forecast today, I mean, I mean uh, 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 Thursday today, so we're opening on Thursday. Um, I want everybody to know that uh, everybody can come in. Um, we make sure that, uh, uh, e that we're, we serve soup all night long. People don't even have to come in t to the space. It's a hypothermia shelter. Uh, they can get blankets, soup, hand warmers, and then return out into the night. Well, we, we expect to serve as many as 90, 95 people that night. Um, being tangential with the other issue on the, uh, I really want to encourage um, uh, uh, a, a knowledge about scalability. For instance, the storage program, we've never turned anyone away. The laundry program, we've never turned anyone away. And when we, you don't turn anyone away, imagine if we had a population cap of 100 people with the storage program, then we would never have discovered that 200, 250 people is our plateau. So I wanna reflect in sheltering in general. Why don't we, Inst insist on scalability of design because homelessness is actually a function of scarcity. Uh, scarcity of shelter beds. We turn people out as a city without in intending, no matter how many shelter beds we have, it's not scalable. So if you insist on scalability, then you'll always, and, and there are many array different types of sheltering, transitional encampments, safe sleep zones, parking programs. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'd like to call to your attention an article from the Sacramento Bee that appeared in the San Jose Mercury News this morning. Title, survey shows most in state favor mandate for city shelters. Most Californians are concerned about homelessness in their community and a majority support the concept of a law that would require cities to build more shelters according to a new statewide survey. 
A poll from Public Policy Institute of California found 85% of the respondents are concerned about the state's estimated 130,000 homeless people, with 58% supporting be, reporting being very concerned. The majority of Republicans, Independents at 61%, Demo Democrats at 59 were very concerned, as were the residents of the Bay Area, 63%. A majority of those surveyed, regardless of party, support Gavin Newsom's right to shelter platform and a proposed state policy that would require local governments to provide enough shelter beds for any homeless person to be able to sleep indoors. That policy has the support of 70% of likely voters, 87% of Democrats, and 67% of independents, and 50% of Republicans. When they say that 85% of the respondents are concerned, I can only assume 15% live in the city of Santa Cruz. Next speaker. I used to think of this place as a solemn place honor and stuff. But like in the last meeting, as it's been in the past before, our democratic right keeps getting trampled on, stepped on here by this, I'll say mayor, because she says, well, I want to make sure people have enough time to talk, so we're going to cut your time <clears throat> trampling on our democratic right. We, are a dem we came here for the, the democracy process. And when I saw that veteran up here crying and he called you a disgrace, I agree with him. So I look at it as the truth. If a person could come here and look at you and lie to you to your face, the reason this mayor stopped us from talking, cut our time, is because she know some stuff she ain't gonna wanna hear. She didn't do it for the time that we can have more time to talk. You wanna do that? You do that on your own meeting time when you're talking about nothing at these long, boring Hi. meetings. You don't stop our democratic rights. Anytime you attack democracy, something's wrong with you. Yeah. We fight against you. So you, uh, you, Mr. Glover, you need to be our mayor right now. <laughs> Yesterday. I know you're working on stuff. You're putting in good work. We need you now. Make Santa Cruz great. And get rid of the rest of them four over there so that we can do some things and handle things correct. I'm talking fast, it's something else I wanna say, but you got us so on nerve where we gotta say what we gotta say quick. I'm not a rapper, so I can't do it like that, but I'm trying to say, you're stepping on our democratic rights. You're up here telling people, you can't talk about that. It's her right to talk about whatever she wanna talk about, or whoever. So we need to have create a rule where the mayor cannot tell you we're gonna cut your time. Okay, next speaker. My name is Lee Myers. I'm a 42 year resident of Santa Cruz County, half of the time spent here. Houseless, senior citizen, I understand they have lotteries to get on the waiting list for housing. Last night where I sleep, a fella showed up and all he had to sleep in was cardboard. <clears throat> um, I don't know what he's doing tonight. Maybe he'll end up where I'm at again. I don't know. But I do know you, you people recently had some sort of vote on a quarter million dollars for new tasers for the police department. But you can see fit to come up with money for an emergency shelter. I want to thank Brent Adams for stating that it takes 48 hours for him to get up and running to illustrate exactly why cities need to do this. Stop outsourcing your stuff to NGOs. If you can come up with a quarter million dollars for some damn tasers, you can come up with the money for a warming center at least. Thank you very much. And I'll just remind those in the community who are interested in speaking to oral communications, we do have an item on homelessness this evening that we will allow for public comment and have an opportunity for you to speak to us and address us on that item at that time. So this is for items not on today's agenda. 
So there's a strange contradiction. Um, I intend to raise the issue of the upcoming mayoral election that's on the agenda. And the reason I'm raising the reason I'm raising it, the reason I'm raising it here is because this is not you'll have an customer. Are you going to give the public chance to speak about mayors as oral? Yes, this uh, will will be an you or will you not? If you will, that's fine. Mr. Norris, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to please not interrupt me and I will acknowledge you in just a moment. Go ahead. I will let you know and that will be a warning that this is an opportunity for people to use the time that is not on that. today's agenda. We have the election and the nomination of mayor and vice mayor on today's agenda. You will have an opportunity as any other member of the public will as well to address the council on that at this I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. All Next right speaker. then. So um, I'm glad to hear that. Traditionally that's not been the case and if this is an exception I commend you for that. Um, I would like to ask and make sure that the next mayor, when, when, they, when, and he, or when he appears, and I assume it's going to be Justin Cummings, do what you did not do, which is make available for the public a list of your forthcoming public appearances so that if the community wishes to get together with you, either informally or simply to know where you're going to be publicly appearing, and this is addressed to any council member too if you choose to do it, which I think would be a good idea, you can do this. I made this request of Mayor Watkins months ago, and she candidly declined to do it. I think you said you might think about it, but you didn't do it. Secondly, I would like to, like to make sure that the mayor also, the incoming mayor, provides a list of lobbyist meetings. If you're meeting with groups, they're going to have an impact on your vote. It seems only fair to the community that you will make this a public record so people can know this. I again made this request of Mayor Watkins. She declined to do this. Finally, I'm concerned about, as I always am, that there be an open process around having information on the agenda before we come to the council meeting. So it is that one aspect of the council meeting is the closed sessions claims. And I've taken this up with the city administrator again and again every time I write her. And she's, she's been prompt in giving me information that I request, but it's never on the agenda for the public. That is to say, if a person is asking a, a sum of money from the city because they think the police department is acting badly, we need to know what that's about so we can decide whether to come and speak about it here or contact the person if we're a witness. That needs to be done. I've requested this again and again. So far, it hasn't been done. I, I, I hope the new majority will do that if there is a new majority. Your time Thank is up. Thank you. And we'll go ahead and um, let, I'll let the community know that we're gonna go ahead and close public um, oral communications um, after the individual with the orange hat on. So you'll be our last speaker for oral communications. Go ahead. Hi there, I'm Willie Say So. I'm nobody special. I'm just here because I represent, I am sure, a growing movement, a growing concern in Santa Cruz, which is, it's a really dumb time to be a Santa Cruz citizen. I mean, there's some real idiocy going on around. I get to a certain extent, that's the Trump administration, right? That's what's causing America to happen this. What's going on in Santa Cruz exactly? We're being filled with lies. We are being filled with infighting on the council. My vote is being threatened to be taken away right now. And we're all gonna be sitting around like this is normal? That guy over there who said that they got 10,000 voters, that just happened, that's on the agenda. He said they had 10,000 voters. Uh, no, that's not right. They turned in a little bit over 11,000 uh, signatures. Over 2,000 were considered invalid. That's not over 10,000, just mathematically speaking. I'm and gonna, we are just supposed to go with this? I'm gonna go ahead and pause your time. Again, this was on today's agenda. There was an opportunity. No, that was on today's agenda. He just did that. I responded to what he just said. We had, this was on today's he agenda. He just said that. He can say that, but I can't respond to him? Why don't, you, why don't you just finish your comments then, Tim? Thank you. What I'm saying is, we need to stop pretending like we don't see through the lies. Those who are lying need to stop pretending we can't see through them, because we all see through them. So you're just playing stupid. I'm talking to people in the Sentinel. Thank you, yeah, really. I'm talking to people in the Sentinel. I'm talking to Kevin Grossman, who printed, wrote libel in the Sentinel, saying that they found a pattern, which no, they did not. I am talking about this general sentiment throughout the city where we're all each other's necks. <laughs> and only some of us are actually at risk. 
this power struggle, this class struggle, this stupidity needs to end. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle and I'm not here to disrespect any one of you. Um, I can do the job that any one of you are doing. Um, I'm gonna try to say real quick, I'm homeless. I live at the loft. I have a 1984 Mercedes. I do live there. I have a driver's license. I have insurance. I became homeless because I had adrenal carcinoma and I had to have my adrenal gland removed. I had medical problems. So, so I'm trying to get back on my feet. My car is all I have to survive. <coughs> I have a case manager. I got my voucher back but they keep giving me parking tickets on my car because they want me to park inside. There's not always parking inside. And now I got four parking tickets on my car and today the park, yesterday when the sweet scraper came, she said that my boyfriend was a piece of shit and that if I didn't get my car off the street in a half hour that she was gonna tow my car. And so I don't know who to go to or who to ask or what to do about this parking problem. <coughs> All right, next speaker. Hi, I'm James Ewing Whitman. I've been a resident here for 26 years in this county. So, spoken here a couple times already today. This is something I wrote November 15th after listening to what Alicia and Keith spoke about. I'm just gonna read it, let's see how I do. I became an Eagle Scout June of, in June of 1985. What the fucking irreverence. Okay, I'm gonna I go ahead and pause your language. Our rules of decorum have it so that you aren't to use that type of language in our I council apologize. chambers. I apologize, I will edit I, that. I will, that is, uh, there was a previous person that spoke up that used inappropriate language. I'm gonna go ahead and say that will be a warning. There's no, that is not appropriate. There's people who are, there's children in the audience and there's people who are watching at home. I so apologize. why don't you continue and, and not use that language? Okay, I will not. <laughs> What the reverence do I know about anything? How to stop these How to stop these scams? Ronald writes, a short history of progress. Today is cubed to the cube to the cube cubed of any past civilization's downfall. Indiscriminately, all citizens, citizens on planet Earth seem to have accepted a mutual death sentence. Why? Why is 95% of the US the United States population does not realize that they are already homeless. Why is slavery at birth the status quo? Largely because our grandparents and our parents teach us to follow and not lead. I guess my mother failed greatly to teach me this. I thank her for this unfailure. And I greatly thank the voices in this video who I personally know and have greatly enjoyed helping, Keith and Alicia. They are doing the best to help many. What are you doing? As the gun to your head is the phone in your and my hand, the laptop in your lap that has already affected permanently your and your children's DNA. Wi-Fi has opened the blood-brain barrier to help calcify the pineal gland. Ge geoengineering has made everything phosphorescent and explosive. Fluoride has pacified our moods and weakened our bones. Geophosphate is, the, is an agent orange. 5G is a silent trigger now being installed in every street light and thousands are being deployed as satellites. As for more than 75 years, militaries have silently been using these frequencies to win wars. Your time is up. Thank you. Next speaker. My name is Jacob Myberg Guzman, uh, Santa Cruz resident, 42 years. Actually, here to talk about probably a different topic. Um, it's more of a safety-related item. Um, I ride my bike all over town, and um, there's an intersection at Westcliff and Manor and Monterey, and there is a crosswalk there. It's actually far away from a street light, so it's often dark. There's no reflectors there. It's around a curve, and cars often go quite quickly there and are looking at the ocean. And so many times now, um, especially two or three times in the last week where it's actually like frightening, my heart drops where people are almost hit there and cars are like screeching and people are screaming. And I'd love for the city to do something to increase the safety at that intersection. Um, while I have a, a few minutes, I'd love to say there's uh, another intersection at Ensenol and um, Highway 9 that's also challenging for bicyclists, especially if you're coming from the Costco area um, to cross there just because two lanes can curve right and you can kind of be trapped between cars. Um, different subject, uh, I think the downtown's 
streets um, team is awesome, cleaning up the garbage there. Um, I ride my bike on the river levee all the time and that makes a big impact. Um, wonderful program, thank you. Um, and a little bit separate, but um, here and there I have, I've been working in town for about 20 years um, at Plantronics, now Poly. Um, I sometimes hear people refer, you know, it's like, uh, you know, Googler and, you know, I want to live to set in Surf City. And I fun, sometimes feel like I'm a villain when I went to public schools here, you know, went to junior guards and, you know, did parks and rec program. And I feel like I should be kind of a success story. Um, you know, maybe I've had it a little easier in some, but I worked hard and went to school and came back and been working um, at a job here for 20 years. I rented for, you know, a dozen years and know those challenges. and. Now I'm a property owner and face those challenges, but it's tough feeling like a villain at times in your own town for Thank you. feeling like you're working hard. Next speaker. <coughs> Hello, my name is Travis. Uh, I'm here to share a story. Uh, there was a man named Jerry that I found on the side of the street in front of the Bank of America. He had fallen down and I'd saw him and I yelled out to him, I said, are you okay? And he said, help me up. And I, so I ran over to him and I lifted him up and uh, he needed to use the, the ATM. So I helped him, I put my hip into him and held him up and uh, let him use the ATM. Thank goodness it was somebody with a good heart. Um, and then I, I, I tried to ask him, you know, where are you from? And he was homeless and so I, hung out with him for a couple of hours trying to get the information, where are you staying? I wanted to make sure he could get to a safe place. He couldn't walk very well. He told me that he'd been in the hospital and that they told him he was never going to walk again. Then they put him on a bus and left him out. And um, at the end of the night, I realized he wasn't gonna be able to leave the taco shop, uh, the taqueria right across from the Bank of America. So I called the police station because I'd heard that maybe they do transports. Um, and I got a call back later from the, the captain he said, no, we don't do that. And then I called the only per other person who I could think of, it was Keith McHenry. And luckily we had just opened up the Phoenix camp and that was the only place available for this man to go who could not go to the bathroom without peeing himself, who could not walk one step. There was no one in this city who could help other than the people in the homeless union who actually care. And I'm just wondering, um, I just wanted to share that because we're trying to help from our hearts and um, you know, solutions. Uh, are hard to find, but um, we, we're here from our hearts and we, we want the best for everyone. So thank you. And you're gonna be our last speaker. Honorable Mayor, City Council members, my name is Nicholas Pace and I would like to speak on the 5G <laughs> I would like no 5G in Santa Cruz just go ahead unless and there's a health and safety study. Let me go ahead and pause you. Again, this, is, this was on today's agenda, and so we already spoke to this and heard public comment on this item. If there's anything that's not on today's agenda, we welcome hearing from you. If not, um, you're welcome to email us to express your opinions that way. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, we're gonna go ahead and close oral communications. Councilmember uh, Glover. Thank you, hey, just a quick question for the city attorney. Um, is it? possible for us to restrict people's speech if they're using vulgar, like profane language? Is that, or is that their First Amendment right? Uh, the, the question really is whether or not it, it, it uh, raises to a level of disrupting the meeting, but just the content of the speech. Um, we, have, we have, we would have problems enforcing a rule of that sort. Right, I'm just, uh, there was a concern earlier, you were out of the room, but there was a community member that was reciting something and they used the F word and then they were subsequently stopped and given a quote warning. So I just wanna <laughs> emphasize that it's not our place to control what people say on the podium if they're not actively attacking someone. I, w I will say though, as the... Um <laughs> the council also has adopted rules of decorum. That's right. So um, <laughs> I, I think from a legal perspective, could you prohibit someone from uh, using vulgar language, um, possibly not, but I certainly don't see a problem with asking someone to adhere to our uh, respectful conduct policy. Which is essentially exactly what I uh, stated and was uh, essentially required to do as the presiding officer to ensure that we have a, uh, 
ability for the community to experience our uh, council chambers uh, in adherence to the rules of decorum, and there are children pre present, so. Uh, Councilmember Cron. Yeah, I just was wondering, uh, I know we can't take any action on what folks said at the podium. I'd like to maybe um, ask staff if they could look at what Mr. Myberg said about the Westcliff Manor and Monterey needing reflectors, and then the Ensenal Highway one, 9 for bicyclists. I'm familiar with both of those, and um, he's right. <laughs> but I, I wonder if a staff person could maybe make an assessment and get back to the council. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and move on to our first um, agenda item for our evening uh, session. And that item is um, the shelter capacity update and ordinance amending chapter 6.36 camping of the city of Santa Cruz municipal code. Um, I'll just go ahead and remind those that are in the audience that are um, wanting to engage <coughs> on, on this item. How this will flow is that we'll have an, a presentation from our city staff. We'll then have an opportunity for uh, members of the council to ask questions. We'll go ahead and open it up at that time for public comment. I will allow um, anybody who's interested in speaking to the council briefly the opportunity to do so in one minute. Then I'll acknowledge those who reached out in advance to have the group comments on behalf of your group uh, to come forward and then we'll open it up to the two minutes for a uh, public comment. At which point we'll go ahead and return back to the council for action and deliberation. I'll go ahead and remind those that are in the audience that um, it is my job to ensure that we have an opportunity for everybody to engage in this in a way that's gonna um, not be intimidating or threatening and that is gonna adhere to our rules of decorum. And um, if there is notice of um, not adhering to those rules of decorum, I will go ahead and give you a warning. If it continues, I will ask you to leave, especially if it's interrupting our ability to conduct uh, the city's business, the people's business. So at that point, we'll go ahead and turn it over to our um, presenters. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. I was gonna start by giving an update on the shelter uh, capacity, and then I'll turn it over to uh, uh, City Attorney and the Police Chief who will, will present on the uh, the ordinance uh, amendments. So I've got a, some slides to go over. Uh, first, uh, to just give you some uh, background relative to uh, shelter, and what I'm referring to is the uh, emergency shelter that is available for people who are you know, on the street and that is immediately available. Um, there are other types of shelter available in the county that sometimes is called emergency shelter, but I'm not referring to that, like the recuperative care beds, uh, the River Street Shelter, there's some others like that which I can provide information on, but I'm really focusing on that truly emergency uh, shelter capacity. So historically, uh, we've had, uh, on a year-round basis, about 40 beds at the Poly Loft. Uh, and then in the wintertime, we would add about 100 beds. Uh, for many years, it was up at the Armory. Uh, and this is during the winter, typically between November and either March or April. Sometimes it was extended if the rainy season uh, went longer. And then, then in subsequent years, uh, at a combination of uh, the Salvation Army and the VFW. So that's been basically the historic model. Uh, then uh, in recent uh, years, we added the River Street Camp, which added 60 year-round beds uh, and can accommodate about 80 individuals. Uh, so the current model is about 155. So. Okay, so moving on to uh, the changes that have been made uh, in uh, recent years and particularly in the past year. Uh, and with that, we now have a model of 155 year round bed. So we went from uh, looking at trying to create a more of a year round model as opposed to what we used to have before. Um, and that uh, now includes an additional 115 year round uh, beds over the historic number, number. And those are largely comprised of the River Street Camp and the Salvation, Salvation Army uh, uh, 55 beds. Uh, Polyloft again continues to be available. <coughs> Uh, Countywide, uh, when you look at all of the various shelter beds that are available, including in Watsonville, between Salvation Army, Siena House, Housing Matters, Monarch Services, New Life Community Services, uh, and there's about uh, 554, which is uh, a larger number than last winter when we had when we had 417. In addition, there's uh, about of those about 75 new uh, safe parking spaces. So there has been some improvement uh, in recent years, certainly with respect to the availability of shelter 
uh, and uh, that is very much needed and, and appreciated. A lot of this has been able to, to occur as a result of additional funding uh, from uh, the state uh, as well and, and has been coordinated through the work of the, the HAP, which has allocated money for this purpose, as well as for a variety of other uh, shelter as well as homeless prevention programs. Uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, we recognize that there is still an additional need for shelter shelter beds, that uh, it is not uh, adequate for the level of uh, unsheltered individuals that we have in our community. And Santa Cruz uh, has about 50% of all the, uh, the uh, homeless uh, population in the county. Uh, so it's a particularly uh, significant impact on our city. Uh, accordingly, uh, as you know, uh, providing shelter is, is really critical for a variety of reasons, uh, including our ability to assist individuals, to just provide you know, adequate human care and services to, for individuals, as well as to be able to address and deal with uh, uh, nuisance and complaints that occur in our community. And as a result, uh, the council at your last meeting uh, directed that uh, we come back with a couple of items, and, and the two are up here. First. Uh, that uh, uh, we uh, bring back a revision to the camping ordinance that would comply to the, with the Martin versus Boise case, uh, and that'll be presented in a few minutes. And then secondly, that a request be made to the County of Santa Cruz to increase, uh, to assist with the, uh, an increase in shelter bed capacity as quickly as possible, recognizing that uh, winter is upon us. Uh, as a result, we have had conversations with the Santa Cruz County staff, over at the CAO's office and met, we've, we've already been meeting regularly with them to look at a variety of issues that we have to deal with, including what we've put in place up to now, uh, but had additional conversations about the ability to uh, add additional shelter. They were certainly open to that. They understood the, the need uh, and were willing to discuss a variety of options that uh, are available to us. In addition, uh, we uh, sought out the Board of Supervisors uh, uh, assistance in this regard, and they too have expressed an interest in assisting the city with expanding uh, winter shelter capacity in particular. And uh, there's a letter in your packet from the uh, two board members expressing that support. So with respect to uh, needs, as I noted uh, earlier, we really have a need for winter shelter. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons why it's, it's critical. One is that uh, compared to historic uh, numbers, uh, our shelter um, vacancy rates are, while they're not at 100% every single night, and they do vary, they are at higher levels than they have been historically. And uh, the other thing that has uh, sort of occurred and we found as a result of the recent shift is that with respect to uh, the way we provide the various services to the various populations, uh, homeless population, also can be uh, a challenge. So for example, one of the advantages of having the VFW and the Lower Street Shelter, Salvation Army Shelter, was that it allows us to separate families and women and children uh, versus the general population and provide just various types of facilities for the various uh, populations. And with the loss of the VFW, it's much, much harder to do that. So there is a need as well to do that, uh, to provide that kind of uh, uh, shelter support. Obviously, the River Street Camp has also been a addition uh, that has been helpful in terms of providing stability. That has provides 24-hour um, shelter services, which is an addition that we haven't had uh, in many years. And so uh, there is, uh, as I noted, a, a need for additional shelter uh, capacity, and we need to continue to work on that and uh, staff certainly is ready to, and has discussed a variety of options that we think are available that we can work with the county to implement uh, fairly quickly. Uh, the other uh, need that we have is we also need a uh, availability of what we call on-call beds. And that is a, a number of beds that are available on an as-needed basis, particularly as situations arise, uh, particularly in the evenings, uh, so that if there, are, there is an issue, somebody needs emergency shelter, or there is a complaint and police is called out and they can assist somebody with, uh, first of all, they need to be able to, to contact the shelter and find out what the capacity is, but then also just have some availability of beds so they can help individuals really uh, as needed uh, in, on an on-time basis. 
a real-time basis, uh, which is something we don't have a system <coughs> like that. So that is, a, we believe, is a great need. And again, we'd, 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 work, we'd wanna work with the county to, to create those. And then finally, the other thing that we've discussed earlier uh, this afternoon that we recognize is a critical need is that we need to relocate River Street Camp as a result of the water project that'll start there in March. And again, there too, we do have options that we've identified relative to, to relocating that. We are confident that that can happen, but we also need the assistance of the, of the county uh, to work directly on doing that. Because again, there's opportunities there to do that in such a way that perhaps we could even increase capacity of, of our shelters. So those are really the, the, the critical needs and issues that we're focusing now. And um, I'd be happy to answer any questions with respect to shelter uh, capacity. Uh, and if not, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, city attorney and the police chief. Thank you. Do any of the council members have questions about the shelter capacity or do you want to reserve questions until the end? Okay. Do you have a question or would you like to reserve your question? Oh, I mean, I have, I have questions about it, uh, so thank you. Um, so it's wonderful to hear about the county's intention on more winter shelter, which is always <coughs> good. Thanks for the short presentation on that. Just curious, uh, knowing the historic winter shelter that we've had and lost because of the VFW and other situations, why are we only addressing this issue now as opposed to say two and a half or three months ago knowing that we were going to be getting 10 million dollars from the state because you have to excuse me a 137 bed increase and 10 million dollars seven million dollars for uh from the state because three million is allocated to other stuff why so long and now it's raining well i want to point out that the the level of shelter capacity that we have now is significantly more than what we've had in the past. I, again, I recognize that it's not adequate, but certainly it is uh, significantly more than we had because we went from a model where we only had 40 year round and only 100 uh, in the winter to a model where we have, you know, 160 or so year round. So that's, you know, that alone adds significant uh, cost uh, <coughs> to be able to provide those services because uh, uh, you have, uh, again, year round as opposed to just part of the year. In addition, the River Street Camp uh, model uh, is also uh, more, more costly. It's a 24 hour services. It also provides for you know, connection to services. Uh, so a combination of uh, adding more capacity uh, on a year round basis uh, increased the cost of, to, to do that. So that's one uh, big portion. Also, with respect to the funding that came from the state, there's a variety of uses for that. Part of it was uh, allocated to the acquisition of property that where we wanna create a permanent navigation and shelter center, and that's the Seabrook property. So part of it went to that, and part of it also went to other shelter uh, programs like the Safe Parking <coughs> Program, as well as other homelessness prevention programs. So it was allocated amongst a variety of different uses. Uh, and there was an improvement uh, with respect to <coughs> emergency shelter capacity. However, I think we all recognize that it's not uh, sufficient and there's an interest in, in doing that. Uh, and also we didn't uh, anticipate particularly, like for example, the issue of that we're having with the, uh, uh, the, the populations, uh, 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 the conflicts with the, the women and children as, as we're having now. And the use of, has actually gone, gotten higher than in pre past years. Councilman Brown. Uh, yeah, I have two <coughs> questions. One is kind of a logistical question related to a recording of this discussion. Uh, we received a communication about uh, making sure that this information from your oral report was included and the request was to have it in our minutes, but I'm just wondering if we can address that and, and get this PowerPoint so that that information is available to people. Um, who yes, yes, I'll actually. Afterwards but who could, don't necessarily can't be here tonight and don't want to sit through watching Absolutely, and our practice is actually to attach all of our presentations to um, our, uh, in the minutes, yes. So Thank they'll you. be included, yes. And then my uh, other question is, um, it's great to hear about the work that's happening to try to bring additional uh, shelter space online. And I'm just wondering <coughs> if you um, have any, if you anticipate, like when you anticipate getting back to us, if there are decisions we're gonna be asked to make, um, when will we know? Because it started to rain today, which reminded, and got very cold. So it reminded me certainly, and probably many others, that this is urgent. Our hope is that we can have uh, something for you by your next meeting or sooner. Um, you know, again, our, our conversations are ongoing and we have some viable options that we're exploring. Again, we wanna, uh, in the interest of just trying to be able to do our due diligence and to move forward on some uh, uh, options, you know, we wanna kind of 
keep them, uh, not make them public at this point, again, so that we can do that due diligence, but then come back to you. But it will require council direction, also board support. They've expressed it, uh, but I think we can move fairly quickly. Just, just one question. Um, I know we've asked about this in the past, but is it possible, and I see some statistics in our report, but is, is, is it hard just to like every day uh, or maybe every week just get a breakdown of how many folks are, have stayed at the Salvation Army, River Street uh, Camp, uh, and Laurel Street? I guess, oh, I mean, uh, VFW. So is, that, is, is that possible to do like every week you just get that count? And, th and then maybe a fourth category like people that we couldn't house um, that were, that needed shelter. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know we've made a request uh, to, because uh, that was a, a council request. I think we've made a request over at the county to, pro to see if they can provide us with more, more up-to-date uh, uh, shelter numbers. Um, I don't think Ralph is here. I think he's the one that's been working on it. Uh, I don't know if you have an update, Ralph, uh, on that. Um, but we're certainly uh, obviously willing to provide you with our, as many updates as, as, as we can. Thank you. Uh, Ralph DeMarricott with the city manager's office. We have reached out to the county for regular updates. Um, we also do get uh, daily updates from the um, uh, the shelters and we could share that with you and we do use them um, um, uh, in, um, in our programming efforts. Um, so for each um, of the two shelters right now, uh, the daily average vacancy is about a handful and it changes from about eight to four and um, some nights it is at full capacity, uh, but that changes on a nightly basis and um, we'll be sure to get those updates to you on a more regular basis. And something that frequently comes up is uh, somebody is uh, illegally camping or camping in a place that it's not a good place, uh, instead of getting ticketed, it's maybe it's two o'clock in the morning, is it possible for a police officer to take that person to one of those three shelters knowing that there's a bed space available? Uh, you, you know, I will um, leave that to our uh, chief of police maybe answer. Yeah, thank you. Wake up, Andy. <laughs> All right. Uh, all right, we'll go ahead and ask that you maybe not um, provide comment from the ca from the uh, chamber comments. We'll go ahead and ask our chief of police if he wants to respond. I do know that's partially the recommendation that's before us this evening in regards to holding uh, some spaces for uh, officers to have available if need be. But if you want to speak to it, you're welcome. Certainly, there's always that possibility that we could transport somebody to a shelter uh, given a variety of circumstances that may uh, factor into that. But uh, yes, we can do that. <coughs> Would they take them at two o'clock in the morning? Because I've heard people say, no, they just, it just wouldn't, won't happen, doesn't happen. Yeah, I think that's what part of the request that we have, that we currently don't have a good system where the police can in real time check <coughs> as far as uh, shelter capacity and then transport individuals. That's the piece that we need to really work on. That's uh, an immediate need. I think certainly police has the information on where shelters are available and they provide that to individuals as they confront them. But we don't have a system where we can in real time find out what the capacity is and then and then make arrangements for individuals to then be transported there or, 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 or directed there is, is appropriate. Thank you. We'll go ahead and then uh, shift over to the remainder of your presentation if you like at this time. Mr. Condotti. Yes, thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the City Council. <coughs> we have a PowerPoint as well, so I'll wait for that to work. <laughs> Is it Tony? Camping ordinance, right? <laughs> we call it karma. So I'm going to talk about the draft ordinance that's on your agenda for consideration this evening, uh, an amendment to chapter 636 of the municipal code uh, pursuant to the council's direction. Um, I'll start by talking a little bit about how we got to where we are <clears throat> in September of last year, the Ninth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals decided the case of Martin versus the City of Boise, uh, a challenge to the City of Boise's ordinance prohibiting camping out of doors on public or private property. Um, at that time, we analyzed uh, this, the Martin decision in the, in, and our municipal code in light of the Martin decision and uh, the police department in consultation with my office suspended enforcement of chapter 636 because we recognized right away that um, what, the, what the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals held was 
uh, the problematic aspects of Boise's ordinance, um, we, ha we had the same issues that we had to grapple with. Uh, so that um, decision, um, in some respects, gave rise to the, the Ross encampment <coughs> that um, the council dealt with earlier this year. <coughs> and in April, the city council um, uh, did a couple of things. First, it directed the city staff to close down the, the Ross encampment um, it also uh, adopted a set of standard operating procedures that were um, based on the Martin case and other um, federal district court cases that uh, have interpreted it since it was initially issued uh, to address some of the uh, due process notice uh, and property rights questions that are raised uh, when, a, when an encampment of that sort is dismantled. So the council adopted standard operating procedures that were utilized in uh, the closure of the, um, the, the gateway encampment or the Ross camp. Uh, and it also directed or adopted as formal city council policy, the um, chief of police's practice of suspending enforcement of chapter 636 pending uh, an amendment of the municipal code to bring it into conformity with the Martin case. Um, at the last meeting, the city council then directed my office to work with the police department and the city manager's office on bringing forward an amendment to the camping ordinance that conforms to the requirements uh, or to the decision of Martin versus Boise. Um, so that is uh, what is before you tonight. I just wanna emphasize that this uh, is not an in intended to, well, what this is intended to do is narrowly respond to the specific direction of the city council. This is a proposed approach that we believe is consistent with the Martin case, um, but the city council can make modifications um, to the ordinance that we propose. Uh, this is our suggested approach. So the holding of Martin uh, in essence is that so long as there is a greater number of homeless individuals in a jurisdiction than the number of available beds and shelters, the jurisdiction cannot prosecute homeless individuals for involuntarily sitting, lying, and sleeping in public. That is, as long as there is no option of sleeping indoors, the government cannot criminalize indigent homeless people for sleeping outdoors on the property, on public property, on the false premise that they had a choice in the matter. So that seems like a sweeping uh, ruling by the Ninth Circuit, but the, but the court also immediately thereafter narrowed uh, that a uh, somewhat general uh, statement, and I cannot read that. Um, it states, naturally, our holding does not cover individuals who have... Who do have who access. Access. <laughs> access to adequate... Oh, do you want me to read it? <laughs> uh, I can pull it up on my laptop where it's very legible. Access to adequate... I just want to read it because I don't think members of the public are probably going to be able to read that either. <laughs> Naturally, our holding does not cover individuals who do have access to adequate temporary shelter, whether because they have the means to pay for it or because it is realistically available to them for free, but who choose not to avail uh, themselves of it or choose not to use it. Before it goes on, nor do we suggest that a jurisdiction with insufficient shelter can never criminalize the act of sleeping outside. Even where shelter is unavailable, an ordinance prohibiting sitting, lying, or sleeping outside at particular times or in particular locations might well be constitutionally permissible. Um, the reason why the court didn't address that issue uh, head on, but just uh, made a general statement like that is that that was not uh, the issue before it. And so, but we took guidance from the language of Martin, specifically um, the general holding, as well as these narrowing uh, statements and incorporated that into the ordinance that's before you tonight. So now I'm gonna go over the proposed amendments and, I'll, and the, the format here is to provide you with the current uh, camping ordinance language. And this is just a general uh, summary of the ordinance language that's uh, in your packet uh, and a comparison to what is proposed. So the current ordinance chapter or section 636 Zero one zero uh, prohibits in the city on public or private property sleeping between the hours of 11 p.m. to 8.30 a.m., 
setting up bedding between the hours of 11 p.m. to 8.30 a.m., and setting up a campsite anytime, and those terms are all defined in the code. Uh, new section 636.020, um, well, let me take a step back. What we've proposed in the new ordinance is to distinguish between camping that occurs during daytime hours and encampments that are set up uh, during the nighttime. Um, the sound just changed. <laughs> Uh, new sec section 636.020, daytime camping prohibits establishing or maintaining encampments between 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. Uh, and requires a warning and a reasonable opportunity to remove belongings before a citation is issued. Um, I will add that uh, I've distributed and there are additional copies that are available to members of the public to review of a new revised version of section 636.020 that takes into account some uh, correspondence that the, city's, the city council's received since the posting of the agenda, and I'll go over that when we, when we get to it. Uh, new section 636.030 prohibits sleeping or setting up an encampment between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. Um, so how does that uh, take into account the language of the Martin versus Boise decision? Well, the current ordinance, uh, which was amended most recently, I think in 2006, by the addition of section 636.055, states that uh, it, if a citation is issued when the winter shelter uh, at the National Guard Armory is full, um, then there's an exemption for vi violation if a person is on a current waiting list for shelter at the Homeless Services Center or River Street Shelter and requires my office to dismiss citations issued in the above, uh, in those circumstances. Uh, and the way we implemented that direction was to check in with the Homeless Services Center uh, when we received citations for violations of the camping ordinance. And if a person's name appeared on that list, then we just no filed those citations or, or if we uh, discovered after the citations were filed, we uh, asked the court to dismiss them. The new uh, proposed ordinance with respect to nighttime camping uh, incorporates the language of Martin versus Boise and states that it will not be enforced against persons experiencing homelessness if there are a greater number of homeless individuals in the city than available shelter beds and at the time a citation issued, is issued, the person has no actual and immediate access to shelter. So what this uh, sets up is a process whereby if a person who is camping in violation of the nighttime encampment uh, restriction uh, is contacted by a police officer uh, before a citation can issued, the police officer would have to check with available shelter facilities, determine if they have space available, um, refer that person to uh, the available shelter and offer them the opportunity to um, to avail themselves of it and to, to go to the shelter um, before a citation can be uh, issued. Current ordinance uh, also has several uh, circumstances in which camping is permitted, uh, specifically camping areas designated, they're designated for, for camping, uh, camping events authorized by the Parks and Rec Recreation Director pursuant to a different section of the code Camping events authorized by the city council per the same section uh, with respect to the parks and rec director or camping in the rear yard or enclosed side yard of a residence with the consent of the owner or occupant. Uh, camping in a church parking lot in a licensed and registered vehicle, but the code limits that uh, provision to three vehicles in a, a given parking lot uh, or parking lot of a private business with the permission of the owner and tenants. Uh, and that provision restricts the number of vehicles to two. Um, also, it permits camping in a residential off-street driveway, uh, but is limited to one vehicle and three days per calendar month. The proposed ordinance uh, largely mirrors uh, section 636.020. Um, this is section 636.040, but it also authorizes the city council to um, uh, allow camping events uh, in specific locations by resolution. 
Uh, I would also just point out that uh, the council received a request from the Association of uh, Faith Communities, which um, manages the uh, parking lot uh, shelter program on church parking lots. And they have requested that the council consider increasing the limit uh, on vehicles parking in church parking lots from three to five. Uh, the cur current ordinance permits camping in city parks uh, with a permit from the Parks and Rec Director, um, and it attaches several conditions to that, such as the provision of sanitary facilities, liability insurance, um, <coughs> refuse collection, that sort of thing. But it limits camping events uh, for more than three nights in any calendar year, uh, except in conjunction with some habitat or park restoration uh, project. New section 636050 also largely mirrors the current language, but allows the city council to authorize camping events. Um, they're not limited to three, day, three days in any uh, calendar year. That's a type, uh, an error in my PowerPoint up there. Current ordinance provides that a violation, uh, initial violation is cited as an infraction and the ordinance specifies a $20 fine or eight hours of community service. Proposed ordinance uh, largely mirrors the current language but reduces the community service hours to three. Um, the current ordinance also makes a, uh, as a declares a misdemeanor, a person who is cited uh, for first offense and then is subsequently cited within 24 hours. Um, but it's not applicable to the sleeping portion of the ordinance, only to the <coughs> setting up an encampment uh, language. Proposed section 636070 uh, declares a, a misdemeanor, a subsequent violation within 48 hours, so it extends the time period which in, within which a misdemeanor citation can be issued, but it is not applicable to a violation of the overnight camping restrictions. So that would continue to be citable as an infraction. I mentioned at the outset the standard operating procedures which are intended to provide uh, due process to individuals who are contacted by the city and who are required to dismantle or remove uh, a, a, an encampment that's, that's made illegal under the ordinance. The current language authorizes city officials to remove any encampment found an immediate threat to health and safety uh, forthwith. And for occupied encampments, uh, also requires a warning and an opportunity to remove the campsite forthwith. And that forthwith language is potentially problematic under uh, principles of due process. Uh, the new language requires the development of <coughs> standard operating procedures similar to those adopted by resolution of the council in April to ensure that due process is provided when an encampment is removed and personal property is taken into custody. And the reason why we're recommending the development of new standard operating procedures um, is that those that the council considered back in April were specifically drafted with the intent of addressing the gateway encampment situation and we've found in the months since that they don't really work in all circumstances. So what we envision is working with staff and the police department to prepare a new set of standard operating procedures that looks at various different circumstances and may have different timelines for providing notice um, and, and that sort of thing that are more tailored to different types of circumstances that might be encountered out in the field. It authorizes the removal of attended and unattended encampments, but only after providing notice and an opportunity to remove the equipment and personal belongings. It requires posting of notice of removal and an opportunity to retrieve personal belongings that are not deemed health hazard, a contraband or evidence of a crime or garbage. And uh, for items that are not removed by uh, the, the occupants of an encampment, it requires that the city store specified personal effects, essentially anything of value that isn't considered a biohazard or, or um, clearly is, is not something that's intended to be kept. Uh, and pursuant to existing state law requires the storage for at least 90 days. 
So what would happen is the site would be posted before uh, the, the encampment is removed. And it would again be posted after with notice indicating that the property has been taken into custody and instructions on how it can be retrieved. The recommendation is that the council uh, consider the ordinance that's before you for introduction with further amendments to section 636020. Uh, that's a typographical error on the PowerPoint. Also consider the uh, AFC request to increase church parking lot vehicle limit to, to five. Um, I was remiss, I did mentioned in the staff report, in the, in the report that um, there was a presentation made to the catch on um, earlier in the week, or last week, and at the time the catch uh, by consensus um, asked to be provided with a draft of the SOPs before they're brought forward to the city council um, to, to have an opportunity to comment and provide their input before they're adopted and implemented. Uh, secondly, uh, that the council receives input from the catch and the community on designated allowable sleeping areas for those unable to accept shelter available to, to personal circumstances. I didn't <coughs> repeat that in the report because it didn't deal directly with the ordinance, but is really more geared towards um, the city manager's portion of the presentation. And uh, that the, the council receive input from the catch and the community on more allowable car camping locations and uh, provisions. Um, I will further. So here are the amendments to section 636.020. And this, uh, these amendments are designed to uh, address concerns that were raised about the breadth of the daytime camp encampment uh, prohibition. So the new language states uh, that camping between the hours of 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. shall be prohibited if it reasonably appears based on the totality of the circumstances that a person intends to remain in the location overnight and or the person has occupied the site since before 6.45 a.m. on the date when enforcement action is taken by the police department. Um, the other addition is that uh, it states that nothing in sub, uh, subdivision A shall be interpreted as prohibiting the use of cooking methods and cooking locations otherwise authorized by law where the conditions described in subdivisions A1 or A2 are not fulfilled, or the use of blankets, <coughs> recreation equipment, or similar items for daytime use in parks, beaches, or on private property where the conditions described in subdivisions A1 or A2 are not fulfilled or the use of daytime tents in the sand areas of the beach where conditions described are not fulfilled, or the act of sleeping in public places during the daytime uh, when those conditions are not fulfilled. The conditions being um, evidence based on the circumstances of intent to remain overnight. So again, this is uh, narrowly designed to address the issues raised by the court in the Martin versus Boise decision, uh, other cases that have interpreted that decision uh, our own experience in um, litigation arising from the uh, dismantling of the Ross camp and discussions with uh, city attorney colleagues all over California about how they're um, uh, attempting to deal with the, the implications of the Martin versus Boise decision. Uh, I guess one last note is that there is a pending writ of certiorari before the United States Supreme Court um, by the city of Boise asking that the Supreme Court take up the Martin case uh, for consideration in this coming uh, term of the Supreme Court. Um, uh, a decision on whether that will occur is expected sometime in December. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so we'll go ahead and see if there's any questions um, from the council at this time, and then we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. So now's the opportunity for the council to ask questions. Councilmember Glover. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Tony. Um, so just with regards to, uh, you mentioned the SOPs and redoing them and everything. There, when we made the direction on February 3rd, November 12th, excuse me, uh, I've emphasized the importance of incorporating the conversation of the Phoenix camp that was forming behind the uh, Ross Shopping Center, and you know it was said, oh, that's uh, 
that'll be covered. But then three days later, the camp was then raided and closed by the police department. So I was just curious, uh, regarding Phoenix camp, were all of the SOPs followed? So for example, was there 72 hours given to the notice given to all of those uh, that were there? No, um, on further analysis, subsequent to the city council meeting, we determined that the conduct that was going on at the, at the location uh, behind the Ross was a, a trespass that's a violation of state penal code. Um, and we relied upon the direction that the council gave at the uh, meeting in April, at which time it directed that the Ross encampment be closed and that um, upon the closure that it not be uh, made available for members of the public to re-enter the site. Um, so at the time that the uh, encampment was reestablished or attempted to be reestablished, um, what happened was that uh, the folks who organized that uh, encampment um, broke the padlocks that the city had put on the gate and entered illegally. So we looked at it as akin to someone who entered into the city's corporate yard or the police department's uh, closed off parking lot who are trespassing. Um, so it's not the same as a camping uh, issue that arises on property that's accessible to members of the public. And so, so you're just to clarify, so you're saying that uh, we're not required to give any notice or any kind of awareness when we're moving in to remove a, a group of people that are on a site that maybe or may not be trespassing? That's right, different rules apply to someone who's trespassing than to someone who's um, simply camping on property that's accessible to members of the public. And what are the... Uh, would we need to establish new SOPs associated with trespassing in order to make it so that we were required? Because uh, maybe the next question will clear it up. Um, did Santa Cruz City Manager staff, Santa Cruz Police Department, Rangers, or members of the Fire Department instruct people to move over to the Phoenix camp subsequent or previous to the raiding and clearing? I'm not sure. I don't quite understand the question. Did any city staff or police department uh, representatives instruct people to move from their current location over to the Phoenix camp before it was closed? I, I'm not aware of that. Maybe one, one of the other colleagues here might be able to answer. I'm not aware of any instructions to do that. So where did they move from to there? It would be a question, but no, we did not tell anybody that they could go to the Phoenix camp. Okay, it's just, um, there were many people that uh, on the day of the closure stated that they had been told uh, to move from the post office over to the camp uh, the night before it was closed. So um, this, this is concerning for me, especially if we're not required to give notice to be sending people from one place to another and then closing it based off of a kind of loophole in our SOPs that doesn't require us to give them um, notice. Anyway, that's uh, that's my question. We don't need to get into the conversation yet. That's coming after public comment, which I look forward to. Um, uh, can you uh, confirm or deny the uh, older woman identified as a Miss Bonnie Hill that was found dead on Cedar Street recently? I, I don't have any information about that. Police Chief? I'm, I'm sure we investigated, but I'm not aware of the details. Uh, City Manager? I'm not familiar with the case. No. Oh, okay, um, I'm su I'm surprised it was covered uh, by uh, a news station citing two deaths recently of Ms. Cantero and now Ms. Hill. Uh, so that's interesting that no one knows anything about it. I mean, I'm aware of that it happened. I, I just don't have the details. I thought that's what you I'll wanted go, details. So. Maybe if, if you could please keep your uh, voices down or your comments to yourself. We're going to have an opportunity to hear from you. Many of you who have actually, actually requested additional time as a group. So we'll have an opportunity for now the council to ask questions. I would appreciate it if you could please reserve your time and we'll hear from you um, when public comment is available. So please continue with your Just questions. want us all to take a second and listen to that rain that's hitting the window right now. Um, so tents, let's talk about tents. So uh, the restrictions make it so you can't have a tent up in the middle of the day. So what are people supposed to do in this kind of weather during the day? I'm just curious about what that logic or strategy is. Are they expected to hover under doorways or under a bridge or what's our, what's our recommendation for folks like that if we pass these? 
amendments. Uh, one of the um, one of, one of the reasons for the proposed revised language that was just distributed this evening was to address that concern that's been raised by members of the public uh, in response to the draft and. Um, and so I, th I think we've made an effort to address that circumstance. And, and what is that? Can you just reiterate it for us? Yes. <clears throat> Does not prohibit the use of blankets, recreational equipment, or similar items for day use in parks, beaches, or on uh, private property where the conditions described in 1A or A2 are not fulfilled, or the use of daytime tents, sand areas of the beach where the conditions in A1 or A2 are not uh, fulfilled, or the act of sleeping in public places where the conditions described in A1 or A2 are not fulfilled. So, so maybe that's why I was a little confused because it says tents on the beach, but then it says recreational equipment in parks. So do tents qualify as recreational equipment? Uh, I would say so, but I think the council could clarify that further in the uh, when you have when you discuss the item. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, the other question I had uh, had to do with oh um, the the misdemeanor aspect of it. And I realize that's already in the ordinance, but uh, is it beneficial to add the criminal records to people if they get a a citation and then come back again the next day because they don't find another place to go or, I mean, what's the, what's beneficial the, to the person who's arrested for or a misdemeanor? to us or to the criminal justice system. I mean, we heard from the police chief about, uh, or in a correspondence that he put out about the, the severe lack of attendance of people that attend. Also that $20 uh, <laughs> fee that's associated with it is kind of misleading because we talked about this with the bail schedule where the $20 fee is just a, a city associated fee, but the court fees can be levied as uh, over a hundred dollars. So it's just concerning um, to to have that incorporated in here. I'm just wondering. Wow, thank goodness for generators. Um, the other question. Oh, was uh, did you see the message I would, from the? I, I, I will respond to that question. Okay. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, it's an enforcement tool that that we have available um, that gives us additional, uh, the additional ability to deal with circumstances where we have repeat <coughs> violations of the ordinance's uh, requirements. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, are you aware of- Great tool, but it is a, an additional tool. It is a tool, yes. Um, a, yes, uh, well, we can agree or disagree on the merits of that tool, <coughs> but um, have you seen the letter from the ACLU? Yes, I have. Okay, uh, I just wanna make sure that we're all aware that the ACLU, the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, and the Disability uh, Rights of California have all come out in opposition to these ordinance changes, so we should take that into consideration as we move forward. Thank you. And I would just add that the modifications <laughs> to <laughs> section 020 that are proposed this year. And have you made it. We'll have you approved. All right, we'll have an opportunity again to hear just gonna add that the modifications proposed uh, this evening are also intended to address some of the issues raised by the ACLU and others letter. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Vice Mayor Cummings, do you have a question? I just had one quick question. Um, in the slide that was on exceptions, there was a, a portion that said, police identify and offer shelter placement and an opportunity to relocate with specificity around offer shelter placement. Does that mean that the police would then help individuals like um, get to those shelter areas, or I just wanted to get this, some clarification. This around. doesn't appear on the slide, but the ordinance itself states that the police department may, but are not obligated to offer transportation. Um, so there are circumstances, I'm sure, when um, it might be convenient or or feasible to provide transportation, but the ordinance itself doesn't require it. And I guess just a follow up to that: currently, the police are not allowed, or is it just it's at their own discretion? It's at their own discretion. Thank you. Well, oh, do you have a question? Yeah, um, 
going back to the $20 fine, it, somebody said it was 198 Does that sound right? We'll have a chance to hear from you. If Mr. McHenry, if I could please have you keep your comments down, and we're gonna go ahead. I've actually allowed you to have extra time on behalf of your organization. We'll have a chance to hear from you. Again, this is the time for the council to ask questions of our staff, and then we'll have public comment in regards to hearing from the public on this. We'll go ahead and have you answer the question at this time. I, I don't have a specific figure, but that doesn't sound too out of line with, with the penalties uh, and fees that are imposed by the courts. So, and when you say um, three hours of community service, does that cover the whole 179, 198, whatever, or is it just the $20 that we levied in fine? If the court uh, uh, allowed a person to perform, or, or if the person uh, asked for community service in lieu of a fine, then that would cover the whole fine, not just the, not just the fees and penalties. And um, going back to the, Notice of removal is, um, when you put the notice of removal, how many hours do, do people have to move their stuff out? Is it 72? Uh, the current SOPs state 72 hours, um, but that's not really workable if there's an encampment set up uh, on a sidewalk in front of a business. So we plan to bring that back to the council for consideration uh, of a range of notice requirements depending on specific circumstances. I don't know if you said, or the city manager, you said conflicts with women and children population. I was just, I caught my ear. I was wondering what, what that was about. Uh, uh, <laughs> mostly what I was uh, referring to there is that uh, at the shelter uh, we have currently with respect to the Lower Street facility, um, it, uh, the way the facilities are set up, it's, it's really difficult to uh, separate uh, you know, the family and, and women from uh, the men population there. Um, it'd be nice to have a facility that could uh, be more focused on uh, providing shelter for uh, women and children, uh, and others with special needs, which was the, the approach we had used previously. So there's a need for that, and I think having extra additional shelter capacity would allow for us to, to be able to do more of that, because occasionally there are you know, situations where it's just not uh, the best uh, option to have the, the, the populations commingled, and it'd be uh, helpful to be able to have some separation. Uh, to address a variety of different issues. That that was the, the intent so, so of the are, comment. Are they commingled now at the Laurel Street or no? Yes. Okay, thank you, ma'am. All right, my understanding is we do have another presentation. Yes. Is that correct? All right, Chief Mills, you're up. We'll go ahead and have you present as well. Having trouble finding it. <laughs> Presentation got it. Well, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, this is an assessment of our assessment of uh, the quality of life issues in the uh, implementation of this policy and how it may affect behavior. Uh, as we uh, considered this and working with the city attorney's office and the city manager, uh, uh, Tony Condotti was the what, and I believe this may be the why. Uh, we think, feel it's important. First of all, uh, as we all know, this is a pretty compassionate community. But at the same time, there's a significant growing sense of frustration in many parts of the community. And uh, we all see that on a regular basis via uh, email and many other forms of communication. We are very mindful as a department that our approach must be balanced. Compassion with accountability, constitutionality with enforcement. Uh, if they get out of balance, then we, that's when we wind up having uh, difficulty. Um, I just want to throw a, a little bit of caution in here. This nor any other ordinance will solve our homeless problem. I think this, we need to state it up front and be pretty clear about that, that uh, this ordinance may affect some of the behaviors of some of the recalcitrant ones. However, overall, it's not going to stop a homelessness. We recognize that the cause of homelessness, drug addiction, mental health, and housing are not included. Uh, that because this is not in the swim lane of the city of Santa Cruz, uh, of the city of Santa Cruz. And some of the homeless uh, that I have talked to desire a nomadic lifestyle where they don't want our help. And uh, they don't want to live by the norms of our community. So therefore, uh, this, these are the laws that may become necessary. A recent article in the Los Angeles Times uh, mentioned that 95% of Los Angelinos uh, said homelessness was their biggest problem. 
Anything that rates more than traffic in LA has got to be a significant issue. Santa Cruz is not much different. Uh, we're at 93%, according to a recent survey, of either uh, somewhat serious or very serious uh, problem. Yet in Santa Cruz, interestingly enough, that uh, crime, uh, the concern over crime actually reduced. So Santa Cruzans view this as a very uh, significant and important issue, and, and we hear that on a regular basis. I did, do want to point out the uh, tension and the frustration that I hear from staff as well as community members on a regular basis. Recently, two city uh, um, workers were assaulted on Lot 27 in one day. Uh, numerous complaints of intimidation by some of the homeless community, uh, photos being taken of children, horns being honked in front of homes, refusing to leave property, encouragement to expropriate items from corporation, uh, corporations. There's also been a few cases of vigil, uh, vigilanteism that we need to point out. Uh, two men were shot with BB guns in one night by juveniles. Uh, two homeless men were shot by uh, uh, juveniles with BB guns in one night. We are currently investigating those crimes. Uh, encouragement of violence online uh, from both sides of the, of the uh, equation. We see this uh, regularly and it's something that is not acceptable to me to the men and women of the Santa Cruz Police Department, nor anybody, should be anybody in this community. Um, accountability is the issue at hand for us as a police department. I'm only talking about us as a police department. SCPD has, must, and will continue to help those who want and need help. That's part of our responsibility as human beings and as part of this community. Some people don't want the help, so the question becomes, how do we gain their compliance? And the compliance piece of that is we have not had anything that we can do with the enforcement side. That has been a source of frustration for the men and women of the police department. We understand accountability comes through the justice system and we are only the gateway uh, to that system. It's a start, it's not the end. Uh, whether they get fined or found guilty, that's a different, uh, that's not our responsibility. Policing is, however, an important element but I just want to be clear one more time. It's a misplaced focus if we're talking about solving homelessness. Uh, it's only to control the behaviors of those who um, are, uh, are not following the, uh, the norms of our society. Uh, historical efforts to solve problems have been pretty robust here in Santa Cruz. You can see all the uh, items listed on the left side. And on the right side, we've issued 11,000 citations in a, in a sh pretty short period of time with 8,700 of those going to people with no addresses. Most of those failed to appear in those citations. Those were mostly infractions that were sent to collections, which the logic of that um, is, uh, you know, escapes me. Uh, the impact on police services is substantial. A sample of calls for service uh, during day watch, 36% per of our calls related to homeless persons. That does not include reports where suspects, where the suspect identity was not known. A recent review of crime statistics in the Santa Cruz found that uh, those without an address were 14.5 times more likely to be victims and 12 times more likely to be the suspect in violent crime. These numbers do affect police availability, uh, volumes of calls for service, our response times, and reduces uh, our effectiveness because there just aren't solutions at this point that we can point to. Concerning camping, uh, and narrowly on the camping topic, our tool belt is empty. Uh, we understand that we must rigorously protect the Constitution and operate within, operate within the law. There has not been an ordinance that we can enforce. Um, we are bound by the Ninth Circuit Court of, uh, of Appeals, as, uh, as the city attorney mentioned, and, uh, but however, we can enact legislation to deal with some of these things in a thoughtful way. For the law to be effective, it has to be uh, certain, swift, and fair. Uh, one of the things we're going to do is separate two officers to get full-time attention to deal with quality of life crimes, such as theft, drugs, and complaint-driven camping. Um, it'll prohibit, uh, this law also uh, allows us to prohibit camping or sit up camp during the daytime, which is when we get most of our complaints. And then uh, demand the, uh, it also demands that we offer shelter to the homeless and allow for increased leverage for those who refuse, while at the same time protecting personal property, and we take that very serious uh, as a department. And just to close, uh, the ability of Santa Cruz to meet the challenge 
<coughs> will not come from one singular law uh, for the police to enforce, but from our collective efforts to collaborate with those who share a common vision, not of what Santa Cruz once was, but what we should be now. And uh, we're prepared to do our part and, uh, answer, and um, we'll answer certainly any questions that you might have. Any uh, questions for our chief here? Councilmember Glover. Andy, you're great in a lot of ways. I uh, really appreciate you. We've, we've connected a few times and have some shared values, especially on trying to re rejuvenate the concept of law enforcement and all that kind of stuff. So uh, appreciate the, the presentation. Can I ask why you use the term the homeless or homeless as a, I mean, it just seems, you know, language matters. And I noticed that in the slides, um, the people were refer referred to as homeless, two assaults by homeless on city staff, which is and, uh, always, of course, never okay. So I wanna keep our staff as safe as possible. But then when it was BB gunshots, it was two juveniles. So it just seems the language associated with the way that we're talking about people that are living unhoused is problematic. And it's something that I brought up previously with the term abatement for camps, because abatement's usually used for like rats and roaches and those kinds of nuisances. So as opposed to say closure of a camp or relocation of a camp or all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I was just hoping maybe, I guess the question is, can we be a little more sensitive in, in our uh, intentional language maybe in the future? It's just a request. Council Mayor Glover, of course, we can always be more sensitive. Thank you. Oh, and then one more thing. Um, interesting term of uh, terminology, the quality of life crimes, um, theft, drugs, and complaint-driven camping. Uh, can you explain the rationale around that language, the, the quality of life crimes? Well, certainly theft, drugs, are, affect the quality of life for people in our, in our community. Mm -hmm. And so does uh, complaints where people are camping because a variety of things, lack of sanitation, <laughs> lack of disposable, uh, you know, places to dispose things, the disease that can come with it. It's not healthy for the person camping either. And, right, we, right. and we clearly understand that, you know, I read your piece this morning about um, sleeping out. Thank you. And I can, can't imagine what it'd be like for that person. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, there has to be some level of, of, um, of quality of life for not only the people uh, who are houseless, but also the people who are living in this community. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, appreciate it. Any additional questions, <laughs> Councilmember Brown? I just have a quick question. Thanks for your presentation. Thanks to everybody. Uh, with respect to the request from the Association of Faith Communities to increase the number of spaces made available, um, I'm just wondering, because I think that's a great idea and um, I've been thinking about this, and I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to ask you previously, but I'd like to get your thoughts on that and also ask you if, um, if we did raise that, um, could we also suggest that exceptions could be made uh, pending kind of SCPD review, your review, where it seems like it makes sense and upon request of institutions. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Um, certainly that's, uh, you know, your decision as council members to, to make that. However, um, I think it depends greatly on the location, the, the size of the lot, the uh, facilities that are present and available, uh, and also the people that might be there. Um, and the capacity of the uh, associated faith communities to uh, correctly manage that location, uh, we want to make sure that they're able to scale uh, at, a, at, a, at a pace where they can manage that effectively so that we don't wind up losing uh, the great progress that we've made. I guess that's why I wanted to, I'm just wondering about the possibility of there being some kind of system where you can review that to make a determination if it makes sense in based upon your the police department's understanding of the particulars of a location. Yeah, we review many types of uh, permits and we certainly can do this one as well. Um, Thanks. It's a possibility. Any other questions at this time? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and move to our public comment portion of this um, evening's agenda. I had a number of requests for group um, public uh, sort of speaking time. 
And I just want to remind those that have made those requests that um, you are speaking on behalf of your group and as um, in order to ensure those that have an opportunity to speak as well, that they're acknowledging that you're speaking on their behalf and you're going to encourage those members who are here part of your group um, to um, avoid any kind of dupli duplicative language. Essentially, that's the intention of having a group presentation. So those that are here um, that are with the group, know, please know that uh, Mr. McHenry from Food Not Bombs, Mr. Norris from Huff, uh, Ms. Cool from Homeless United, uh, Ms. Falls, and Mr. Brokoff from the Santa Cruz chapter of the ACLU. Homeless Union, not Homeless United. Okay, thank you for the correction. Santa Cruz Homeless Union and um, the Santa Cruz chapter of the ACLU of Northern California, as well as Surge from Stepping Up Santa Cruz have all requested additional time to speak on behalf of your group. Um, and that is a, a component of the council policy in regards to having them um, be a united voice in that way. So that said, I'm gonna go ahead and ask that any any individual who has uh, young children, I do see there is a young child here, can come forward. You'll have up to two minutes. Then we'll go ahead and open it up to the one minute and then um, uh, go ahead and have the group presentations and then return to the two minutes. So please come forward if you'd like your full, if you'd like two minutes. Thank parent. you. Hi, my name is Crystal Sanchez. I'm the president of the Sacramento chapter of the National Homeless Union. I'm here for a very long, far away. I'm also on um, the Board of Supervisors Sacramento Homeless Organizing Committee, as well as Safe Ground. As an elected officials, it is your duty to be morally and ethically right to all of, the, all of your people. Placing this ban does not provide any type of solutions besides making temporary, by maybe temporarily appeasing some complaints and criminalizing the unhoused. It is however placing one or more stress on the homeless that are facing survival. We are in a homeless crisis. Pushing people who are already trying to survive is cruel and unusual punishment and, way, and a way to side, uh, sidestep Martin versus Boise. Systemic racism, sorry, systemic racism meaning broken policies is what has caused this crisis. It has caused a society to break and has caused failure, pitting residents and businesses against the unhoused and each other. This camping ban will further pit people as people will be shoved in front of businesses and in neighborhoods and in parks. They have the right to be somewhere. Daily moving is not an option for many. It causes further PTSD and doesn't um, allow a lot of time for wraparound services. Let's open up buildings, parking garages. Let's work on building bridges as a whole. Homelessness affects everyone. It isn't going to just go away. This needs to be a state effort, community effort. We need to treat this the way that we treat other crises, like fires. Get the resources to the people and open single occupancy shelters. Um, and then as far as your guys' uh, ban, it doesn't say about anything about people that work at night. So where are these people that are homeless gonna go during, during this time? These are things that you need to take into consideration. We are all over California and we are fighting this. My, our mayor is Daryl Steinberg, the commissioner of your guys' task force. And this is a mess. We need to do this as a state, not as this community breaking up all these ordinances. Thank you. Unless there's any other individuals with children here who wanted to address us on this topic, we'll go ahead and see if there's any individual who wants to briefly address us in the one minute time frame. Um, is there any individual who would like to briefly address the council in one minute? Please come forward. Hello, my name is um, <clears throat> Lee Labrie, and and I, I I'm going to say this from my heart, and I certainly don't want to offend anybody in this room at all. But I w I was going to ask if perhaps we could all come to a mutual agreement about the cemeteries. My my husband has recently passed away, and at the cemetery, my girls visiting his grave were were cat called and I've been yelled at and I was just hoping that perhaps we could all maybe work together to, to, to make the cemeteries a little more sacred and private to someone that, that wants to be there. And I apologize, I don't mean to offend anybody and I'm, I'm so very sorry about the trauma that Santa Cruz and everybody's under 
and the trauma around death in general, but I'm, I'm sorry, I was just hoping we could all work together for a solution, thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker, you'll have um, also one minute. I at least want to speak to the, the car camping. I, I'd like to, for, for private lots, I think the numbers were, were only five. Right now it's like two or three per lot. Like if, if somebody is allowing people to stay on their property, I think you should allow more than, however much they can, they can provide, they should be able to provide. Because where else are they gonna go? And if somebody gets impounded, like that's their last refuge before being on the street. So, so please, please work on the, the car camping ordinance. Uh, my name is Fred Antaki. I'm a commercial real estate agent here in Santa Cruz. I manage properties. I represent owners, and I also manage the building with the Santa Cruz Visitor Center is. And we've been dealing a lot with the uh, homeless or unhoused issue for a while as it affects businesses. And I know that this is a community that wants to find justice and safety for everybody. But I also know that if we don't have a place where businesses can do well, it's gonna affect the, uh, the whole city and people will leave and or they will not, they'll choose not to do business here. That said, I hope we look at other alternatives like the, uh, the city of uh, Salt Lake City has done in creating housing and building housing using federal, state, and local money to build permanent housing where there's no, basically you can move into the housing, you don't need to meet all these qualifications first. It's, it's people need housing, then they can get their act together. That's the way it works. So I'd be happy to support that any way I can. So thank you very much. Okay. Next speaker, for the one minute time frame, please come forward. Actually, I just have a question. I've been seeing other cities and other states out there building these tiny home villages. Is that something Santa Cruz can consider? Um, and if so, why haven't we done that yet? Is there any other member of the community that'd like to address us briefly before we have our group presentations? If you could please speak to the microphone. Oh, Thank you. Uh, I'm Lucero Luna, and I was at the Phoenix uh, Survival Camp on uh, uh, November 15 at 6.30. Uh, uh, we uh, told that uh, we were trespassing and we had 10 minutes to leave. I was, I was told that there were resources, and um, yeah, it was called Santa Cruz uh, Recreational Facility. Uh, I stayed there five days. Uh, I was, uh, the community bailed me out. And uh, I just asked um, the chief of police and the meals and the meals uh, earlier. I said, "Where's my basho to the Hyatt? You know that would be a resource, right?" Thank you. You want to speak for one minute? Please come forward. Hi everyone, thank you for your service to the city and. Thank you everybody for being here as part of a democracy. I'm a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz and I wanted to speak um, on behalf of the students in our community. Um, uh, just a short story, my housemate just started his PhD in neurobiology, smart kid. Um, he took a really, really bad fall on his bike this past weekend and he showed up on Sunday evening and his face was completely marred. Um, he said that he couldn't afford the $125 copay for the hospital as a student. Um, and so he waited until Monday to have a professional clean his wounds and confirm that indeed he had broken a rib. Um, by the literal skin of his face, he's gonna be able to pay rent to continue living um, with me in my house this month. Um, so there's that for him, but I beg the city council to consider um, for other people who face other accidents and um, you know where they might be ending up if they can't pay rent um, in the city. And further, um, I invite the council to consider what houseless students are expected to do with all of their stuff when they're trying to go to class and get an education. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Wanna take the one minute time for Were you interested in speaking on, on behalf of this item in one minute at this time? Please come forward. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to sort of reiterate uh, what Angel said. 
um, there's a, definitely a need for, for people to have a way that they can integrate uh, or self-organize. Um, I was at a meeting at, uh, for Mauna Kea last night and what the elders were saying was that there is a place in Hawaii that they set up that is very similar, that is all centered around sacredness. We wake up in the morning and there is a prayer and there is an intention and there is a definite need for some sort of sacred place that people can go to because I've heard many stories and the extremes that people are facing in these situations really cause them to um, need a healing space. And the spaces that we're providing in the way that they are now, I've heard from women, elder women, aunties, grandmas, that they're embarrassing, that they ruin uh, self-image. And uh, one of the elders said that our enemy is, it's not you, it's not the police, it's hopelessness. So let's bring back hope. Okay, next speaker, please. When does desperate human survival become trespass? That'll be a future court case in which the city, among others, may be implicated. Um, I've been looking after a homeless woman, a, a severely handicapped homeless woman, with the permission of the owners of the place I'm residing in. Um, she stayed at Laurel Street Shelter. There was an uproar involving some men Somebody threw a chair at her. Now she's got a big wound in the back of her leg. <sighs> Things like that. How would that woman on crutches be able to access any of these future shelters that are envisioned? I, that's why we need the, the police and other community services to take people like her to the shelter when it's available. Thank you. All right, seeing no other individuals who want to briefly address the council on this item, we'll move to our group <coughs> presentations. Um, first up is Mr. McHenry from Food Not Bombs, and you'll have up to four minutes. Um, I, well, first of all, I'd like to, you know, we talk about beds, but we really should realize these are gym mats that are on floors with your shoulders touching the people to your left and right and your feet touching the feet of the people at the other end of your gym mat. So beds is a bad, misleading term. Um, I have been in correspondence and in personal conversations with the person responsible for determining the number of available beds and total number of beds per night in, in the county and in the city, and she does not have any idea what those numbers are. So the numbers that are being quoted here are based on a fiction. Ralph does not know the numbers because no one knows the numbers because that is the fact. Um, I would also like to um, point out that uh, I received correspondence and phone calls from uh, Ben Wood. Ben Wood uh, lived on the streets for two years and received quite a number of camping tickets. Ben uh, was relieved that after two years he moved into a vehicle and had a 40 hour a week job and now his uh, wages are being taken to pay for the camping tickets that he got when he was living on the streets before he was fortunate enough to live in a car, which now he is facing the loss of because of these tickets. And, and so it's clear that the, the, the whole idea of what's going on tonight will just lead to more problems. As a person who rents, when I attempted to rent apartments the last time I was searching, I was denied uh, rental, even though I qualified in all other means because I have a misdemeanor. Um, fortunately, I didn't learn about anything else, but um, that was enough so that I was denied repeatedly accommodations. Now, if you're gonna give misdemeanors to homeless people and you're going, and they finally get to move into a car and then they finally get a 40 hour a week job, yet the city's gonna take their money I mean, what, or, and then they can't get into, and they're gonna have a misdemeanor conviction, then they can't rent any place. You know, you're just, you're waging a war against people living outside. War. It's a war. Um, my f good friend and a very dedicated volunteer with Food Not Palms, who lives outside, named Travis Wheeler, he woke up to find our other friend, 
Bonnie Hill dead on the sidewalk less than one block from City Hall two days after Camp Phoenix was evicted. It's unbelievable that we can have this discussion, that, that we can have legal ease, and, and, uh, and I wanted to inform uh, Mr. Uh, Andy Mills that there's an actual definition for quality of life crimes, and not one of the words that you pointed to on your PowerPoint presentation actually fall under that definition. Quality of life crimes, which has been what um, came out of the um, study, the kind of a phony study called Broken Windows Study, um, as actually referring to people sitting outside in, on Pacific Avenue in our case, or um, asking for money, or selling, like Eric Gardner, selling single cigarettes when he got killed, uh, not paying, a uh, fare evasion. There are all these smaller crimes, most of which are crimes, so-called, because a person cannot afford to move inside. We'll go ahead and have Mr. Norris uh, come up and speak on behalf of his group. Huff. That's, does this thing work? Ooh, okay. All right, I want to uh, congratulate the community, homeless folks, and the activists who created Camp Phoenix a little more than two weeks ago. This was Camp Phoenix, which sheltered 60 to 100 people at 50 tents at no cost to the city. They established ground space rules, entry regulations, and a code of conduct. They provided a vital space for vulnerable women and elders. They brought in toilets and hand washing stations, found food options, and as columnist Bruce Bratton said it, claimed it was, and I think accurately, set it up on territory that was and is of no use to anyone. They were drawing disabled pe folks into a mutual aid situation that also gave community Samaritan and social service access to them. Housed locals heard and came out to help, leveling the ground, left in lump condition by the city months before. Fire and law enforcement officials came out, offered advice, and most important, assisted rather than arrested or blocked this growing homeless community at first until the morning of November 15th, when police suddenly appeared and demanded everyone leave, discovering after five days that the many folks taking shelter were trespassing. Folks, as during the early rouse at Ross Camp, were given at best two days in a motel, and that only for some. Now, I've spent a lot of time in the past focusing on the city's deficiencies, some would say criminal deficiencies, but the real concern is justice and services for the most disabled and vulnerable outside, and just fairness for poor people generally. Set aside the millions of dollars wasted not reaching people in the homeless situation, the endless studies being conducted and so forth and so on. Those outside tonight and every night throughout the winter have no choice but to shelter themselves. People need to prepare how to deal with the police, how to pick up their property and move, now to work with local neighborhoods to mutually respect rights and needs. Because this council isn't doing it, it hasn't done it, and it's not going to do it in my opinion. In Berkeley, when the community kept providing support, city police finally realized it was both too expensive and too futile to go after the first they came for the homeless encampment. I would hope that homeless activists and progressives of all shades and folks in our audience here hold workshops on challenging city police abuses in court and on the streets and following indifferent city officials to their public meetings and confronting them loudly and repeatedly in real forums where they can't be hushed by a school marm voice who can threaten them with arrest or exclusion. They need our support. For years, activists have been pressing city council and the city manager for sanctuary villages as have had limited but real success in a number of cities. Camp Phoenix was formed in memory of Desiree Quintero, the lead plaintiff in the lawsuit, which campers in the earlier Ross camp. She, she died in violently windy weather in the Poganif after she and several hundred other residents were forcibly dispersed from the safer Ross camp in violation of commitments from the progressive city council majority. 
We meet on the edge of what is predicted to be a violent rainstorm, which may be the first of increasingly severe weather. The mayor, city council, and city staff don't seem able to provide the civic auditorium access for current agenda item tonight, even for a limited period of time, even though it might have been considered of great public interest. Staff under the disgraced former assistant city manager, Susie O'Hara, has repeatedly dangled promises of homeless shelter, navigation, try to stay awake, please, navigation center overflow shelter space in front of our eyes. But this winter, there's actually less shelter in spite of the misrepresentations of city manager Bernal and virtually no walk-in shelter. City Council will provide no winter survival shelter tonight, nor will it suspend ticketing for closed areas, trespass on private property, public nuisance, blocking the sidewalk or lodging laws, and those are the real laws, not the camping ordinance we're talking about that will be used Your through the winter up. and have been used through the last two years. All right. Your time is up. All right. We'll go ahead and invite up Alicia Cool um, to come and speak on behalf of her group at this time. And you'll have up to four minutes. Don't start yet. At this time, I've invited our legal counsel, Anthony Prince. He would like to go over some points. And I just wanna say that due to the negligence of this counsel, with or without a fancy job, I'm already the homelessness response manager, unfortunately. Um, well, good evening, uh, <coughs> excuse me, members of the council, members of the public. Uh, my name is Anthony Prince, as Alicia indicated, I serve as general counsel for the California Homeless Union and for the Santa Cruz Homeless Union. Um, I wanna say, first of all, <clears throat> I was invited to come here tonight, excuse me, I'm losing my voice, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, to observe the proceedings and to uh, state, put forward the position of the union with regard to the, uh, thank you, with regard to the uh, amendments that are being proposed for the camping ordinance. Uh, I wanted, first of all, though, to um, hand the clerk a copy of the letter. I know each and every one of you members of the council received this letter, I believe, but I want to make it part of tonight's record. So I'll give a copy of that to the clerk. Um, I uh, want to, first of all, clarify a few things, and that is that the, uh, well, let me just back up and say, uh, the uh, Mr. Condotti, made some slight alterations in the proposal based on some of the concerns that were raised in the letter that was co-signed by the Disability Rights California, the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, and the ACLU. If those, cha those changes were made within one day of receiving that letter. So to me, that suggests that the issues raised in that letter are substantial and bear quite a bit more examination. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, the letter raises the issue of uh, the ordinance, the amended ordinance would per se declare an unattended camp as a nuisance. Uh, that's a very sweeping position for the city to take. Now that was not adjusted. Uh, Mr. Condotti did not make an adjustment to the amended uh, ordinance, the proposed amended ordinance based on that concern raised by the letter. There are many, many concerns raised in the letter. I'm not gonna take my time in reiterating them, but I would suggest that the members of the council carefully review that letter. Moreover, I would suggest that the members of the council carefully read the 38 page Martin versus Boise decision of the Ninth Circuit. I, I am concerned uh, as to the gravity of decisions that may be made tonight or some other time that are not fully informed. You've, you've heard a presentation of the city attorney on what is essentially a very complex issue, complex constitutional questions, without the opportunity for the council to be informed, ask questions and receive additional information from the authors of the letter, for example. Uh, I wanna point out to the members of the city council that not only would the city council be as, a, as an entity in the city of Santa Cruz as an entity possibly be liable uh, for harms resulting from the decisions you may make tonight, but as individual members of the city council, it very well may be uh, that you might as individuals be held liable. 
the general rule of non uh, of immunity for a legislative proceeding, there are exceptions to it. And one of them <clears throat> is, is if the proceeding is actually not a genuine legislative proceeding. I would uh, posit that what's happening here is not a genuine legislative proceeding. Uh, that is if the vote is taken to uh, in favor of these amendments. I believe it's a circumvention of the Ninth Circuit, the holding of the Ninth Circuit, a form of, I'm sorry? Unfortunately, your time's up. All right, well, let me just uh, end by saying that you guys need to carefully consider the consequences here, the state created danger. You yeah. affirmatively put people in Ross Camp at risk of, of uh, harm. I have to ask you. And we had a, fat a fatality. Let's just let me make this Thank point. You. Thank, you. Thank you. And um, I, would, I, I, have to ask you to, I have to ask you to end your comment, please. Thank you. Well, I'm we not going to end. Gave you extra we actually gave you extra time. Yeah. Most, most of the public gets two minutes. We gave you four. So I'm going to have to ask you to end your comments at this time. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm just going to say that. So I'm going to have to ask you. What you're doing please. here. So what you're doing here is taking an action that will put, ask you excuse me, to put people at risk. That okay, will so, put, sir, sir, that sir, will, you've had a warning. Okay, you can silence me here, sir. But we we but gave I, you extra time. We gave your group extra time. There are other people in the audience who would like to speak. I understand that. And I, we're going to be I, I violating only, their First Amendment right to have their right just, to speak. Could I finish my Should sentence? You, we gave you extra time. I'm going to have to ask you to please step That's down. Okay. We will take your comments. But I'm That's to okay. You, I'm going to ask you to please hold Once your. Once again, I advise all the Thank members you. to carefully, individually consider what's Thank before. Thank you for your time. Before the body. Read the decisions, read Martin versus Boise, carefully read the letters, and I would encourage uh, you to invite the attorneys who authored those letters, as well as myself, to come Thank in you. and have a real discussion, because you're about to do some things which will end in costly litigation, protracted litigation, and and will very well may add Sir, to the list of I'm people ask that have you died. Again, very please. well may. That's okay. That's okay. All right. That's okay. Let me. Let me Sorry. Finish. I'm it go very well may lead to additional right, we'll harm or even fatalities. Okay. So I'm okay. trying to make this for the record. We're going to We're going to be in recess at this point. And your time is up. And that's the warning if there's any continued Sorry. outbreaks. And we're going to go on. call our meeting back to order. If I could get you to please um, quiet your voices, we're going to come back to order. I'll just briefly remind those in the audience here that it's the responsibility of the presiding officer, whoever that is, whether it's me in this seat at this time or the future mayor, to ensure that we have an opportunity for civic engagement and to do the people's business without continued disruption. And if there is continued disruption, then it's also the responsibility of the presiding officer to intervene so that we can continue to do the work of the city. And I want to remind um, Mr. McHenry and um, Mr. Prince, who I believe has stepped out, that I've issued a warning. And if there's continual disruption, I will go ahead and ask the Sergeant of Arms to, to have you leave. We had an opportunity to hear from you. We want to have an opportunity to hear from other members of the community that want to address the council on this item and ask that you adhere to the rules of decorum. And if I don't see you continuing to adhere to the rules of decorum, I will go ahead and ask you to leave. I don't want to do that. I'd like to have an opportunity to hear from everybody and I'd like to have them to be heard whether you agree with them or not without disruption or intimidation or distraction with your comments in the audience. It shows respect to your fellow citizens and I think that's the responsibility of all of us as we engage in this process. 
So as we um, left it was group presentations. I'll go ahead and invite up the next group presentation that we had a request for, and that's um, Stacy Falls and Lee Brokaw from the Santa Cruz chapter of the ACLU of Northern California. And you'll have up to four minutes, and I ask those in the audience to let them speak without uh, disruption or, um, or interference. So please go forward, you'll have four minutes. Um, thanks for having us here. We're here representing the ACLU of Northern California. And uh, we find that in general, camping bans, even with these proposed changes, attack or, uh, amount to a cruel and unnecessary attack on some of the least powerful, most vulnerable residents of the city. We urge you in the strongest possible terms to reject this camping ban, even with these proposed changes. It is undisputed that there are not enough beds in the city for all the homeless people in the city, which makes Martin versus Boise applicable regardless of whether there is a bed at that moment for that particular person. These changes would open the door to abuse. For example, it's possible that multiple people having various different encounters with different officers on different beats um, might be cited uh, on the basis that they could have taken one of those four to eight available shelter spots, and what ends up happening is it's sort of a, a shelter bed version of musical chairs. Moreover, we are concerned uh, about whether police will know at any given moment in time if there are shelter beds available. Can a person be cited even if it is impossible or impractical for the person being cited to get to that shelter space without police transport? If this provision remains, the ordinance should require the notice of an open shelter bed to be in writing, including the date, time, and specific shelter space that the officer believed was available so the information can be verified later. We also have concerns about the prohibition against daytime use of tents and other things that uh, might constitute an encampment. Um, prohibiting homeless individuals from setting up a camp from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. just guarantees that homeless people will have to live out of a shopping cart or whatever else they can find for their possessions. It is cruel to force people to assemble and disassemble their tents, pack and unpack all their belongings, particularly in the pouring rain, when it's guaranteed that everything will end up absolutely sopping wet. Moreover, Martin referred to the impropriety of ordinances prohibiting sleeping, sitting, or lying in public, not just sleeping, and was tied to the availability of shelter. It, um, a person has a constitutional right to be in public at any time. Any other reading would require unhoused persons to be in a perpetual state of standing for 15 hours per day. Furthermore, we are, we are concerned about what enforcement of this ordinance looks like. That is, how does, a, how does a police officer know if someone is homeless and hanging out in the park with a tent with the intention of staying all, no, all night, or maybe it's just somebody like Jeff Bezos having an outing in the park with a tent? How do we avoid people being profiled based on the way they look? It is very clear that there is a crisis in the avail availability of affordable housing. Camping bans do not solve this problem. They in fact make the problems worse because people end up with criminal records. That makes it even harder to find a job or to find housing or even to apply for public benefits. And these types of approaches are also really expensive. Solutions to homelessness will require extensive investment in affordable housing, job opportunities, accessibility and a range of public services, but as long as the city, police, and some of our businesses believe that the evidence of homelessness can be hidden or swept away by policing and criminalization, there will never be enough money for us to adequately, adequately address the real issues. Okay, the last speaker is Serge uh, Cagno on behalf of his group and membership that he's speaking on behalf of this evening, Stepping Up Santa Cruz. We'll go ahead and let, uh, Serge, go ahead, please. You'll have up to four minutes. 
Okay, this time I'm gonna talk louder because I never talk loud enough. Um, Bonnie Hill, who I don't know if it's confirmed it was her. Um, she, <laughs> yeah, she was a super sweet woman. She stayed at Winter Shelter a few times. Um, oh. it, I'm really sad, like if you knew her, she was a little cutie. Um, I hope you come December 19th to the Homeless Memorial. It'll be at Harvey West at 10 a.m. And we'll, uh, every year we have a memorial for all the homeless who have died in our community. Um, I'm glad that we talked about health and all policies earlier. I think that's important. And I'm glad that that is some of the Santa Cruz thinking as opposed to the bigger political thinking that doesn't make these kind of thoughts. Um, I, I wish that in this thing too, we can find some way to do it. And I, I really understand the frustration of the police and understand the city manager and the city attorney of their job. They're not social servants. They're not doing social services. None of you guys like work are right now running a shelter or doing social services either. It's not your job to get somebody into some sort of program or get somebody into housing, that kind of thing. Um, we all serve in different ways and we do different things. Um, but to design these programs that are about, it is about criminalizing a behavior because we're frustrated with the behavior. And when I hear the police chief say that they have no tools in their tool belt, I, I understand that because they're, they're policemen. They're not the, when I try to connect with somebody who doesn't wanna be in any service and the, the resistance is they're dealing with police and enforcement far more than they're dealing with social workers and outreach. If we were doing that kind of thing and when trying to meet people. So it, um, another thing that Chief Mills mentioned was some people do not want help or assistance. How do we gain compliance? So on the catch, we did a, um, a quick survey, 75 people. Why, do you not, why will you not accept winter shelter this winter? Reasons. And these are also things that it wouldn't work in the middle of the night with a policeman trying to get him into shelter. Yeah. Been kicked out. Sexual offender registry. They have lice, bed bugs, scabies, or they're afraid of getting them from the shelter yeah. and they don't wanna go. Anxiety and PTSD because they're, they're pretty close together. There's like eight inches between people a lot of the time. Uh, snoring, oh, it's crazy loud there. Can't leave at night, that drives some people nuts. Poor training by staff and feeling disrespected. Can't keep all of their belongings, stuff stolen. Having a pet that's not a service dog, can't go. Um, Non-ADA accessible bathrooms and showers and don't wanna feel the judgment for the people who are in wheelchairs and do smell like poo. They don't wanna be around people who are gonna judge them when they can't change their circumstance. They don't go to the shelter because of that. Um, and other people, head injury, stroke, heart attack, the different things that make you choose different ways. There is a lot of stuff that goes into it when a policeman is talking to somebody about, hey, we have a shelter bed for you, go or I'm gonna cite you or arrest you. Um, there's a lot that goes into that conversation and I, I hope that, I think that a lot of this stuff has to be worked out a little bit more, something smoother, an outreach team or something else that can be working with people that can be building relationships and stuff like that. Because that two in the morning conversation is not gonna go well because they don't have the, the tools to do it. They're not set up that way. They're not funded with social workers to go with them at night. Um, I'm glad that there was talk of the letter from the Disabilities Right California, ACLU of Northern California, National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. I hope you do read that because it says a whole bunch of things that were problematic with that. Um, I'm not a lawyer, I can't say which one's right. Your time is set, Serge. Yes. And there were a few recommendations from the catch, too. Time is really? Thank you. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and open it up now to the remaining public comment. Please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. Mayor Watkins, Attorney Condotti, Martin Bernal, Chief Mills, and others. You are systematically and persistently violating the civil and human rights of your constituents <laughs> who you are elected to serve just because they don't live in a gleaming mansion on the west side doesn't mean that they, the homeless don't deserve to be treated with any less dignity or be any less represented in how their government operates than millionaires or billionaires. Yeah. 
Through ill-advised efforts to sweep homelessness out of public view, the leaders of San the city of Santa Cruz have violated the majority of the articles of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights in one form or another. Here are some examples. Article one, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Article five, no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. <laughs> Article 13, everyone has the right of freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. Article 17, everyone has the right to own property alone as well as in association with others. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his property. Article 25, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. So what do I need to do? Ask the UN Human Rights to send a humanitarian mission here yeah. to respond to the dire situation that our homeless population is facing now that it's cold and raining with winter coming soon and the city's response is woefully inadequate. And a couple of more uh, comments. Uh, restricting sleeping uh, at night, only at, at night, ser uh, does not serve people who work at night. And how many city staff have been assaulted by homed people? Next speaker. <laughs> This has been an amazing evening so far, and what I wanna talk about is quite a bit different, and in some ways I'm addressing it to everyone who's sitting up here, but it's not mostly what we've heard. Um, I was away last night. I arrived about 12.30 this afternoon, very tired. It had started to rain. The heat was off where I lived. It was quite cold in my house, so I turned on the, the TV, wanted to see what was happening here, and the first thing that struck me was how bundled up all of you were. Scarves, sweaters, heavy coats, and tonight, and every time you meet, you are acting on the fate of a whole lot of people in Santa Cruz who are unhoused. I want you to think about that. There you are with your warm things, you know, me too. And um, you are part of a group of people to which I belong, and we are called the housed privileged. It's kind of like white privilege, only it's growing up with the knowledge that you probably always will have a roof over your head if you want it. You might wanna go camping, you might wanna hitchhike across the country, but you're privileged, and I am privileged. <coughs> And I think this is so important to remember on a night like this, every time you meet, every time these rules come up for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to speak about was how trespassing gets in the way of everything else that has been talked about. But many other people have addressed that and maybe I'll put it in writing to you because I think it's an important issue that really hasn't been made central. How every, all the pro public, property in this town is now a park and off limits. Members of council, my name is uh, John Hall and um, I'm a professor of sociology at UCSC. Uh, I wanna take a step back from a lot of the discussion that's been really eloquent and a lot of people have said far better than I what social scientists have said. I also wanna point to what uh, Chief Mills said. You're not going to solve the homeless problem with this ordinance. Uh, I would go further than that. You're going to increase the homeless problem with this ordinance. And I'm, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm just going to read from the Oxford University Press Journal Social Problems from a recent abstract of an article on criminalization of poverty perpetuates homelessness. 
this research examines how anti-homeless laws produce various forms of police interactions that fall short of arrest, yet have wide-ranging impacts on the urban poor. Their analysis shows that uh, the mechanisms through which consistent punitive interactions, including move-along orders, citations, and destruction of property, systematically limit homeless people's access to services, housing, and jobs, while damaging their health, safety, and well-being. Their findings also suggest that anti-homeless laws and enforcement fail to reduce urban disorder, but create instead a spatial churn in which homeless people circulate between neighborhoods and police jurisdiction <laughs> rather than leaving public space. They argue that these laws and their enforcement which affected the majority of the study, the participants that they study, constitute a larger process of uh, perversive criminalism, pervasive criminalization, uh, consistent punitive interactions with state officials that rarely result in arrest, but that do material and psychological harm. In short, you're not solving the homeless problem. You need to do that. Next Uh, Darius Mosin again. Uh, first, I want to say I think the camping ban, as rewritten, is very fair, very compliant from what uh, our city attorney tells us. Um, but I have to look around. I look at the activists. I mean, I look at the majority of the homeless folks in this town. I look at their advocates, their advocates, uh, activists. They all have one thing in common. <clears throat> They're white people. This is a white people problem, complete with white privilege. It's like the most perverse sense, perverse. We'll go ahead and pause the time. We're gonna go ahead and let you speak. Ms. Cool, if you please could keep your comments to yourself. We've had an opportunity to hear from you. Whether we agree or disagree, we're gonna let listen to other people. And I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and give you a warning. It's multiple times I've I had to stop the meeting to allow this process to ensue. Everybody has an opportunity to speak. As long as they adhere to the rules of decorum, we're gonna go ahead and allow them to speak even if we disagree with their comments. Please, pr Ms. I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna go ahead and ask those in the members of the community to not speak up. This is this person's opportunity to speak at this time. Go ahead. I mean, look to our Latino neighbors. They come here with the obstacles, some of them with an obstacle of being undocumented. They're not looking for a voucher to the Hyatt. They're not looking to camp on the Water Street Bridge for three months. They're not looking to, uh, for a homeless garden project. They have their garden project. It happens to be called Driscoll Strawberries at 6 a.m. five days a week. Okay, I, I will go ahead and ask you to leave. I will go ahead and ask you to leave. All I say is. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to pause your comments. Mr. Kondati, my understanding is that this is something I need to allow to have heard at this time, is that correct? I didn't hear anything in the comments that would provide the council with the ability to cut off the speaker, no. Okay, so we'll go ahead and allow you to finish your comments. Go right ahead. All I'm saying is instead of stomping, clapping, cutting locks, breaking going, breaking fences, engage with the Latino community. Figure it out, understand how they how they get, get through living here in the most expensive housing market in the country. And any extension, expansion of this camping ban is simply an expansion of white privilege. Thank you. <clears throat> next speaker, you'll have up to two minutes. You'll have, next speaker, you'll have up to two minutes. Mr. Nice. Mr. Norris, if people are leaving, please don't uh, intimidate with your comments after they are able to speak. Go right ahead. I need to be direct. I'd please be free to speak. Go for it. My name is Elise Casby. I have been studying the homeless issue firsthand since 2009. I was residing in Berkeley and I started coming over to Santa Cruz. The first thing I want to say is that I strongly urge all the city council members to re reject, firmly reject the proposed changes to this ordinance. My m most basic plea to you is a plea to please have mercy. I want you to know something else. My brother 
was developmentally disabled at birth. My mother had multiple sclerosis. I became homeless because of domestic violence of my father. I'm not prepared to go into it more now. I'm also not prepared to detail what I experienced at the shelters in Santa Cruz, but it was really awful. That's all I can tell you right now about my personal situation. I also began a career in the mental health field, which was pretty much changed with the advent of Ronald Reagan's dissembling of our public mental health system. So the reason I'm asking you for mercy tonight is because I know from firsthand experience that most of the homeless people that are out there are Vietnam vets who are suffering from PTSD, are homeless people, many with very severe mental illnesses such as schizophrenia. Many have uh, severe physical disables, disabilities. We need to stop using the police force as a point of contact with the homeless people. This absolutely has to stop. It's so frightening in the context of where we are with such laws as the National Defense Authorization Act, removal of many of our civil rights under this rubric of terrorism. I'm terrified right now of going to jail, but I have to say that I am sincerely contemplating civil disobedience in the face of this, these ordinances. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, Council, Brent Adams, not speaking for the Warming Center right now. Uh, where are the other agencies who get the multi-millions of dollars for homelessness? They're not in this room. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Federal government says all, this, all the millions and billions that go to homelessness have to follow a housing first uh, paradigm. And all, most of them, that's why we see the, the Homeless Services Center changing to housing matters. Wherever money pulls up, that's where programs exist. Where, the, where all the money is in homelessness in this country, they're not in this room. So the people are freaking out because th th there's really little else that can, can happen. I see a, a division on this, this board. You are all the people of the community. This is the government, it's a factory. Mr. Condotti said he's in contact with many other cities. This is, so it's, it's not about people, They're, they own things, they own the city, we just live in it. But what's true, uh, between the protest tenancy, take back Santa Cruz County uh, syringes and wanting more police, and uh, our, us activists wanting to, to end camping bans and things, there's a space in the middle for us people to actually benefit and end homelessness authentically, not handing homelessness through yada, 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 but actually, uh, and Drew uh, uh, brought a lot of things in uh, uh, earlier in, in his uh, time here. I wish that uh, the more moderate uh, uh, council people would have championed it, which is transitional encampments, safe sleeping zones, uh, parking programs, all very robust, warming centers, finally the mythological uh, 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 navigation center, which really picks people who have access to money and puts them on the pathway to, to housing. Pathway to housing is actually actually a golden bridge to nowhere. We're, it's a huge lie, it's a huge for, farce, and we're all stuck in it. It's a train running out of control, and all we can do is just scream and, 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 and we're upset. But through scalability, we can actually demand that we provide enough shelter beds for every single person who comes through the door. I ask, and forgive my pretzel logic, I don't know what I'm asking here, but I think if from the bottom rung, you have to, uh, help support something like Warming Center uh, uh, and, and other programs like that. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Good evening, council members. My name is Steve Schnarr. On my way to the to City Hall this evening, I had to go over the bridge in San Lorenzo Park, the, the pedestrian bridge. There were several people trying to get a tiny bit of shelter from the rain under the bridge. It was extremely windy, it was dark, it was cold, it was well before the hour at which it would be allowed to be sleeping. Um, this conversation, which is the perennial Santa Cruz conversation, it, str it strikes me a little bit like in Washington when we have a Congress full of millionaires making decisions about working people, and you'll see periodically in certain states or you know, groups full of men who are making decisions about abortion. So we have, uh, you know, year after year, people who have the ability to have shelter every night and warmth making decisions in which the people who are without are um, there 
the quality of life of the town, it, it, it considers those people kind of just an impact on um, our quality of life, which is the people who have wealth and, and uh, in stable housing. Um, so I understand there are legitimate concerns and conflicts that happen when hundreds or thousands of people are forced to use public space as their private space. I've had plenty of personal uh, encounters that reflect what Chief Mills is, or one of the other presenters showed, which was that uh, people who are unsheltered commit crimes at a higher rate. I've had uh, threats and problems, but the, to me, the threshold of human rights is everybody deserves to have basic dignity, shelter, clothing, and if we can't provide that first, uh, it's, it, it's immoral and unacceptable to uh, criminalize uh, what for us we take for granted what other people are trying to get by. Brian O'Neill, attorney and citizen. I would like to make three points. First, the ordinance language is irrelevant to respect with respect to constitutionality. In fact, the city of Boise tried this exact tactic by adding language to its camping ban that law enforcement officers shall not enforce when there is not available shelter space. And the court found that the language was not controlling. The existing ordinance is not unconstitutional due to wording, but lack of shelter space. This ordinance runs the risk of signaling that enforceabil enforceability is valid when enforceability of the camping ban has been and will continue to be whether there is adequate shelter space. The ordinance does not set a protocol for determining if and when there is adequate shelter space, creating additional administrative burdens to investigate on a daily and case-by-case -case basis in real time when we just heard that that's not possible. Second, the Boise court did not prevent municipalities from implementing valid time and place restrictions, but constitutional jurisprudence suggests that such restrictions must, quote, leave open ample alternative channels to exercise one's rights, while this ordinance merely continues the same citywide ban as before. I would respectfully suggest that the council direct your staff to do the difficult work of crafting a more nuanced and constitutionally valid time and place ordinance that identifies the specific areas where involuntary sleeping will and will not be allowed. Finally, I respectfully request that the council does not, uh, if they do adopt the ordinance, add language specific specifically stating that violations are a civil infraction that do not establish probable cause to search and seize individuals merely for the act of sleeping. Adding such language is necessary to specifically protect individuals' Fourth Amendment rights, uh, in, in particular because of past statements from the city attorney and the chief of police with respect to the Main Beach camping ban. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is Barbara Riverwoman. Um, I'm a preschool teacher. I was a preschool teacher for 15 years, and I'm appealing to you now as a teacher and to ask you to remember the classrooms that you were in, what worked and what didn't work. I especially appeal to you, Mayor Watkins, as an educator, a teacher, and someone who cares about children. Rules upon rules upon rules upon rules, every good teacher knows that doesn't work. The one thing that I learned over 15 years as a teacher is that relationships work. We have to build relationships with children. We have to learn to understand them, respect them, listen to them, talk to them. I wanna thank Chris and Drew and Sandy for their presence at the Ross camp when we were down there. They were there, they were talking to people. They were relating to them. They heard their stories. I did not see the other four of you down there. Maybe you were there. I would like all of you as council members, especially the four of you, to apologize to them that you can't do better. Maybe we can't do better. It's a systemic problem. It's a national problem. It's a horrible problem. We're all griefed by it. Nobody's happy. Why can't you apologize to the people in this room who are going to go out into the streets some night, tonight, in the rain and the cold? I hated to come here tonight. It's cold and rainy and freezing. 
I had the I had the pleasure to meet Lucero the other day and have a long talk with her. It was wonderful for me to have that talk with her, to learn about her life, to learn about her life in Mexico, about the hardships she went through coming from extreme poverty, about how she became an early childhood teacher trainer, family daycare trainer. This makes a big difference to me. Let's build relationships, not make more rules. You have an important question to ask yourselves, and that's how you plan on treating the most vulnerable members of our community. You have a choice tonight. You can choose, if you want to, to listen to the homeless women and men who speak here. Listen, really listen to their concerns, and you can choose to work with them to accommodate their most essential and basic needs. That would be the approach of a rational and compassionate human being, which I can only assume many of you claim yourselves to be. The other option that you can choose is to listen to the familiar and the privileged voices of the affluent. By even allowing this ordinance to continue existing, your intentions become entirely transparent. The plan is to torture and displace the people experiencing homelessness through endless citations, sleep deprivation, and thievery. You plan to assist systematically criminalize the self-organization and survival of the victimized homeless people in Santa Cruz with the end goal of kicking them out of their own city. It's reasonable to ask ourselves who the real criminals are here. Are the criminals the homeless union who are trying to live in solidarity and build a tolerable existence for themselves? Or are the criminals the members of this community working to crush the efforts of the homeless union for their own benefit? Are the criminals the poor? Or is it the city manager as he oversees the closure of an autonomous shelter for the homeless and intends to maintain an anti-camping measure that is so extreme it will not even allow people to sleep in their cars or RVs? I'd like to remind you that our enemy is poverty. Our enemy is not the poor. Hello, I'm Nancy Crusoe, and um, what's on my mind tonight uh, is the immediate need for a place to be. I was at the uh, storage program tonight working before coming over here. It's part of Warming Center program. And I had to turn out a man and woman and it was the rain was pouring and, and the wind was blowing fiercely and they were thanking me for staying late to help them get stuff for the night. And I did want to cry because they're walking into the night and it's going to be like this several days this week. Uh, I think there may be one day of respite when the sun will shine and it doesn't rain. But um, tomorrow, on Thanksgiving, Warming Center will open because of a lot. Of, we're going to have a heavy rain tomorrow, and we will continue to open probably uh, during the rainy period. But taking. The, the gap that's obviously created by the lack of shelter space, and I'm not advocating shelter as the solution. I've heard, not, you know, I've heard so many, I wouldn't want to be there, okay. Um, but there's people who won't be going anywhere. And simply, we simply have to have a place. We simply have to. So I am speaking uh, for the warming center. I would like some support. I think we will be filling that gap. Uh, and, and, and I know that it's gonna take a while for you to get together to have more spaces, but we will start day after tomorrow on Thanksgiving. We are primarily volunteer run, and we really do need support from the city. Um, if I have a, a, another minute, I want to say, the Oh, shoot. Members, okay. You're welcome to leave your comments with us. You're, you're welcome to oh, leave the well, comments. Oh, no one can read them. Okay, well, thank you. Please come forward. Uh, 
two minutes. I'm going to learn how to use this. I'll watch it. Uh, first of all, good to be here. I'm going to be on a positive note. Uh, I think tonight proved that we don't have the uh, apathy, we have empathy. And I invite everybody to come and stand in line. I've done it since, I don't know, way back when at the Vet Center to see the community come together to care about the people we're talking about we don't care for the Vet Center annual Thanksgiving dinner. But I want to speak to you in 130 seconds. Some of you remember Emily Riley. This coming, I hope to put out a, a email, you'll do some research of what was Women Rise for Peace, because that was a big project, remember? How about Women Rise for the Homeless and invite the faith base to hold up at the Peace Church, which peace and social justice, everybody in our city has been up there for some special event. If you remember, it was a World Cafe. I don't know some of these people. I'd like to meet them. I'd like to have relationships. There's somebody with a badge. We, as it was World Cafe, I think the only one that knows a little bit about what I'm doing is Drew. So the next mayor, please, you're up at UC. I'm over at Cabrillo. Please look at youthpower.org and bring it to this council to talk about it. What would it look like if we had a youth mayor, a youth city council, and leaked up for UC and Cabrillo, and put them on like a next generation commission, give them the task like Drew does with the interns to do the research and do a report. Don't put it up in the library. Bring it to you to see what they would do to solve both the problem of homeless, but proactive prevention. Because you're gonna have a job next year with the county too. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Who knows, I have a couple cell phone numbers and please come and see, stand in line and talk to those people Thursday, but enjoy the turkey. And we can be a, a town that represents all of you. So it's past my bedtime, but I'm saying. Thank you, and Thank I did you. pretty good. All right, brother. All right. Who will these ordinances help? I can't see it at all. I see people over here talking about a $20 fee, which there are other fees on top of that, but we'll be silent about that. We won't mention that. Let's say a person lives outside. That mean they ain't got no $20. You give him a $20 citation, how you gonna pay that? So then you get another one and another one. Oh, now he's getting misdemeanors, which turned into another charge. He didn't show up for court and this and that. That you're creating criminals. What good did that possibly do? How can this person ever come up? He getting a criminal record for something you did, your work. I see the chief and I see his officers out there in the world. They're professional, patient. A um, couple other things, but you all got me talking fast. I see leaders in this room. Brett, I see four right there. This guy right here is very smart. Did you hear what he said? <laughs> we got a lawyer over there. Let him create these ordinances. He'll do a better job than what we got sitting over here. Yeah, brother. This guy over here, I don't know what he do in his office. What, I, what do you do? How smart are you? Can you be? I'm serious with the work that you, I've heard. This, how smart are you? I question you. I'm not talking about you. You kind of all right. The guy sitting next to you. I see that guy right there, Drew. I see governor. And that's why I begin to say, good, 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 but it's Glover. Your work is pathetic. You folks need to go. And I don't care where. I got something, but I, I'm, I'm, too, I'm too riled up. Get the point of the message, and it's all true, it's all real. I ain't creating nothing. It's all real. It's your work product. Thanks, you guys. Sorry, yeah, I gotta take a breather. <laughs> okay, uh, my name is Jennifer Lanford Brown, and I ha the whole point of me coming to the city councils have been lost in my 
harm reduction. So I was a senior mortgage loan officer for almost 20 years. I have a master's degree and had to dumb down my resume. I have a master's degree in criminal law. I actually <laughs> wrote the rules when um, 1220 programs started. Chris Monteith turned them in, they became city-fied, that whole hold harmless agreement that we used. I was assistant manager at the camp. I was down there pulling everybody out. I was at sleep outs. I've worked at every shelter. It doesn't work, guys. I was homeless seven months, disabled veteran, husband in a wheelchair. I had $1,400 in tickets. How did I pay those? I've got, you can look me up, Google me, and um, you'll find I have a degree from William and Mary. I, 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 it doesn't work, guys. And what the only thing, I worked at the Armory, we had to turn people away. I worked at Salvation Army. I, I left there happy. I loved working with the people, but the way that we, that it said the shelter systems are set up, the police can't do that. Um, I was married to an assistant chief of police in Newport News, Virginia um, previously, and um, I realize the hardships of the police officers, they cannot do this. Do not put this on them at all. They can't, they can't, I live on Felker Street by the way. And I lived at 155, I live at 125 now. I just moved up the street. Totally give all your money to Brent or something like that because he's got more going on with no money. Salvation Army is worldly. Hello, uh, Wes White from Salinas, co-president of the uh, Salinas Monterey County Homeless Union, um, just calling in opposition to this uh, ordinance. In Salinas, there seems like Salinas and Santa Cruz have similar attitudes when it comes to homelessness. You know, you folks are making millions of dollars in grant money from state and federal agencies to say you're gonna help the homeless. Well, if, if that's the case, then why is law enforcement the only uh, department to come out and, and service people? You're supposed to have a continuum of care. We, we just had a, a big blowout in, well, at the Leadership Council, our continuum of care in Monterey, San Benito counties, where our California Homeless Union made, made a representation about sweeps, how many sweeps happen in Salinas. And this is the same kind of attitude. It's all about, no, you can't be here. No, you can't be here. Well, where can you go? If you can't offer a per person where to go, then you shouldn't be just driving people out. You need to give people a yes, just like the other lady said, she's a teacher, I'm a teacher too. You can't just tell kids, no, don't run, because the only thing they hear is run. So you have to say walk. Okay, you're not trying to provide any kind of solutions, you're just trying to provide a block to push people out, which creates a state-created danger and you folks are setting yourselves up for liability. In fact, on Friday, last week, 35 city, county, state, and federal representative agencies, politicals, all met to say, Salinas, the sweeps is not the best course of action for this crisis. And what you're doing right now is the same kind of thing. If you pass this, it's, it's everything about hating people and nothing about helping people. So which way are you really thinking about going? Because your attitude on this vote right now, if you got over four people to say yes on this, you people are haters. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tatanka Bricka. Wow. Um, so it's a much bigger problem than just Santa Cruz. I would urge us to use the Declaration of Human Rights, as difficult as it might sound, as a basis for crafting what we do with local homelessness. I would encourage us to cooperate fully with efforts at the state and national level. Um, and I, this is maybe just a preview of something that will come to the council later about a California Green New Deal, which is being crafted by Romero Institute right in this town, which will provide, their, I can't go into it, but solving the housing and homeless problem is a part of solving climate change and is a part of full employment and is a part of realizing human rights for all of us. So let's work together as best we can locally, but it's a bigger problem as 
you know, I, I served on, I was the first organizer for Amnesty International in this country. And I also served on the sheriff's advisory team and appreciate uh, Mr. Mills for being involved with Armistice last year. And I do understand what he's saying about it's not their job to do this. And everybody has spoken about how what we're trying to do to help will make things worse. So we need a total reorientation of the consciousness, build it on human rights, and let's create a California Green New Deal because we can pass that here. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, when the city, when you all voted to suspend the camping ordinance, the police continued to tip, get, ticket campers. They just used other laws, which basically is not within the spirit of the decision on Boise. The spirit of that law is if somebody is outside, they're homeless, they're sleeping, and there's no place for them to go, the spirit of that law is you don't give them a ticket for something else. You let them sleep, you leave them alone. You know, I mean, I, I imagine there's some circumstances where you wanna have somebody move out of the way or whatever if they're completely blocking the sidewalk, but basically, the spirit of that law, it, it, that decision was to let people be if there's no place for them to be. And this rewrite of the law is no better. It's just trying to you know, do the soft shoe around what the decision was. And the decision is that people that don't have anywhere to go and you have no place for them to go should be left alone. Now you've not found another way to ticket them. Yeah. And you know, as the chief said, you know, you give somebody a bunch of tickets, then it goes to collections. What good does it do to send a homeless person to collections? They don't even have an address for them to, you know, write a letter to to say, hey, you owe us a bunch of money. I mean, it makes no sense to be traveling down this road the way you're headed with this ordinance. It's better to, to just, you know, three quarters of the, I mean, two thirds of the, a uh, third of the Your time police is up. budget Your time is, up. is spent you. on homelessness. Your time is up. Thank you that's, very that's much. That's insane. Okay, thank you. Your time is up. Okay, we'll go ahead and. All right. We're gonna go ahead and close public comment at this time and return back to the council for action and deliberation. I wanna remind those in the audience that um, I asked you to respect your fellow, fellow citizens when they spoke about things that you didn't agree with. I also ask you, you that you continue to respect this process even if there's things that come up here that you don't agree with. Um, I've had to stop our council proceedings this evening multiple times to restore um, the meeting so we can continue with the business. And I don't want to have to ask people to leave, but I will uh, do so if it's uh, continuing to be a problem. I do wanna recognize the fact that no matter when this item or when this topic comes before the council, that it is clearly and obviously an incredibly complex social challenge that um, <clears throat> incites a lot of emotion, and rightfully. And um, we, as a council here before us, agendize this for this evening to have a discussion around how, um, what I believe our uh, staff here is presenting, how to balance these complex social challenges. So that's what brings us back to um, this process and then now leads to us to have to make an informed policy decision. So at this time, I'll go ahead and acknowledge Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Member Glover um, for potential action or comment. So I, I wanna start by thanking all the people who came out tonight to want to thank all the people who came out tonight to speak up and provide their comments on this issue. It's as the mayor just said, it's a very difficult topic um, that we're constantly trying to adjust to address. Um, I'd also like to thank the city manager's office um, because 
you know, just acknowledging the fact that we have more year-round spaces. I think that's something that's very important for our community to understand that we are making strides. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the city attorney's office and the um, police chief and the police officers for, you know, taking more of a compassionate approach to trying to address this issue in our community. And then I also want to thank the uh, county supervisors for helping us with the funding that we've been able to use over the past year that has helped us pay for the Ross Camp, um, the facilities and the cleanup, and additionally to 1220 River Street. Um, our community is trying to do the best it can with the resources that we have to address this very complex, complex issue. And we definitely need our surrounding municipalities to also help us as we're trying to provide shelter. Because in many of the un un unincorporated areas and in some of the cities that surround Santa Cruz, we don't find them offering the same amounts of shelter. And we need everyone to help out in this effort. Um, with regards to uh, this item, I have a motion prepared, but um, really just want to encourage us to not only, and the folks in this community, to not only come and address us here in Santa Cruz at our city council meetings, but also to address the county supervisors and cities that are in the surrounding areas who don't offer as many shelters so that we can do a joint regional effort at trying to address our homelessness issue. And so um, I'm gonna make a couple uh, motions that we maybe need to separate, but uh, the first is to direct staff to work with the county on increasing winter and year-round shelter capacity, on-call beds, and temporary relocation of the re of the River Street Camp during construction. And I'd just like to emphasize that we really try to um, put pressure on trying to find more shelter in the unincorporated areas. And then the second part is uh, to send the city's amended camping ordinance and the county camping ordinance to the catch for expeditious review and recommendations for a countywide response. Um, there's a lot of pieces of this ordinance that I'm very much in favor of, but as we've received some new information tonight, um, we first received this ordinance late on Friday, and we've been receiving a lot of comments from members of the catch, members of the community, who really want us to take a little bit of a step back to reviewing it in more detail, allow the community with more opportunity to respond. and. <laughs> Part of the reason why we put the catch together in the first place was so that a group of community members could make recommendations on very big items such as the one that's before us today. And so I think that that would be the most appropriate way of um, dealing with this issue tonight. And, and that's it. Second. We have a motion by uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, seconded by Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Glover, and then Councilmember Brown. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> so. Um, just a show of hands up here on the dais. How many, have, have any of you ever slept outside in Santa Cruz without a tent or just a sleeping bag on the ground? Mm -hmm. You have. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like? Fine. It's fine. And it was, but it was, <laughs> I, mean, uh, I was camping. You were camping. See, so, so but uh, there's a difference between sleeping outside and unsheltered and camping. And I think that's what we really need to stress here in this conversation because we keep using the term camping when in reality what we're talking about is trying to sleep. I, I ask uh, because there was a petition that's circulating around online, which I'm sure some of you saw, encouraging us as elected officials to sleep outdoors and experience what it's like. Uh, and this last Friday, I took up that challenge, which I appreciate the police chief reading my uh, blog that I wrote, and I slept outside unsheltered with a sleeping bag. And it was probably one of the most exhausting and difficult experiences I have had in a very long time. Uh, it was not only difficult in finding winter gear that was affordable in Santa Cruz, and this was before it was starting to rain, but also in carrying all of the equipment around with me, uh, which was just the bare minimum of a light backpack and, uh, and a sleeping bag, but while I was wearing all of the winter gear. So while I'm walking, I'm sweating profusely, I'm trying to get from one place to another. Then when you get tired and you sit down, uh, you, the wind hits you and then you get cold again. And that doesn't even talk about the things that I saw while I was out walking around. I mean, I don't know if y'all go out at night and walk around and look at what's going on, but we have elders, community elders, that are 60 plus sleeping on hard cement, like, areas of the, of the, the ground. Uh, we have 
like people leaning up against buildings, mumbling to themselves because they don't have somewhere to go. I saw a 62-year-old woman sitting, or you know, mid-60-year-old uh, woman sitting at a bus stop, surrounded by all of her belongings, like rocking back and forth and talking to herself because she didn't have a place to go. People bent over on the cleaning dirt out of the sidewalks, going through trash cans. Like these are people that need a place to stay, and what we're contemplating right now is not is making it more difficult for them to exist. And like, not only that experience of witnessing just the, the sheer human suffering that was going on, it's raining now. And when I was sleeping on the ground, it was dry. So when I woke up in the morning, all of my stuff would have been wet. There would have been nowhere for me to go, especially if it's like middle of the night. Uh, then I had to try to find a bathroom, which when I woke up in the morning, which in itself was crazy to have to pack up my stuff. I saw an old man, that person, Jerry, that you talked about, I walked past Jerry uh, the morning and he's pushing himself in a wheelchair by his heels down the street and one of the wheels is lopsided so he has to readjust himself every 20 feet from where he's going that guy's like like these are the people that are on the street right now and we're talking about creating additional ordinance language that would further criminalize them so that we have tools in our toolbox i think that that's uh, problematic on a lot of levels um, it's nice to hear the vice mayor wanting to uh, refer it to the catch uh, but we have to keep in mind and you know as being one of the people that suggested and made the motion to create the catch, it's a little problematic in some of the responses they've come back with. They, there's a lot of great stuff that's come out from, you know, some different suggestions, but like, for example, uh, access to bathrooms, all they want to do is add two more porta potties downtown. I mean, that's substantially uh, less than what we need to be doing. So I would encourage us to be more intentional with this analysis of the ordinance. And instead of just sending it to catch, uh, making sure that there's incorporation from advocates, service providers, uh, the Santa Cruz Homeless Union specifically, since they are engaged and working with the population that are on the streets in Santa Cruz. I'm sorry to interrupt you for just a second. I'm gonna go ahead and ask that you either stand in the back with your sign or you take a seat as you're obstructing the view of those behind you with your sign. You're welcome to stand in the way back if you'd like with your sand sign and or you could take a seat if you if you like. Is this really worth stopping? Can I can I continue? Yeah, you may continue. Uh so an incorporation of uh, multiple entities, not just from the catch, to be able to get their analysis of what's going on with this ordinance, as well as uh, or, um, uh, making a, or including the motion for staff to prepare a list of possible locations for safe sleeping zones. Because I don't think it's relevant for us to be having a conversation about ordinances that are only applicable if people are in specific areas, if we don't have specific areas lined out. Uh, also, is coming forward with the draft SOPs, which the catch wants to look at anyway. And I don't think it's uh, feasible for us to even pass this ordinance or to enact it if we don't have those SOPs in in, uh, in place. So why are we putting the cart before the horse before we even understand how we're going to enforce it or the situation that surrounds it? Why are we going to prioritize the ordinance first as opposed to the SOPs? And then also, I think it would be great to instruct staff to look into how we can intentionally incorporate more social workers into our uh, strategy of engagement to build relationships as was brought up by a community member instead of focusing on the police, which sound like they are overwhelmed already with what's going on. So I, I, I pr appreciate the motion or the intent in it, but can you be a little bit stronger in um, some of your intention to make sure that we have a uh, robust analysis of the ordinance associated with the SOPs and looking at safe parking or safe sleeping spaces. So when we come back, it's not gonna be a, okay, let's pass the ordinance. Oh, wait a minute, we have to do the SOPs. Okay, let's do the, oh, let's, wait a minute, let's figure out the, the safe sleeping zones. Why are we not doing these and coinciding them together? I, I, I asked the maker of the motion. Well, I have Councilmember Brown and then if you want to. If she, Councilmember Brown had in, 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 in initiated that she wanted to speak to the item, so I'm acknowledging Councilmember Brown, and then I'll go ahead and acknowledge the Vice Mayor if he wants to respond to your questions. Okay, um, I have a couple of questions for the motion maker as well. Um, you know, I just want to say that I um, have a really hard time um, trying to address this issue as a member of the City Council when I was. Uh, a uh, member of an activist in the community, it was really clear to me what the, we needed to do. And being on this side of the dais, it um, 
continues to um, really disturb me that we have not been able to come up with solutions. Um, and I, I do not believe that uh, further ways of criminalizing um, unhoused for their lack of housing, and the behaviors associated with that is, is not, it's not gonna serve us well. Um, I, I also understand that there are concerns about, and that until we have um, a whole network of wraparound services and the ability to, the resources to fund that, um, not just at the city, I mean, that's a, that is a regional, it's a county issue, it's a regional issue, it's a state issue, it's a national issue, and we um, as a society are failing uh, miserably. Now I could go on and on about my feelings about that, but it's not going to get us anywhere. I, um, I guess I, I want to say that I support the idea of sending this, uh, the proposal to the catch. I, I think that they are planning to address us on the SOPs and some other matters. I think that um, this is something that um, I, and I appreciate that a lot of work has gone into this um, at uh, staff and the city attorney's office and um, the police chief and the city manager's office. A lot of uh, thinking about this has, you know, has gone into this thinking. Um, so it's not like people are sitting around and, and saying, you know, well, there's, you know, not thinking about what else we can do. It's a real serious challenge to figure that out. I think that we need to take responsibility and try and figure that out at the same time and that the kind of uh, camping, the criminalizing and, um, you know, s strengthening of a camping ordinance um, before we do that is not going to serve us as a community. Um, so, uh, but I do, so I do support uh, the motion and I would just ask the um, maker of the motion if uh, you might consider two additions. And one is just to be specific about um, when sending the amended camping ordinance uh, to the catch for expeditious review, um, I think that um, Council Member Glover was trying to get at, um, you know, as kind of a more serious, a serious review. Um, I'm not sure exactly what kind of language, but if there's something that could kind of strengthen the intention to um, have that, um, you know, comprehensive, serious, and expeditious review. Um, and to include in that the consideration of the um, Association of Faith Communities requests to uh, increase parking availability um, on their request. And um, so, so I think that that's not listed here. And if we send it, then I would like to have that be considered as well to come back to us. And then I also want to suggest that um, We've heard a lot uh, tonight, and I recognize this, that you know we have immediate needs, and it is raining, it is cold. Um, people don't have anywhere to go. And the warming center is one of the, you know, one of the only, I mean, the only program that actually provides a place for people to go immediately, urgently, um, when there's nowhere to go. Um, Mr. McHenry, I'm going to go ahead and ask you. That's. I'm going to go ahead and ask you to leave at this point. If you, you, I've already, I've, I've mentioned it multiple times at this point to not be able to. It's not your. It's not your time to speak. So we're going to go ahead and ask you to leave at this point for interrupting council proceedings again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So. Go ahead. Someone to watch. Okay. So the. So the. Um, I, I just, I'm gonna, I'll just finish up on the warming center and then I'll just reiterate so that so they're clear. Um, Councilmember Brown. Um, so, um, so just finishing up on the uh, statement that I was trying to make about the the warming center. Um, you know, I think that 
um, given the work that the Warming Center does, given the comments that um, Brian Adams made tonight and in conversations I've had with him prior to this meeting, um, this idea of kind of being able to scale up a model that's working is really important that for us to consider and to keep in our minds. So I, I'd like to include direction to staff to bring back consideration of uh, funding for the warming center uh, when uh, you report back to us about uh, alternative uh, and expanded shelter space, which it sounds like is gonna happen soon. Um, so those are my um, requests. Um, and I guess I'll just make one more comment so I can just try to wrap up and I don't wanna you know, keep us here coming back around to my comments that I keep <coughs> thinking of. But so I do wanna say, uh, we've also heard, I mean, it's not just the people here who are here tonight. We have heard, uh, you know, we had 300 pages of uh, correspondence, uh, emails to city, the city council about this included in our post packet production. And I didn't, I stopped counting, but most of them uh, asked us to take more time to consider the, the language and, and what, you know, what we are gonna pass. And it was, it was not just uh, um, the folks here tonight, there are many more people who are, are making that request and it was the predominant message. So I think it's reasonable to do that. Um, so I'll stop there and just add, so I, I, the first piece was in the second sentence there, send the city's amended camping ordinance and the county camping ordinance to the catch for um, thorough, deliberate and expeditious review and provide recommendations on uh, city and county-wide response. Okay. So that's the first. And then request, adding consideration of the AFC request to increase uh, available parking spaces subject to review by the PD. And yeah, so, and I, so if you're not ready to accept those, then I'll just make those as a separate motion afterwards. I just want to explain that the AFC request and part of why this is going to the catch. So there's a number of issues that, that have come up with regards to this ordinance. Um, one of which is uh, the number of vehicles that a religious institution can have on their lot, which is that. There's also um, the length of time that, for example, someone can live in the RV in their own private back, in someone's private backyard. There are issues around whether or not tents can be up during the daytime. These are things that I've been hearing during the daytime when it's raining. So the idea behind having it go for review and getting these recommendations is to deal with all of these issues and allow for the catch to give us recommendations on all these issues. So, I mean, if the AFC needs to be explicit, that's fine, but um, my sense is that it's already included as one of the conditions for review, since that's something that people have reached out to us with concerns with. Could I just, um, so, so I, I agree with you that there are many other issues that um, ought to be considered, but I just wanna make sure that there is space for that and there's an understanding that um, that doesn't get lost in translation. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings, did you have anything you wanted to add in? Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say that, you know, my understanding is that as these um, standard operating procedures were being reviewed by the catch, so, um, and that we're gonna get recommendations back from them. So that's kind of where I was thinking, I was at with, you know, how we're gonna approach those standard operating procedures. With regards to the safe sleeping areas, I'm more than happy with in the first um, motion that when we have staff work with the county on increasing winter and year round shelter capacity that they also include safe sleeping areas. Councilmember Matthews. Um, well, on this motion particularly, um, I suggested adding the safe sleeping areas to the uh, first motion. What I meant by that was specifically the AFC uh, managed safe sleeping program. The others are more um, undefined at this point. I do have a question, uh, maybe it's Andy for you. It's my understanding that safe sleeping program in church has been on the books for what, 15 years or so with three, up to three, is that correct? 
Safe parking, safe parking. That's what I meant, safe parking. Uh, my understanding is they've had a couple different programs, yeah. one of which is people stay actually in the facilities, the other one is safe parking, and that's fairly new, is my understanding. Um, my point being, I believe, and maybe Martine, you can tell me that's on the books. It yes, the, that provision way. has been in the existing ordinance for many years. A long yes. time. Yes. Not yes. much used, I guess. I don't, I don't know much about this, but um, also not a problem <coughs> from what I understand I think, right, generally. Right, right. I think the key has been with the AFC program is that it's, it's a managed program. And so I think that that really is the, is the, is the principal thing that makes it successful. And uh, also there's variations, of course, as far as what uh, each of the facilities can accommodate right. uh, in, in terms of parking space, in terms of uh, facilities that are, that are available. So there's various factors that affect that. So yeah. um, I understand that. I um, Just given on that particular program, uh, and there, there is now apparently a program for uh, a, a framework for administering that program, I could entertain um, expanding that up to five uh, uh, with the churches and the AFC's um, uh, agreement um, and see how it goes. Uh, I really would like to know more <coughs> about the um, framework personally. Um, that's something that's on the books. You know, we could initiate that. I'm, um, as was suggested, not willing to have it go even more if the police chief agrees to it <laughs> because I think uh, we could with the... Uh, <coughs> Oh, sorry. Um, with a program that has been refined a bit in recent years, I think there's a capacity to grow it slightly and see how it goes. So I think that's something we could do now without having to wait a whole lot. So that, that was my one comment there. Um, should I speak on the rest of the motion at this point? Sure. Could I, I just know. interject that the, the section of the municipal code that currently allows for um, vehicle parking on church parking lots was most recently amended in 2002, which kind of coincides with my vague recollection of Mine when too. that was put yeah. in place. Yeah. Um, but there it is. <laughs> um, so just other comments. Um, the focus of the conversation tonight was about um, the revised camping ordinance, but I think it's, it's and that is the most um, challenging part of this, probably, um, this whole field. But I think it's unfair to say that the city is not trying to make any solutions, is not doing anything, et cetera. As I think most of the people here know, uh, we, we have um, invested in uh, a variety of shelters. I see thumbs pointing down, but the city has made a good effort, have, has invested money. We have partners in numerous programs. I'm just thinking downtown streets team, the homeless garden program, um, any number of shelters. Uh, we, we allocate funding for um, health care, dental care, medical care that serve a large number of uh, homeless individuals. So to say we're doing nothing, I think is um, um, unfair. Uh, not that there aren't more challenges. So I just want to say that publicly. Um, I also acknowledge that people, I would say not on both sides of the issue, but all over the place on this issue, a lot of people wanted more time. Um, my own, pr and I don't know what's intended by the cash working on this uh, with the holidays coming up and two readings and all that. I don't know what timeline we're looking at. Um, my own preference, I think, would be to do a first reading, understanding that it's got a heck of a lot of work to do, but gives us something to go on, and then send that to the cash for comments. So um, I do feel the need um, in the community to um, uh, try and take a, a, a serious effort at giving an alternative um, to no camping ordinance uh, and uh, start getting something in gear. So that's just that's just where I fall down on the on where we send it. And I think it would be helpful to get an idea of if it were to go to cash, what's the, what does the timeline look on that? Because I think putting it off into February is just going to satisfy nobody. Um, yeah, I think I'll echo um, somewhat I've heard. I, I am supportive of um, expanding the um, the AFC to, to up to five vehicles. Um, seems uh it's it's a good way it seems like to accommodate people um try to meet them 
uh, somewhat where they are and provide them a safe place to be at night. Um, I also, you know, I'm reflecting on sort of the just the magnitude of, of the issue that I think we've been, you know, talking about tonight. Um, and uh, we, you know, we, I think many of you have acknowledged this is, I, I mean, I, I ultimately, the state of California needs to help us figure this out. Um, and I think we do have a very compassionate community here. Um, and I do think that people are tired on all sides. Um, and so um, I think we need to continue to do the work we're doing. Um, I'm encouraged, very encouraged. I wanna thank the county um, for their involvement in speaking with us a lot last week, working really every day to try to identify um, potential uh, additional shelter. And I look forward to hearing more from our staff on that, but um, I will compliment the county. Um, I think several of us made phone calls the day after the meeting um, on whenever that was, the 12th, and many of us were in conversation daily um, to try to get more shelter available. So, um, I think there is a shortage of shelter. I think we all know that. I think also what we're looking at in this community is um, we really don't have a, we have a systems breakdown on this problem. And um, uh, I think it's important that we keep that in mind that the success that people see in other communities and other states uh, it really relies on a very systematic, systemic, or systematic approach to how we do this. Um, we have huge obstacles here. We don't have housing to move people into yet. Um, and we have limited space to build that housing. We have limited resources to build that housing. So our system uh, has some major gaps in it. Um, one thing I think, even though the ordinance looks to be um, preventative maybe in some, preventative in many ways to, to many people in the audience. Um, I think the, the strength behind this ordinance is um, around the, con the concept of, of, of contact with people. Um, we need to be looking at diversion, we need to be looking at prevention, we need to have that people contact. Um, unfortunately, the bulk of that work is gonna probably fall on our police officers. Um, I'm encouraged at this point, um, I'm encouraged that um, our officers are trained. There's, we're trying to get connections with social services. We're trying to uh, train officers in some of the um, systems-based approaches to what we, sh we um, should be doing to hopefully get people um, in the kind of uh, situation that would potentially help them uh, in a more meaningful way than having them be on the streets. So I think it's important that we uh, do take action tonight. Um, I'm, uh, I am supportive of, of having the cash weigh in on some, on some aspects of this, but um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, acknowledge what the rest of the community is also asking the city council to do, and that is to um, provide some relief from, from, um, Various, various folks who are unfortunately right now living, living out on our streets. And uh, so there is no good answer tonight. Um, and, uh, but I do, I do think we should, we should move forward and I would be supportive of trying to move this forward tonight in the first reading. I have a few comments and then I'll go back to Council Member Glover. Did you want to say something, um, Martine? Yeah, I was just wanted to reflect. I just got uh, a text from Megan, uh, who sta staffs the cash, and, sh and she was just uh, letting me know that uh, the the cash has two meetings uh, this year, and they've they've sort of booked and scheduled them already with with a variety of uh, agenda items, including uh, community outreach. So um, it might be hard for them to obviously take this on this this calendar year. Just wanted to note that. I think that makes sense because I do know that they've been working and meeting regularly and I also want to uh, show appreciation to the staff for presenting this in advance of this meeting to the cash as well. Um, 
I share all the comments that have been made in terms of increasing the parking, as well as um, really advocating with our county partners for um, more support and uh, how we can work together to alleviate a lot of these really larger challenges that we're experiencing. I also feel that it would be a lot of responsibility and it would definitely, and I'm not surprised, I think, delay this process. So I, um, appreciate the suggestion by Councilmember Matthews to be kind of in action to, um, you know, make this, it is a hard decision, but to be in, ac in action and to have a first reading and welcome feedback, um, but to continue to move um, and, and to be able to have uh, some of these tools in place. And I really also want to acknowledge Councilmember Myers' response in that um, it's an opportunity for us to have contact to help people on an individual pathway out of hopefully homelessness and was encouraged by the potential of having two specific um, officers that are going to be sort of, I'm, I'm assuming, part of this homeless uni unit, which has a different, I'm assuming, kind of lens. I, I, as I've read about other jurisdictions who have these types of units, that's really about blending how um, you balance these complex issues, but also ultimately try to support people. Um, and, I, and I, of course, welcome any input if there's additional ads in regards to those specific officers' duties. Um, and uh, so that being said, I think what, what the impetus of this was, was also having a tool in place um, to uh, potentially uh, um, mitigate any uh, large encampments that have proven to be very difficult and um, have uh, not obviously been what we want to have in our community because we want to do better and um, also the public health considerations and challenges associated with that. So um, that's sort of my kind of just a summary <coughs> of comments um, and then we'll welcome more deliberation. Councilmember Glover. Thank you. So there are just a couple of things, uh, statements. You know, uh, I always think back to Charlottesville. Uh, whenever I hear the term on all sides, it really bothers me. Um, I've heard it with renters protections. Now we're hearing it with people experiencing homelessness. And it's important, yes, there are different perspectives and different people coming from different angles and their interests. But one side is talking about survival, and the other side is talking about what some might consider nuisances. And so it's not to diminish public safety issues or feelings of safety or other kinds of issues, but if we're just going to move forward so that we're, quote, in action, moving towards the criminalization of people that are vulnerable just so that we can say we're moving forward is pr pro dangerous in a, in a lot of different ways. Not just problematic, it's dangerous. Uh, also, the statement, there's no good options for tonight. So um, I disagree heavily with that statement. It matters how diligently we want to move on this topic. For example, imagine all of the hours that were spent in creating this ordinance. Just imagine how many, how many staff hours went into that. And staff hours aren't cheap. So what if we had taken that money and repurposed it into something that was focused on engagement and participation as opposed to criminalization and penalties? Uh, also, the idea of contact. So nothing against the police department. But you, you're a great guy, Chief Mills. Um, but I had a 62-year-old woman come to my community meeting uh, last Wednesday to tell me about her experiences of being constantly pushed around by the police, uh, getting citations left and right, and being forced to go into shelters where there are you know, people that are violent and all this other kind of stuff. So I don't think increasing contact with police officers, if they don't have the tools that they need or the access to the shelter, is going to be beneficial to anyone. As I believe Mr. Willis said, we're creating criminals by adding misdemeanors and other kinds of ticketing things. Um, also. We haven't talked much about city-owned facilities. We've only talked about the possibility of having the county step in and save the day, which uh, I know we've said a lot of thanks to them, but after closing the VFW without giving us advance notice, and then now after we plead with them to potentially reopen the VFW, which will then bring us back <laughs> to a net zero gain in units, uh, I am a little bit less hesitant to be like, yay county, and at the same time, we have a giant building directly across the street that is only used a few times in this winter season 
to be a possible housed location. We have the auditorium at the Loudon Nelson Community Center. I went there for my community meeting that I mentioned, and there was a community member who lives in that neighborhood that said that she would be absolutely okay with having people use the auditorium as a winter shelter because right now their entire neighborhood is a winter shelter because they don't have anywhere to go or be inside. So there's the, I mean, people in Depot Park are gonna hate this, but there's the freight building at Depot Park, which could totally be used. There's the uh, Harvey West Clubhouse, which could be used, especially if we're looking for spaces for senior citizens or senior women or families with children. We have the resources available to us. We just don't seem to have the will in which to act on those services that we have. And so when I, so when I hear these arguments of we don't have the capacity, uh, we're overburdened, uh, we don't have the space, we gotta work on the county, all of those are just really weak excuses for we don't want to do what we need to do to make sure that people are not sleeping out in the rain for the rest of winter. It might mean that we need to sacrifice some of our access to events. It might mean that we need to put pressure on the Kaiser, on the Kaiser Arena. We don't have site control over the Kaiser Arena, but what have we, have we opened up communication with them to see if we can use it? I mean, what, so, you know, it's really disappointing that uh, we want to move so quickly through this, especially the term of expeditiously. You want to move, you want the catch to review these things expeditiously. Don't you think we should be doing them cautiously yeah. and step by step to make sure that there's a million perspectives that are taken into consideration? Or, you know, the catch is overburdened, right? So you would, that, that, that motion's pretty much bunk if the can't, catch can't do it in the next two meetings. So why not shift back to my original suggestion and instruct staff maybe Megan, who's uh, seemingly the one that's coordinating sheltery stuff, to have a conversation, or the, the attorney's office, to have a conversation with the advocates, the ACLU, the Santa Cruz Homeless Union, people from the in-house population. It's not the catch, that's right, but it is a population of people that are ready to give us input on how we can make the uh, ordinance work in, in a way that they feel is just and or participate in the process so they have their voice feel heard. It, it, it's a constant cycle we have. I brought these issues forward in February for us to be able to establish safe parking zones, safe sleeping zones, and some form of transitional encampment. And when we say that this ordinance is to stop the popping up of large, trans, uh, large encampments because they've, quote, proven difficult, we have not done anything to adequately or intentionally work with the people that are trying to establish these camps to provide them with the services and support they need to be successful. So when you say we don't have, we, we, we wanna stop the large encampments from popping up, you mean you wanna stop large encampments from popping up and actually working with them to make a, make a solution instead of just criminalizing them and pushing them from one place to another. It's getting kind of ridiculous. You got, I mean, just like someone said, it's either you're gonna do it or you're not gonna do it. And if you're not gonna do it because you get to go home and sleep in your warm bed tonight with your family and your your food and your heater and all this other kind of stuff, people are still gonna be out there. And we've already lost two people this year that we know of based on lack of shelter. So take it how you take it. That's right, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, this is the time for council, I mean, action. So, you know, if there is an interest in modifying the uh, motion or, you know, a supplemental motion to try to get the council to move in a different direction uh, to Councilmember Glover's uh, comments, uh, this would be the time. So um, right now we have a motion on the floor. Can I just, was the friendly amendment accepted? Which one? Uh, Councilmember Brown, the three. I mean, really what I'm most interested in is um, ensuring that the parking Availability for the AFC program is included and specifically addressed, however that's addressed, um, and also uh, including consideration of funding for the warming center when we get a report back about shelter um, expansion and uh, replacement. I have also, if I could, a clarifying question. I have also a Sorry. clarifying question um, in regards to the information and um, sort of what to potentially put onto the cash and knowing that that won't likely to come back to them for a good period of time. And, and frankly, is a lot of responsibility on a, on a volunteer group that's working a lot on a, on a lot of major issues. Um, given that information, is that still the direction of the motion maker? <laughs> knowing it will postpone it for several months. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, it would be good to get some sense of what, how long this would be postponed for because um, I think part of it is that, you know, when we were making decisions earlier last year around 
places where we were going to put safe parking or transitional encampments. There were a lot of people who came out and there was a lack of community engagement in that entire process, which is what led to the catch being form. And so that, so that was the reason why this recommendation was coming forward because my understanding too is this came as in response to when the, when the new camp was forming, there was a need, and because we saw some of the camps forming, there was a need to put on this emergency ordinance, but now that that camp's not there, it doesn't seem like it's as much of an emergency to deal with at this point in time, which is why my understanding was that, you know, we're getting all this input from people from the community who want us to take a step back. They haven't had a chance to look at it. We can give it to a community group. We've tasked with looking at these. Um, I would even, you know, be happy if we could have a subset a subset of members from the catch work with a subcommittee from the city council over the next month to two months and bring back recommendations or month to month and a half. Um, I think that it would just give us time and more opportunity to kind of go through because I know that if we were to sit here tonight and to wordsmith everything, every change that people would want to see, it would be another two hours that we would probably be here. And that's why, in my opinion, it would be good to send it on or to not postpone it, but well, to postpone it and work on it a little bit further. Did you? I I, I wanted to see just it. um I was I was just gonna uh, make a comment that just given the discussion that's been had since the motion was made and and a sort of free flowing discussion about a friendly amendment, I I think it would be worthwhile to have the motion restated so that we can all agree what is on the floor. Um, I was also going to suggest that the council consider putting a date certain for the return of the ordinance to provide the catch, uh, you know, a reasonable amount of time to review and comment, but but not just continue it indefin indefinitely. I really do think um, that this is a tool that um, is lacking uh, right now, and and. Uh, is, is something that the council really should take, give serious consideration to and hopefully take action on. Okay, uh, do you wanna re go ahead and restate the motion and then we'll go ahead and- Sure. And, 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 oh, you have it up here? Okay. Can I add the, uh, I agree that I think it'd be helpful to define what expeditious means. And I think with respect to the, the cash, I know they, they already have a update that they've prepared for you for the 10th. But I think certainly if this is a priority, uh, I know they've got items scheduled, they, they could they could possibly make, make that a priority as well. So I think having a clear timeline of when you want it back will help us then uh, develop the, the work and the agenda with, with, the, with the cash. Uh, recognizing that they've already done some work and they've already prepared, I think, some updates for you on, on the 10th, but then moving forward, they could certainly prioritize uh, this if that was what the council wanted. I had uh, Councilmember Cohn and then Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Matthews. My uh, question was addressed. Thank you. <coughs> Councilmember Myers? <coughs> I guess I am. Uh, so, it, so if we, so December 10th is our last meeting, so we only have one more meeting before the break, and then we don't come back till mid January. So that feels like a long way to to wait um, to some extent. We also have holidays in between. So um, are, you mentioned the idea of some kind of council subcommittee. That might be a more expeditious way, ex ex expeditious way to, um, I can't speak anymore, um, to try to move forward to bring uh, a revised version of the ordinance back potentially to council on December 10th. Um, I do agree that I think this is an important uh, tool that we need. Um, I'll speak a little bit to um, my comments before. I too have, have spoken to people um, and uh, you know, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the situations that people are in are pretty dire and um, sometimes people don't wanna be in the tent with the person that has the tent set up. So I try to keep that in mind, and um, I wanna make sure that um, we acknowledge that there's a lot of different factors that go into the circumstances that people find themselves in. 
um, and uh, especially with the most vulnerable pe people in our community, including women and, and youth. So um, again, this is a tool that provides um, our police to uh, to really acknowledge and, and, and um, make contact to see, sort of try to figure out what someone's circumstance is as they're trying to, to um, figure out a place for the evening or even a place for the day. I do like the amendments that have been made so that um, it's clear if someone needs um, to be resting on a bench and sort of regrouping during the day. We've tried to accommodate some of those, some of that language, but um, I guess I would make a substitute motion to create a um, council subcommittee of to um, work with the city attorney, city manager, and uh, chief of police to uh, come back with an alternative, a revised language um, for the December 10th meeting. Okay. I'll go ahead and second that motion. So now we'll go ahead and um, uh, Mr. Condotti will have an opportunity to take a vote on the potential substitute motion. And then if not having enough support for the substitute motion, then we'll go ahead and return back to the original motion. Is that correct? That's right. The vote is whether to accept the substitute motion. Okay. Um, with dis we can have discussion just before that vote. Okay. Councilmember Matthews. The question is whether or not to accept it and then vote on it. Okay, yeah, okay, let's if go ahead. If it's accepted, then you can vote on the motion. Okay, okay, Does any, okay we'll go ahead and take the uh, vote on whether or not to accept the substitute motion. But I have another question also. Okay, Is your right. suggestion for a committee of council members, staff, and cash representatives, or just simply council and staff? I think in the, in the, um, just in, the, in looking at the timeline, uh, I know we'll be sending the SOPs, I believe um, the second reading really wouldn't be happening until, until January, correct? Um, because we, if we brought language back December 10th, we actually don't reconvene until I think it's January 14th or something like that. Um, it sounds like the cash has a couple of meetings planned. We could send the SOPs to them. So yeah, my idea was, was uh, to, to keep it to council. Council members. And um, in my opinion, there are a whole lot of other people out there who want to comment on this other than cash. So I, I think the idea that we're just going to do it internally in the city and maybe send it to cash and we're done misses a huge amount of the comment that we've gotten. So um, perhaps there's a, a refined version of this, but we would still, I think, have to consider it a first reading because my gosh, for the December 10th meeting, when do we get the staff report in for that? Thursday. Like next Friday? <laughs> Wednesday. Yeah, yeah, I mean, a week tomorrow. from a week from today. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, which is tomorrow, tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, Wednesday. <laughs> yeah. Pretty fast yeah, work. So, yeah, maybe we're just Do up it. against the time, yeah. Stick with that, no. If it is, uh, um, I, I expressed my opinion, which is to get something on the table to work on. It's out there. People now know what the starting point is, but I think um, <laughs> if we take more time on it, then uh, definitely it should go out for more conversation to the broader community. Do you want to withdraw your Do you want to withdraw? Criminalizing homeless people further. Okay, I'll, Elise. I'll withdraw okay. my motion. She's going to go ahead and withdraw. Please don't criminalize the okay. people of schizophrenia. Please, we're going to go ahead and ask you, we've had an opportunity to hear from you. I'm going to go ahead and ask that you take a seat. If not, I'm going to go ahead and ask that you please leave at this time. I hate going Listen. to jail. I'm going to sit down. I hate going to jail. Okay, this well then, wrong. if there's another outburst, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to go then. Go ahead. I just wanted to clarify, with respect to the SOPs, um, those, because they're adopted by resolution, uh, there's some time there. Um, also, because uh, after the second reading, there's a 30-day mm -hmm. period that goes into into effect. There's more time there to have that reviewed and considered by council. So, originally, our thought was that if you had the first reading today, second reading on the 10th, the SOPs wouldn't come back to you until January, which would still be with, with before the ordinance went into effect. So that there's some time there for review in January. So just so you know, uh, with respect to that portion of it. Right. 
So we had the um, motion withdraw, is that correct? Did you want to add something, Mr. Condotti? No, okay. Okay, so the substitute motion has been withdrawn. Councilmember Member Glover. Motion to call the question. Second. Okay, there's a motion to call the question. There's a second by Councilmember Member Crone. All those in favor. Well, what is the question? The motion that was before us at this. The original motion. By him. But can I see it on the, yeah. So I was gonna ask what you. I don't even know if you accepted. I still no, that, that, hadn't, that, quint, that hadn't been amended. And I was going to ask because of the fact that um, multiple council members have asked, have, um, have stated that they're interested in increasing the number from three to five. Would that, should we have that as a second, as a separate? Let's just go ahead. We have a motion to call the question, so we need to take a vote on that motion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. 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 So that passes with Vice Mayor Cummings, Council Member Crone, and Council. Yep. Did you vote no? Sandy I voted you said no. no. I said no. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. I feel like there's something that we need to work out. We here. don't even. No, know. Not even clear on what the question is. So. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But there was yeah. a motion so to call the question. So all those. So I'll no. Try vote no. Okay. So that passed with council. That fails with council member um, Crone and Glover voting in, in support, and the remainder of the council voting against. Okay. So we'll go back to the to the discussion on the um, proposed motion and clarification. In reference to the most recent question, I would be completely in favor of directing that we uh, ask to have a revision to our existing um, safe parking ordinance amended to be increased up to five. Um, five up to five uh, sites for safe parking on church parking lots through a managed safe parking program. Right, that's is, on the books. Are so are you uh, having that added as no, a- No, I think that's something we, that doesn't motion. have to go through all sorts of other stuff. That can be just a clean <laughs> is that, I know exactly, yeah. you know what, we're gonna go ahead and ask that you keep, please keep your voices down so I could hear my colleagues up here as we're trying to, digit. okay, we'll go ahead and ask that, we'll go ahead and ask that you also keep your voices down so that we can, and we'll try to speak into the microphone more clearly so that we can hear each other. My understanding is that the motion, what you're asking is to add as a friendly amendment to the motion. Not even a a friendly amendment, a separate new motion. motion. A, a new motion. Yes. Okay. Okay. No, just when we get to it. Oh, when we get to it. Okay, so we'll go ahead and res yeah, reserve that for after yeah. we are able yeah. to finalize what we have before us now. Okay, so the motion before us at this time is um, to really show indication that we do intend to uh, pass uh, some sort of ordinance in this in this way, but we want to have it go through the potential cash first, is that and community. and community. And community first. Oh, sorry, I and are you at this time not suggesting that we pass a first reading of it this evening? By not, no. Okay. Okay. And I can comment on that as well because my understanding is if we pass a first reading tonight, then we're gonna go get public comment and then it's gonna come back and we're gonna have to do it again. It's still a first and reading. It'll just keep coming back and forth um, until we get the proper amount of input. So I think that it would just we would just be having this come up agenda after agenda, similar to last year. And I think that um, if we can get, you know, sufficient feedback, then we can um, bring it back at a time when we have a clear direction where we're going. Okay. It would be helpful if we got pretty clear direction on the, your timeline. Uh, I think that would be really helpful to have yeah. a, a deadline. Okay. So. Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Brown. Um, I have a question uh, regarding sort of how we. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor, how we might collect that community. So are we thinking about having a kind of a hearing or a community meetings or how do we how do we collect? I mean, I know we've we've gotten a lot of obviously a lot of written correspondence, but I'm just curious if and how that fits in the into the timeline in terms of I don't do you have thoughts on that? I mean one thought that I had and Potentially, we could have a, um, you know, thinking about the catch and the, the reason why I was bringing it to the catch is because that's a body that can vote on recommendations. And it's also a group that can hear comments from members of the community when they're taking that information into account when they're voting. And so that was why I wanted to send it to that body because they actually have the power to vote on recommendations. Um, so. That was the, the reason for bringing it there. And because it's 11 people who represent different sectors of our community, they can bring those voices in and those recommendations in when they're making, when they're you know voting on this. 
I, I know the catch is, is, I think it may be worth having another meeting um, outside the cash to for community input for sure. Only because the cash, you know, is a, it, it is a advisory body, but I think also if we could um, somehow facilitate a couple of other, other community meetings, I think that might be useful as well. Yeah. Sorry, I'll stop. What I was going to suggest is certainly with respect to the cash, they could schedule a meeting. They've already got some scheduled in December. With respect to the other groups, I think setting up individual meetings with them would be the most expeditious way. So we could reach out and schedule meetings with you know, council members and whatever the uh, uh, organization might be, um, and then get their input. I had Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Glover, and then I'll come back. Yeah, I would just add, uh, because the comment I was going to make was uh, kind of in response to that question uh, that you asked Councilmember Myers. I think that the catch is, I mean, we established that committee to take a deeper uh, look, dive into these issues and bring us recommendations. And so I think that is an appropriate place to um, have community input happen uh, if the staff feels that you know, some individual meetings could happen expeditiously without a whole lot of extra effort. I'm not opposed to that, but I do think that we appointed this committee for a reason and they ought, and that's why I would like to have them weigh in, um, you know, and, and use that as a space for additional community input. People, the public is welcome at those meetings. Council members can go to those meetings and listen to what the public has to say and what catch members have to say. <coughs> so. I'd just like to kind of concentrate that effort in the space that we've already created. Mr. Glover and then Councilmember Matthews. Thanks, I was also reminded that in my last meeting last Wednesday um, uh, that there were representatives from the catch there that uh, let us know that they're having specific community engagement meetings uh, of the two catch meetings, the second is community engagement on safe sleeping and camping programs. They specifically allocate about an hour and a half for community input to come in and talk to the catch directly. Um, and I believe they also have a safe sleeping and managed campground subcommittee that could look at it. Also it was brought up as a suggestion uh, that uh, we could direct staff or staff uh, catch to prioritize this issue and then push one of their existing items off so it's a tighter timeline. And if the city manager is looking for a uh, you know a specific time, we could just say the first meeting in January. That'll give us what four four no six weeks somewhere in there five six weeks for us to be able to talk with cash, then look at it, review it, ideally get community input from maybe the ACLU who. Has I'm out uh, saying that we should not even enforce this until we have the shelter in place yep. and stuff like that. So um, I would just say, and like I said before, I think we should just move with this. And if the city manager needs it to say, bring it back to the second or the first meeting in January, but I think we should move forward and uh, take this boat. Councilmember Matthews and then. Well, I continue to think that sending it to cash alone is not enough. I mean, think of all the meetings that uh, have been held out there recently on this topic. Uh, I know Drew and I went to a meeting uh, in the Harvey West area hosted by uh, <coughs> Housing Matters, um, packed with people. We've, we've had meetings in the beach area, <coughs> meetings downtown, I think. Uh, a number of the service providers um, could give us some good um, perspective on this. So um, it is a big deal. A lot of people have, have a useful perspective on it. I, I would hope we'd have enough time to get that, and it's tough during the holiday season. Okay. So are you suggesting a different path, or are you well, supporting the path? Well, I just suggest, um, let me see what the top of that motion says there. I'm, I'm trying to read all of it now. Can we scroll a tiny bit, a bit, bit Bonnie? I can't read the top of it. Oh, is it is it up? Oh, I I don't see it there. Okay. Uh, you should just move it. Um, I I have a couple of suggestions which I mentioned, um, just in conversation here on that language, if it were acceptable to say uh, increasing winter and year-round shelter capacity, on-call beds, I would say manage safe parking areas. That would be, is, is that an acceptable change there? Uh, and 
relocation of the River Street camp prior to construction. To manage sleep, safe sleeping areas we after on call beds? It would say manage safe parking areas. Instead of on call beds? No, instead of safe sleeping areas. Instead of safe sleeping areas? Yeah. I think that's why they're, I understood. They're two different things. Parking. Uh, what? That, that's like the AFC. Yeah. yeah, but that takes away the safe sleeping areas, which was in there intentionally, so that they would come back with safe sleeping areas to offer as alternative places where people could go in case they were <laughs> in violation of the ordinance, because we need to provide them with a place to okay, go. Okay, well, we can see if, if Vice Mayor Cummings, who's the motion His maker, motion, wants to accept that was not in the original the one. I had suggested safe sleeping, but what I meant was manage self-parking. Is that, is that accepted in terms of the correction? Safe parking? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. In removal of safe sleeping. That's right. The one thing I would say with the safe sleeping is that we went through that all last all last winter, and within the city, at least, there were no areas that we were able to determine would be adequate safe sleeping areas. That was the decision. We got down to the decision between Depot Park and um, I think it was uh, the Wetlands, and neither of those, the Marsh, yeah, and neither of those were acceptable, and there was only two la remaining areas within the city that were under consideration for safe sleeping, and neither of those were selected by the city council. So I don't think we should pursue that again at this time. Okay, so you're accepting the friendly amendment. Um, are you, as a seconder of the motion, <coughs> Council Member Crone, accepting that as well, the, mo the modified language? I thought um, Council Member Glover just mentioned like five different places that were, were, that were not um, the Marsh or the Depot Park. Well, we had for safe, safe, like uh, so. La if if I may, sure. Um, so last winter, when this when the safe sleeping areas were brought to the city council, the staff was directed to go throughout the city and find city owned parcels where we could have safe sleeping areas. And of all the parcels that they identified, we ended up narrowing it down as a group to two. And there was a decision made to put at Depot Park. That decision came back and we decided we weren't gonna put it there. We decided we weren't gonna put it at Jesse Street March. They, neither of them were good ideas. <laughs> but what about an indoor place is what um, Council Mayor so, Glover so was just this, talking I about. Mean, is so that different than a slate? So if you want to the top. <laughs> yeah, well, if you want to withdraw the motion, the seconding of the motion, that, that's possible. But the um, maker of the motion um, modified the language to encompass safe parking as opposed to slave sleeping. And if you're not uh, supportive of that as the seconder of the motion, now would be the time to withdraw that. Your, your second. Well, I'm, I'm asking him a question. That is, can I reply? But that is implied on increasing yeah. winter and year round shelter yeah. capacity. Yeah. That's winter okay. shelter is indoor shelter. Second. Okay, go ahead. And okay. then I think if, if uh, you're agreeable to take out the word temporary and just say in relocation of the River Street camp prior to construction. And the reason I say that is we were told earlier in the day that um, there may be other locations that we are able to identify that can give equivalent or even more space and we wouldn't necessarily have to go back to the North River Street. So I think saying just temporary relocation implies a, a conclusion that we didn't reach. Okay, so instead of during construction, it would say prior to construction. <coughs> relocation, not temporary, but just- It's the relocation, temporary. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. And yeah. And then take out temporary. Take out temporary. Mm -hmm. Before relocation, you would remove temporary. Above there, yeah. Third line, last word. Yeah. Okay. And Did you have additional? I have another no, question, no, and it says to send the city's amended camping ordinance and the county camping ordinance. Is the both idea, of them? The idea being that they will be able to provide us with recommendations on ours and also see how that fit within the county's ordinance okay. because the county also has one and we should Got it. Got it. be consistent. And uh, I do appreciate that that says sending it to the cash and the community. And I think then according to what the city managers told us, what we need is some idea of a timeline on this thing. I, I'm, 
I'll go to Councilmember Brown, but I just want to say I think um, hearing from our city attorney and city manager and chief of police this evening that we want to get out of a position of not being able to um, be able to adequately respond and to have some sort of guiding document so they're not constantly in a position of trying to sort of get into the cycle of, of putting out fires, right? So um, I, I appreciate kind of the context in that regard. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, uh, well, I just want to make a comment about the move to eliminate uh, temporary relocation of the River Street camp. Um, I understand, you know, I, I recognize the potential that that site would not either not be available or not necessary, um, although I think we're going to need extra availability kind of indefinitely here. Um, so I just wonder because because I, I don't want to foreclose the possibility of um, using that site again. Um, it didn't sound like there was, um, from our water director earlier today, it didn't sound like there was a definite immediate need to use that space after the work has been done. And so I guess I just, I, I don't want to foreclose that possibility. Okay. So. Okay, so we could even add language prior to the construction and for potential reopening after completion of or something like that. To my mind, if I could, just saying simply relocation prior to construction says nothing about what will happen to that. When construction's done, it will could be. It remains one of the possibilities. Uh, to the point, sorry, is that adequately cover it or could we potentially uh, add that language for the interest of moving this item? I, I, yeah, I mean, I'm interested in moving it, uh, but I, I really do feel that um, it, I would like to, as a council, um, make clear if there are the votes for it, that um, that space will be um, continue to be in consideration after the work is, is completed. I think there's con there was there's consensus from the council on that, and mm -hmm. if, and that could be noted potentially in the minutes. Okay. All right, Councilmember Glover. Yeah, I was going to say I would imagine uh, the need to see it in writing, uh, just based off of. I mean, I, I would like to see it in writing based off of my experience with this body in general, because we'll do it, it'll switch, and all of a sudden I'll be like, oh, let's not put it there, let's put it over here, but not here's going to work. So I'd love to have it in there, so it's guaranteed that. It'll go back there after the transition. Councilmember uh, uh, Council Brown, uh, good stuff. So does the maker of the motion want to accept the revised language to add that um, specificity that after construction is complete, that that site could be reopened? You could just say in parentheses, with possible reuse. With possible, yeah. there you go, with possible yeah. reuse. Does that work? So you put possible reuse, reuse in, in parentheses after. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And then I would just. Vice Mayor Cummings. I would just add language the prior, for the prioritization of review and recommendations for a countywide response. That way, um, the language is there saying that you know, if we can make this a priority for the catch, then maybe it, this item could then go to the next two meetings in place of some of the other items that they're going to be considering. Um, and um, so. So priority for expeditious review does mean that it could, uh, it will take priority over some of the other content yeah. of the additional meetings. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. And, and ideally a return date as soon as possible to the council for action. Um, to, right, to take action on the ordinance. Councilmember Matthews. So would you want to say, uh, give direction for cash to prioritize this issue? I mean, bump your other projects if that's what we want. Priority, we, it says for priority expeditious review. No, it doesn't, does it? Yeah, cash and it. the community for priority. Oh, you're up there. Okay, review. I was down on another one. Well, Excuse now I'm me. adding it to the. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think it covers okay. it in that. Okay. Priority. I would put and between priority yeah. and expeditious. Yeah. <laughs> Great, yeah. It seems, okay. 
And then the remaining elements of the friendly amendment have already been kind of yeah. spoken to and the warming center suggestion could get wrapped into the original motion around how we're expanding conversation around potential additional shelter space. Sorry. So it seems that we're able to have incorporated all of the different elements within the, Into the main remaining motion. of the motion. Yeah. Okay. So, Councilmember Matthews. So, sorry. To, <laughs> uh, so, are all those friendly amendments now part of the motion, or are they considered to be? Um, in the motion? I think they're inherent in the motion. Inherent. So you're dropping them. So I, I was just. They've been incorporated into the motion. Because the first one is the exact same the first statement. Bullet of the is basically what you just. Did you, Councilmember Brown? So warming center funding is not in the first in the main. No, that's right. That's an amendment. It, oh, the funding. If we delete it, that's I'm fine with it being in the ma the main motion. However, it gets uh, captured for the record, but that I don't want to lose that. Yeah. Would you direct staff to work with <coughs> the county on that as part of the broader conversation around the expanded shelter? Or was that specific was to the city? Because that was the original element of the um, motion, which to, to work with the county on increasing winter and year-round shelter capacity, on-call beds, and temporary locations. So it was sort of a component of that. Sure, is, but, uh, the, but the issue that I'm talking about here is that I, I want the city, whether or not the county decides to make a contribution or there's a conversation to be had there, and which I'd welcome, I want the city to consider a uh, contribution uh, to fund the warming centers uh, program this winter to okay. prevent hypothermia. Okay, Mr. Kandati. So I guess I just have a question: Is is the maker of the motion accepting the proposed amendment as a friendly amendment? Yes. Okay, okay. and then we'll have a second um, motion around the the increasing of parking. Or is that now incorporated? I don't, I think we can. It's incorporated. Okay, okay. I was gonna say that first, that first bullet I think is what we will. It's redundant. Yeah, it's redundant. Yeah. So the yeah. first bullet should be deleted. And then. And the second one too. And the second yeah. one as well. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, so we can delete the first two bullets under the friendly minute. No, we don't. Not for the minutes, we gotta keep a oh, record. For the minute. Oh, okay. Okay, gotcha. okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Does any further, uh, Conversation around this? No? Okay. Hearing none. Unless, I'm, is this feeling accurate? Does everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. There's, a, oh, there's okay, Councilman Brown. Yeah, I just wanted to um, ask a question about um, the. Just a, a follow up question earlier I asked about uh, inclusion of the material from your oral report um, it, in the minutes. And um, so I, I think that one other question that I want to ask is if it is possible for you to provide um, within the, the overall county, because you broke down the city's uh, map, I'm not going to call it bed, map spaces, um, but the county was an overall. Can, can we get a breakdown yeah, of the county yeah, as well? Yeah, it's in there. No, I can get that to you. You can. So I you have can. a chart that the county provided me. That would be great. That I can share and that. Just with make you. that available to the, in the sure. record. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So that concludes um, the first item on our evening session. We're now moving on to the second item. Did you have additional comments before we conclude the first item? We didn't vote on the safe part. No, I think that, that was included with the other thing. Oh. Yeah, okay. I think we're okay. Yeah. Okay. That, right. So well, we were just talking about scheduling again. The first meeting in January is the 14th. Then it's the 28th. When and so an agenda report has to get to people on the 7th. Yeah. So the most. What are we shooting for? As as soon as possible. Well, I think we've been told yeah, that they I was want four times the target. Am I right? Would you, you get what want? you needed in terms of the timeline? And is it being as soon as possible? Um, we said it as a priority, or do you want a specific date? Before the I think it's helpful to have a, sp a specific date, because uh, again, as soon as possible can, can mean anything. So uh, clearly December is not doable. Um, uh, so if it's- A first reading by the first meeting in January? 
January, maybe January would be better. First meeting meeting might be tough. What about January? I think January. January 28th. Oh, second meeting, so second meeting in January. No later than the sec, no later than no the second meeting of January, meeting. and we can we can we can, we'll, we'll do an update. You know, if if if, if we need to there's, there's, an, there's an issue, so okay, no later than that. So we can bring it back sooner, but no later than that. Okay, no later than the last meeting in January. Is there consensus Is from the council on that? Okay, it doesn't okay. seem that we need a motion. There's consensus that we'd like to have that no later than the last meeting in January and brought to us if we are required to take action prior to that time. <laughs> Councilmember Glover. Are we on the next topic yet? Let me. Yeah, I believe so. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to make a motion to continue the conversation of or the next item to the December 10th meeting uh, to make sure that there's transparency with the public and not be making decisions about mayorship at 11:15 uh, p.m. Okay, and um, my understanding is, uh, is that that's possible, or uh, this that's is in our for the city attorney. Our <laughs> charter says that the nomination, the election happens the second meeting of November. Nominations, yeah. Not the nomination and election, yeah. But, yeah. but could we make a motion to continue it if there's interest to do that when there's more opportunity for the public to be engaged? I, 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 I don't see um, any real legal consequence should the council decide to defer taking action until the December 10th meeting. However, the charter does very clearly say that the election shall be at the second meeting in November. Okay. Is there interest amongst the council to have this conversation or, um, well, we have a motion, I guess, to defer action. Is there a second of the motion? You're seconding the motion? Okay, Councilmember Cohen seconds the motion. We'll need to make a decision at a certain point. No. Uh, we could do it now or we could do it on the 10th. Um, no, but we have to vote on whether to postpone it. That's right. right. Any, any further discussion around postponing it? Or do we? Do I'm, we I'm against it. Okay. Do we, can we have a discussion on to postpone it? No. Yes, you may, yeah. but um, it's the, not necessary. Okay. <sighs> do, do you have to have public comment on this before? Yep. Oh, well, no. Right. <laughs> Never mind, I withdraw. This is taking way too long. I withdraw my motion. Let's just move forward. You do not have to have public comment uh, in order to continue an item. Okay, sure. withdrew his, okay so the motion has been withdrawn. Okay, so now is an opportunity for the nominations for the new mayor and vice mayor for 2020. Uh, Councilmember Brown. Uh, are, are we taking those separately? Do we, yeah. we vote on them each separately? I, I'll nominate Justin Cummings to be mayor for 2020. There's a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by <coughs> Councilmember Crone to nominate um, uh, Justin Cummings to be uh, mayor for 2020. Uh, Councilor Matthews. I support Justin for mayor, but I don't think you need a second for nominations. You have for historic second for nominations. It was a mo it was in a motion. Oh, so it was a nomination, wasn't it? Doesn't mm. matter. Oh well. Okay. 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 And then, um, do we want to take? Let's take the nomination for vice mayor, and then we'll go ahead and open it up to the community if they want to address this on this item. Is there a motion to nominate uh, somebody for vice mayor? Councilmember Glover. Nominate Sandy Brown for vice mayor. Um, Councilmember Brown. I appreciate the nomination. I'm gonna have to uh, respectfully uh, decline the nomination. Um, I, I think uh, that um, I'd prefer that we just kind of carry on with the um, path uh, that we, that the tradition that we've, uh, not going, but I do appreciate it. Councilmember Matthews. Yeah, um, with that, I'd like to nominate Donna Myers as vice mayor. Um, she was the second highest vote getter in her election. I think it uh, sustains a long established uh, tradition, if not a rule, and she's certainly been uh, a diligent council member in her first year. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, I'll go ahead and second the nomination. All right, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comments since I am committed to doing that. We'll have up to two minutes to speak. Mr. Norris, you're welcome to come forward. Members of the community council member, um, I wanna reiterate what I've said before about uh, Vice Mayor Cummings and his record. I'm concerned about the, the failure and the betrayal of the progressive majority around destroying the uh, tenant 
rent control provisions back in January after initially voting for them, uh, abandoning the Ross camp, uh, presumably also abandoning uh, the Phoenix camp. He didn't show up to address that either, has not supported any of the recommendations tonight uh, made by Council Member Glover. Uh, a credulous adherence to Assistant City Manager Susie O'Hara, uh, in which he told a, a whole panel of progressive supporters that he wanted to make sure that her, her claims and the staff were verified. And we have seen that there has not been existing an adequate shelter throughout the summer, and now, th sadly and more seriously enough, throughout the winter. Uh, the Clearview Court sellout to corporate developer greed. I'm afraid Justin was on that side too. Um, I, I'm told today, I was told at recess that he hasn't received the many emails I've sent him requesting a regular meeting with him as a, both a radio activist and also a member of Huff. Um, I take him at his word again, and because he's told me he's going to email me, is, is that still correct? This is obviously okay. for us to hear. I, I got a faint nod, I understand, but I want to make, I want to, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. Um, and as I said before, Desiree Quintero is dead because this council moved hundreds of people out of the Ross camp without yes. adequate shelter. And Justin Cummings provided the key vote for that. And we'll no doubt be providing similar key votes. Thank you. Speaker. Uh, members of the council, I am adamantly opposed to Donna Myers taking the seat of vice mayor. I think the fact that she pounded on the dais and virtually accused publicly just, uh, Drew Glover of making racist comments, which it was during a discussion about bias and about prejudice and <laughs> for that, as well as perhaps even more, the recall, which has been cited by Dave Seppos, who was the consultant on the stakeholder assessment, who called out the city council in the most diplomatic way, liking it to Trumpian politics, and that specifically, he could not say Cynthia Matthews, Martine Watkins, and Diana Myers are the Trumpian elements here. We are facing, and this is not too harsh, Justine. We are facing right now a progressive march in, that is historically documented into, I'm sorry to use this word, but I'm gonna use the word fascist because I don't mean it as an insult here. When I say fascist, I mean people who are extremely authoritarian, people who are uh, taking away our civil rights, which happened basically 20 years ago with the Patriot Act under George Bush and worse in the NDAA in the 2012 New Year's Eve, Obama did that. So any activist who's accused of being a ter terrorist by a bureaucrat can actually be disappeared without habeas corpus, without a right to make a phone call. What I'm trying to say is the fascism of today is being run by exactly what we're seeing in this city, 30 years of failing to protect our most vulnerable people and now they're being criminalized and people are so behind the times. There is an amazing, crazy-making kind of attitude going on here. Donna Myers is part of that fascist element. She is part of the recall. You, she has refused to denounce it, and it has been used in the worst way against our fairly elected officials. Please do something, anything, not Donna Myers as vice mayor. Next speaker. This is about the election. Speaking to the nominations, you're welcome to come forward. You have up to two minutes. Nomination for a title of mayor, et cetera, should be a person who is a leader of leadership. You four, you people are not leaders. I see one leader, you sitting right there. Now, why is it that he's bypassed to be the mayor or vice mayor? I don't know. I don't like it how when he's speaking, the, I'll say the mayor cuts in, stops him from talking, breaking his momentum to do whatever it is that she do. I don't know why it's like that either, but this person who you're talking about be the next mayor, I've never once seen him at no community Santa Cruz events. Seen him in the bar a few times, but I ain't never seen him at one. Now, Nelson, how we do things here, not once. 
this person over here you talking about being the vice mayor? She's sitting up here tonight, rolling her eyes. We talking about people dying of death out there in the street. She rolling her eyes like, I don't care, whatever it is that's in her head. Let's say business savvy, business sense. She talking about, let's move forward with it. The, the man right here is saying, well, what about the SOP? I don't know what that is, but he's saying, you putting the horse before the cart. She like, for it, let's do it anyway. What kind of business sense is that? You all are trying to be ruining the city. That's why I asked for, I called for a leader, Glover, right there. <laughs> he will do things, he knows stuff, he's business, he presents stuff, and you all just ignore his presentations. How is that possible? Why ain't he listened to? You four people, you need to go, for real. This man is a leader, he shows his leadership. Let him try to present a march. People be marching with him. You present a march, nobody's showing up. You are not no leader. You don't lead us. You don't have leadership skills or qualities. We see it. We know what we want, we hungry. Your time is up. Your time is up. Next speaker. Um. I have a personal question for uh, Mrs. Watkins. Do you think it's appropriate for a board of men to make decisions on abortion? Okay, the question is stands because it relates to what we're talking about. You guys have been told by a university professor and a lot of good people that what you're doing and the decisions you're making are going to affect lives. Oh, I'm talking about him and her specifically. Both of you were shown by university professors the legal ramifications of what you're about to do and it seemed as if neither of you heard anything, not a word out of their mouths. You're going to be liable. You're on the. Um, we need to help people, and it seems like you guys are more interested in the lines on your words than on the real issue. If you guys want to be mayor, or you want to be vice mayor, do like this man did. Go out and stay in a shelter. Then you have a right to make a decision about it. Or sleep on the street. We really need compassion. And I know you guys are trying to do your best. I can't imagine the bureaucratic red tape. I can't imagine it. But please, do not back down from the righteous thing to do. Okay? No more. Okay? And you three, you four, I don't know. I'm praying for you. Okay. All right. You'll be our last speaker. Come on. Um, I, I wasn't expecting to speak on this issue because I presumed that Sandy Brown would just be the only um, not obvious choice for vice mayor. Um, people were passing out pamphlets, like little sheets of paper saying Sandy Brown for vice mayor. Um, Donna Myers claims that lesbians can't be racist, which is, um, well, I mean, we all know that's not true, right? So um, it's just really disappointing that you would hand over the vice mayorhood to a conservative. Um, so yeah, there we go. All right, so my understanding is we don't take, um, do we take action in, in, in voting on those? Okay, we'll go ahead and take the vote then at this time. All those in favor of Justin Cummings as mayor for 2020, please say aye. First? Did, you Did you have a question, Councilman? Well, point of order, is there, a, is there a discussion first around this before the vote's taken? There can be discussion. Did it's you? It's time for discussion, right? If, if, there's, if there's interest on the council to discuss the item or a council member, you're welcome to discuss it at this yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. So um, uh, I have reservations uh, based off of the track record that was listed here with regards to Vice Mayor Cummings becoming the mayor, but you know, I'm not gonna fight it that much. Um, I know you have a good heart and you're trying to do the right thing, even though you, you've been doing some stuff, man, that I really, I just don't agree with politically and it's yep. really disappointing, especially because we ran together and you basically have betrayed everything yep. and at every, at almost, almost if not every step, you have, you have betrayed no, no, the- No, I'm gonna go ahead and pause you. <laughs> That's it, There's, that is not appropriate. Mr. Um, um, Norris and Ms. Cool, you've interrupted and made comments the entire evening. We're now approaching 11.30 and you're still making comments. Neither of us spoke. Yeah. What are you talking about? Are you, you totally spoke. Mr. Cool didn't say anything. Uh, no, no. 
Uh, there's no more public comment. Not a, no, no more public comment. We'll go ahead and conclude this. Yeah, why don't I just like one? Then, then please don't interrupt by making comments. If I hear one more, I'm gonna ask you to leave. I'll ask you to leave, okay? Go ahead. And I saw aspects of this when she was out of the room and you taking this authoritative stance when people were trying to talk. It was, it's really scary to see the path that you're going down. Uh, and if you continue along this path as mayor, the city will suffer even more than it already has over this last year. Um, the, so I'm just gonna leave it there. So I'm, I'll support you as mayor, but seriously, brother, like I, it has hurt me uh, deeply to have you behave, just make the decisions that you've made and the impacts that you've had on the poor and uh, the people that were relying on you when they voted for you to get elected. So I'm hoping that you can turn that around. Uh, and then uh, with regards to the vice mayorship, I don't think it's really appropriate to have someone who physically intimidated another council member on the dais in front of a camera to be uh, elected as vice mayor. Um, I, it's very disturbing uh, to think about the, the path that we're, we're gonna go down here. Uh, and these are all reasons why I will be voting against the vice mayor nomination. But uh, I'm also really, I mean, I, I don't understand the logic. I mean, I, you got your reasons, I get it, Sandy, but uh, this is a pivotal moment in us being able to redirect and structure things. And, you know, uh, the vice mayorship is uh, an important role uh, because you were in there with agenda building and all this other kind of stuff. And, you know, with with the situation that I just expressed with the, you know, incoming mayor, not having a balance in there and having a, you know, neoliberal conservative perspective, in my opinion, now whether anyone identifies that way or not, uh, the voting practice that we've seen is detrimental. So again, it's, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm saddened by the decisions and the choices that are in front of us, but at the same time, we're just gonna have to move ahead with it. Unless there's any further comment, um, we'll go ahead and maybe take the vote at this time. All those in favor of the nomination for mayor, um, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. All those in favor for the nomination of Councilmember Myers for vice mayor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. <laughs> that passes with Councilmember Crone, Myers, Brown, Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and myself voting in support with Councilmember Glover voting against. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting at this time. Shame, shame, shame. Well, always fun, everybody.